Prefatory Remarks of the Book of Snobs this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shirley van Wallingham. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Prefatory Remarks The necessity of a work on snobs, demonstrated from history and proved by fallacious illustrations, I am the individual destined to write that work. My vocation is announced in terms of great eloquence. I show that the world has been gradually preparing itself for the work and the man. Snobs are to be studied like other objects of natural science, and are a part of the beautiful with a large B. They pervade all classes. Affecting instance of Colonel Snobbly. We have all read a statement, the authenticity of which I take leave to doubt entirely, for upon what calculations I should like to know is that founded. We have all, I say, been favoured by perusing a remark, that when the times and necessities of the world call for a man, that individual is found. Thus at the French Revolution, which the reader will be pleased to have introduced so early, when it was requisite to administer a corrective dose to the nation, Robespierre was found, a most foul and nauseous dose indeed, and swallowed eagerly by the patient, greatly to the latter's ultimate advantage. Thus, when it became necessary to kick John Bull out of America, Mr. Washington stepped forward, and performed that job to satisfaction. Thus, when the Earl of Eldborough was unwell, Professor Holloway appeared with his pills and cured his lordship, as per advertisement, etc., etc. Numberless instances might be adduced to show that when a nation is in great want, the relief is at hand, just as in the pantomime, that microcosm, where when clown wants anything, a warming pan, a pump handle, a goose, or a lady's tippet, a fellow comes sauntering out from behind the side scenes with the very article in question. Again, when men commence an undertaking, they always are prepared to show that the absolute necessities of the world demanded its completion. Say it is a railroad, the directors begin by stating that a more intimate communication between Bethesians and their inane bag is necessary for the advancement of civilization and demanded by the multitudinous acclamations of the great Irish people. Or suppose it is newspaper. The prospector states that, at a time when the church is in danger, threatened from without by savage fanaticisms and miscreant unbelief, and undermined from within by dangerous Jesuitism and suicidal chism, a want has been universally felt, a suffering people has looked abroad for an ecclesiastical champion and guardian. A body of prelates and gentlemen have therefore stepped forward in this our hour of danger and determined on establishing the beadle newspaper, etc., etc. One or other of these points, at least, is incontrovertible. The public wants a thing, therefore it is supplied with it. Or the public is supplied with the thing, therefore it wants it. I have long gone about with a conviction on my mind that I had a work to do, a work, if you like, with a great W, a purpose to fulfil, a chasm to leap into like Kirsch's horse and foot, a great social evil to discover and to remedy. That conviction has pursued me for years. It has dogged me in the busy street, seated itself by me in the lonely study, jogged my elbow as it lifted the wine-cup at the festive board, pursued me through the maze of Rotten Row, followed me in far lands. On Brighton's Shingley Beach, on Margaret Sand, the voice outpiped the roaring of the sea. It nestles in my nightcap, and it whispers, Wake, slumberer! Thy work is not yet done! Last year, by moonlight in the Colosseum, the little, saddler's voice came to me and said, Smith or Jones, the writer's name is neither here nor there. Smith or Jones, my fine fellow, this is all very well, but you ought to be at home, writing your great work 
on snobs. When a man has this sort of vocation, it is all nonsense attempting to elude it. He must speak out to the nations, he must unbosom himself, as James would say, or choke and die. Mark to yourself, I have often mentally exclaimed to your humble servant, the gradual way in which you have been prepared for, and are now led by an irresistible necessity to enter upon your great labour. First, the world was made then as a matter of course snobs they existed for years and years and were no more known than america but presently ingens badibat talus the people became darkly aware that there was such a race not above five and twenty years since a name an expressive monosyllable arose to designate that race that name has spread over england like railroads subsequently Snobs are known and recognized throughout an empire on which I am given to understand the sun never sets. Punch appears at the ripe season to chronicle their history, and the individual comes forth to write that history in Punch. I have, and for this gift I congratulate myself with a deep and abiding thankfulness, an eye for a snob. If the truthful is the beautiful, it is beautiful to study even the snobbish, to drag snobs through history, as certain little dogs in Hampshire hunt out truffles, to sink shafts in society and come upon rich veins of snob ore. Snobbishness is like death in a quotation from Horace, which I hope you never have heard, beating with equal foot at poor men's doors and kicking at the gates of emperors. It is a mistake to judge of snobs lightly, and think they exist among the lower classes merely. An immense percentage of snobs, I believe, is to be found in every rank of this mortal life. You must not judge hastily or vulgarly of snobs. To do so shows that you are yourself a snob. I myself have been taken for one. When I was taking the waters at Bagnig Wells and living at the Imperial Hotel there, they used to sit opposite me at breakfast for a short time, a snob so insufferable that I felt I should never get any benefit of the waters so long as he remained. His name was Lieutenant Colonel Snobley, of a certain dragoon regiment. He wore Japan boots and moustaches. He lisped, drawled, and left the R's out of his words. He was always flourishing about and smoothing his lacquered whiskers with a huge flaming bandana that filled the room with an odour of musk so stifling that I determined to do battle with that snob, and that either he or I should quit the inn. I first began harmless conversations with him, frightening him exceedingly, for he did not know what to do when so attacked, and had never the slightest notion that anybody would take such a liberty with him as to speak first. Then I handed him the paper. Then, as he would take no notice of these advances, I used to look him in the face steadily, and— and use my fork in the light of a toothpick. After two mornings of this practice, he could bear it no longer, and fairly quitted the place. Should the colonel see this, will he remember the gent who asked him if he thought Pablicola was a fine writer, and drove him from the hotel with the four-pronged fork? This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. The Snob Playfully Dealt With this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times The Snob Playfully Dealt With From The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray Chapter 1 There are relative and positive snobs. I mean positive, such persons as are snobs everywhere, in all companies, from morning till night, from youth to the grave, being by nature endowed with snobbishness, and others who are snobs only in certain circumstances and relations of life. For instance, 
I once knew a man who committed before me an act as atrocious as that which I have indicated in the last chapter, as performed by me for the purpose of disgusting Colonel Snobley, viz., the using the fork in the guise of a toothpick. I once, I say, knew a man who, dining in my company at the Europa Coffee House, opposite the Grand Opera, and, as everybody knows, the only decent place for dining at Naples, ate peas with the assistance of his knife. He was a person with whose society I was greatly pleased at first. Indeed, we had met in the crater of Mount Vesuvius, and were subsequently robbed and held to ransom by brigands in Calabria, which is nothing to the purpose. A man of great powers, excellent heart, and varied information, but I had never before seen him with a dish of peas, and his conduct in regard to them caused me the deepest pain. After having seen him thus publicly comport himself, but one course was open to me, to cut his acquaintance. I commissioned a mutual friend, the Honorable Polyanthus, to break the matter to this gentleman as delicately as possible, and to say that painful circumstances, in no wise affecting Mr. Marafat's honor, or my esteem for him, had occurred, which obliged me to forego my intimacy with him. And accordingly we met and gave each other the cut direct that night at the Duchess of Montefiasco's ball. Everybody at Naples remarked the separation of the Damon and Pythias. Indeed, Marofat had saved my life more than once, but as an English gentleman, what was I to do? My dear friend was, in this instance, the snob relative. It is not snobbish of persons of rank of any other nation to employ their knife in the manner alluded to. I have seen Monte Fiasco clean his trencher with his knife, and every principe in company doing likewise. I have seen at the hospitable board of H. I. H. the Grand Duchess Stephanie of Baden, who, if these humble lines should come under her imperial eyes, is besought to remember graciously the most devoted of her servants. I have seen, I say, the hereditary princess of Potztausend Donnerwetter, that serenely beautiful woman, use her knife in lieu of a fork or spoon. I have seen her almost swallow it by Jove, like Ramo Sami, the Indian juggler. And did I blench? Did my estimation for the princess diminish? No, lovely Amalia. One of the truest passions that was ever inspired by woman was raised in this bosom by that lady. Beautiful one! Long, long may the knife carry food to those lips, the reddest and loveliest in the world. The cause of my quarrel with Merrifat, I never breathed to mortal soul for four years. We met in the halls of the aristocracy, our friends and relatives. We jostled each other in the dance or at the board, but the estrangement continued and seemed irrevocable until the 4th of June last year. We met at Sir George Golliper's. We were placed, he on the right, your humble servant on the left, of the admirable Lady G. Peas formed part of the banquet. Ducks and green peas. I trembled as I saw Merrifat helped, and turned away, sickening, lest I should behold the weapon darting down his horrid jaws. What was my astonishment, what my delight, when I saw him use his fork like any other Christian. He did not administer the cold steel once. Old times rushed back upon me, the remembrance of old services, his rescuing me from the brigands, his gallant conduct in the affair with the Countess de Spinacci, his lending me the seventeen hundred lira. I almost burst into tears with joy. My voice trembled with emotion. "'George, my boy!' I exclaimed, George Marifat, my dear fellow, a glass of wine. Blushing, deeply moved, almost as tremulous as I was myself, George answered, Frank, shall it be Hawk or Madeira? I could have hugged him to my heart, but for the presence of the company. 
Little did Lady Gulliper know what was the cause of the emotion which sent the duckling I was carving into her ladyship's pink satin lap. The most good-natured of women pardoned the error, and the butler removed the bird. We have been the closest friends ever since, nor, of course, has George repeated his odious habit. He acquired it at a country school, where they cultivated peas and only used two-pronged forks, and it was only by living on the continent, where the usage of the four-prong is general, that he lost the horrible custom. In this point, and in this only, I confess myself a member of the Silver Fork School, and if this tale but induce one of my readers to pause, to examine in his own mind solemnly, and ask, Do I or do I not eat peas with a knife? To see the ruin which may fall upon himself by continuing the practice, or his family by beholding the example, these lines will not have been written in vain. And now, whatever other authors may be, I flatter myself. It will be allowed that I, at least, am a moral man. By the way, as some readers are dull of comprehension, I may as well say what the moral of this history is. The moral is this. Society, having ordained certain customs, men are bound to obey the law of society and conform to its harmless orders. If I should go to the British and Foreign Institute, and heaven forbid, I should go under any pretext or in any costume whatever. If I should go to one of the tea parties in a dressing gown and slippers, and not in the usual attire of a gentleman, viz. pumps, a gold waistcoat, a crush hat, a sham frill, and a white choker, I should be insulting society, and eating peas with my knife. Let the porters of the Institute hustle out the individual who shall so offend. Such an offender is, as regards society, a most emphatical and refractory snob. It has its code, and police as well as governments, and he must conform who would profit by the decrees set forth for their common comfort. I am naturally averse to egotism, and hate self-laudation consumedly, but I can't help relating here a circumstance illustrative of the point in question, in which I must think I acted with considerable prudence. Being at Constantinople a few years since, on a delicate mission, the Russians were playing a double game between ourselves, and it became necessary on our part to employ an extra negotiator. Lecabus Pasha of Romilia, then chief Galiangi of the port, gave a diplomatic banquet at his summer palace at Bujukdere. I was on the left of the Galiangi, and the Russian agent, Count Didiloff, on his dexter side. Didiloff is a dandy, who would die of a rose in an aromatic pain. He had tried to have me assassinated three times in the course of the negotiation. But, of course, we were friends in public, and saluted each other in the most cordial and charming manner. The Galiangi is, or was, alas, for a bowstring has done for him, a staunch supporter of the old school of Turkish politics. We dined with our fingers and had flaps of bread for plates. The only innovation he admitted was the use of European liquors, in which he indulged with great gusto. He was an enormous eater. Amongst the dishes, a very large one was placed before him, of a lamb dressed in its wool, stuffed with prunes, garlic, asafoetida, capsicums, and other condiments, the most abominable mixture that ever mortal smelt or tasted. The Galiangi ate of this hugely, and pursuing the eastern fashion, insisted on helping his friends right and left, and when he came to a particularly spicy morsel, would push it with his own hands into his guests' very mouths. I never shall forget the look of old Didloff, when His Excellency, rolling up a large quantity of this into a ball, and exclaiming, Buck, buck! It is very good! administered the horrible bolus to Didloff. 
The Russian's eyes rolled dreadfully as he received it. He swallowed it with a grimace that I thought must precede a convulsion, and seizing a bottle next him, which he thought was Sauterne, but which turned out to be French brandy, he drank off nearly a pint before he knew his error. It finished him. He was carried away from the dining-room almost dead, and laid out to cool in a summer-house on the Bosphorus. When it came to my turn, I took down the condiment with a smile, said, Bismillah, licked my lips with easy gratification, and when the next dish was served, made up a ball myself so dexterously, and popped it down the old Galeongi's mouth with so much grace that his heart was won. Russia was put out of court at once, and the treaty of Capobanople was signed. As for Didloff, all was over with him. He was recalled to St. Petersburg, and Sir Roderick Murchison saw him, under the number 3967, working in the Ural mines. The moral of this tale, I need not say, is that there are many disagreeable things in society which you are bound to take down, and to do so with a smiling face. End of chapter 1 the snob playfully dealt with. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 2 of the Book of Snobs this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gates Maru. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 2. The Snob Royal. Long since, at the commencement of the reign of Her Present Gracious Majesty, it chanced on a fair summer evening, as Mr. James would say, that three or four young cavaliers were drinking a cup of wine after dinner at the hostelry called the King's Arms, kept by Mistress Anderson in the royal village of Kensington. T'was a balmy evening, and the wayfarers looked out on a cheerful scene. The tall elms of the ancient gardens were in full leaf, and countless chariots of the nobility of England whirled by to the neighbouring palace, where princely Sussex, whose income latterly only allowed him to give tea-parties, entertained his royal niece at a state banquet. When the caroches of the nobles had set down their owners at the banquet hall, their varlets and servitors came to quaff a flagon of nut-brown ale in the King's Arms gardens hard by. We watched these fellows from our lattice. By St. Boniface t'was a rare sight." The tulips in Mynheer von Dunck's gardens were not more gorgeous than the liveries of these pie-coated retainers. All the flowers of the field bloomed in their ruffled bosoms, all the hues of the rainbow gleamed in their plush breeches, and the long-caned ones walked up and down the gardens with that charming solemnity, that delightful quivering swagger of the calves, which has always had a frantic fascination for us. The walk was not wide enough for them, as the shoulder-knots strutted up and down it, in canary and crimson and light blue. Suddenly, in the midst of their pride, a little bell was rung, a side-door opened, and, after setting down their royal mistress, Her Majesty's own crimson footman, with epaulets and black plushes, came in. It was pitiable to see the other poor John slink off at this arrival. Not one of the honest private plushes could stand up before the royal flunkies. They left the walk. They sneaked into dark holes and drank their beer in silence. The royal plush kept possession of the garden until the royal plush dinner was announced, when it retired, and we heard from the pavilion where they dined conservative cheers and speeches and Kentish fires. The other flunkies we never saw more. My dear flunkies, so absurdly conceited at one moment and so abject the next, are but the types of their masters in this world. He who meanly admires mean things is a snob. 
Perhaps that is a safe definition of the character. And this is why I have, with the utmost respect, ventured to place the snob royal at the head of my list, causing all others to give way before him, as the flunkies before the royal representative in Kensington Gardens. To say of such and such a gracious sovereign that he is a snob is but to say that his majesty is a man. Kings, too, are men and snobs. In a country where snobs are in the majority, a prime one, surely, cannot be unfit to govern. With us they have succeeded to admiration. For instance, James I was a snob, and a Scotch snob, than which the world contains no more offensive creature. He appears to have had not one of the good qualities of a man, neither courage, nor generosity, nor honesty, nor brains, but read what the great divines and doctors of England said about him. Charles the Second, his grandson, was a rogue, but not a snob, whilst Louis the Fourteenth, his old square toes of a contemporary, the great worshipper of big wiggery, has always struck me as a most undoubted and royal snob. I will not, however, take instances from our own country of royal snobs, but refer to a neighbouring kingdom, that of Brentford, and its monarch, the late great and lamented Gorgias the Fourth. With the same humility with which the footman at the king's arms gave way before the plush royal, the aristocracy of the Brentford nation bent down and truckled before Gorgias, and proclaimed him the first gentleman in Europe. And it's a wonder to think what is the gentlefolk's opinion of a gentleman when they gave Gorgias such a title. What is it to be a gentleman? Is it to be honest, to be gentle, to be generous, to be brave, to be wise, and, possessing all these qualities, to exercise them in the most graceful outward manner? Ought a gentleman to be a loyal son, a true husband, and honest father? Ought his life to be decent, his bills to be paid, his tastes to be high and elegant, his aims in life lofty and noble? In a word, Ought not the biography of a first gentleman in Europe to be of such a nature that it might be read in young ladies' schools with advantage, and studied with profit in the seminaries of young gentlemen? I put this question to all instructors of youth, to Mrs. Ellis and the women of England, to all schoolmasters, from Dr. Hawtrey down to Mr. Squeers. I conjure up before me an awful tribunal— of youth and innocence, attended by its venerable instructors, like the ten thousand red-cheeked charity children in St. Paul's, sitting in judgment, and Gorgias pleading his cause in the midst. Out of court, out of court, fat old Florizel, beadles turn out that bloated pimple-faced man. If Gorgias must have a statue in the new palace which the Brentford nation is building, it ought to be set up in the flunkies' hall. He should be represented cutting out a coat, in which art he is said to have excelled. He also invented maraschino punch, a shoe buckle, this was in the vigour of his youth and the prime force of his invention, and a Chinese pavilion, the most hideous building in the world. He could drive a four-in-hand very nearly as well as the Brighton coachman, could fence elegantly and, it is said, played the fiddle well. And he smiled with such irresistible fascination that persons who were introduced into his august presence became his victims, body and soul, as a rabbit becomes the prey of a great big boa constrictor. I would wager that if Mr. Widdicombe were, by a revolution, placed on the throne of Brentford, people would be equally fascinated by his irresistibly majestic smile, and tremble as they knelt down to kiss his hand. If he went to Dublin, they would erect an obelisk on the spot where he first landed, as the Paddylanders did when Gorgias visited them. 
We have all of us read with delight that story of the king's voyage to Haggisland, where his presence inspired such a fury of loyalty, and where the most famous man of the country, the Baron of Bradwardine, coming on board the royal yacht and finding a glass out of which Gorgius had drunk, put it into his coat pocket as an inestimable relic, and went ashore in his boat again. But the Baron sat down upon the glass and broke it, and cut his coat-tails very much, and the inestimable relic was lost to the world for ever. O oh, noble Bradwardine, what old-world superstition could set you on your knees before such an idol as that? If you want to moralize upon the mutability of human affairs, go and see the figure of Gorgias in his real identical robes at the waxwork. Admittance one shilling. Children and flunkies sixpence. Go and pay sixpence. End of chapter two. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 3 of The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gates Maru. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 3 The Influence of the Aristocracy on Snobs Last Sunday week, being at church in this city, and the service just ended, I heard two snobs conversing about the parson. One was asking the other who the clergyman was. He is Mr. So-and-so, the second snob answered, domestic chaplain to the Earl of what do you call him? "'Oh, is he?' said the first snob, with a tone of indescribable satisfaction. The parson's orthodoxy and identity were at once settled in this snob's mind. He knew no more about the earl than about the chaplain, but he took the latter's character upon the authority of the former, and went home quite contented with his reverence, like a little truckling snob. This incident gave me more matter for reflection even than the sermon— and wonderment at the extent and prevalence of lordolatry in this country. What would it matter to Snob whether his reverence were chaplain to his lordship or not? What peerage worship there is all through this free country! How we are all implicated in it, and more or less down on our knees! And with regard to the great subject on hand, I think that the influence of the peerage upon snobbishness has been more remarkable than that of any other institution. The increase, encouragement, and maintenance of snobs are among the priceless services, as Lord John Russell says, which we owe to the nobility. It can't be otherwise. A man becomes enormously rich, or he jobs successfully in the aid of a minister, or he wins a great battle, or executes a treaty, or is a clever lawyer who makes a multitude of fees and ascends the bench, and the country rewards him for ever with a gold coronet, with more or less balls or leaves, and a title and a rank as legislator. "'Your merits are so great,' says the nation, "'that your children shall be allowed to reign over us in a manner. It does not in the least matter that your eldest son be a fool. We think your services so remarkable that he shall have the reversion of your honours when death vacates your noble shoes. If you are poor, we will give you such a sum of money as shall enable you and the eldest born of your race for ever to live in fat and splendour. It is our wish that there should be a race set apart in this happy country who shall hold the first rank, have the first prizes and chances in all government jobs and patronages. We cannot make all your dear children peers. That would make peerage common and crowd the House of Lords uncomfortably. But the young ones shall have everything a government can give. They shall get the pick of all the places. They shall be captains and lieutenant colonels at nineteen, 
when hoary-headed old lieutenants are spending thirty years at drill, they shall command ships at one and twenty, and veterans who fought before they were born. And as we are eminently a free people, and in order to encourage all men to do their duty, we say to any man of any rank, Get enormously rich, make immense fees as a lawyer or great speeches, or distinguish yourself and win battles, and you, even you, shall come into the privileged class, and your children shall reign naturally over ours. How can we help snobbishness with such a prodigious national institution erected for its worship? How can we help cringing to lords? Flesh and blood can't do otherwise. What man can withstand this prodigious temptation? Inspired by what is called a noble emulation, some people grasp at honours and win them. Others, too weak or mean, blindly admire and grovel before those who have gained them. Others, not being able to acquire them, furiously hate, abuse, and envy. There are only a few bland and not in the least conceited philosophers who can behold the state of society, viz. toadyism, organized, base man and mammon worship instituted by command of law, snobbishness, in a word, perpetuated, and mark the phenomenon calmly. And of these calm moralists, is there one, I wonder, whose heart would not throb with pleasure if he could be seen walking arm in arm with a couple of dukes down Pall Mall? No, it is impossible in our condition of society not to be sometimes a snob. On one hand, it encourages the commoner to be snobbishly mean and the noble to be snobbishly arrogant. When a noble marchioness writes in her travels about the hard necessity under which steamboat travellers labour of being brought into contact with all sorts and conditions of people, implying that a fellowship with God's creatures is disagreeable to her ladyship, who is their superior, when I say the marchioness of whatever writes in this fashion, we must consider that out of her natural heart it would have been impossible for any woman to have had such a sentiment, but that the habit of truckling and cringing, which all who surround her have adopted towards this beautiful and magnificent lady, this proprietor of so many black and other diamonds, has really induced her to believe that she is the superior of the world in general, and that people are not to associate with her except awfully at a distance. I recollect being once at the city of Grand Cairo, through which a European royal prince was passing India words. One night at the inn there was a great disturbance. A man had drowned himself in the well hard by. All the inhabitants of the hotel came bustling into the court, and amongst others your humble servant, who asked of a certain young man the reason of the disturbance. How was I to know that this young gent was a prince? He had not his crown and scepter on. He was dressed in a white jacket and felt hat, but he looked surprised at anybody speaking to him, answered an unintelligible monosyllable, and beckoned his aide-de-camp to come and speak to me. It is our fault, not that of the great, that they should fancy themselves so far above us. If you will fling yourself under the wheels, Juggernaut will go over you, depend upon it. And if you and I, my dear friend, had kowtow performed before us every day, found people whenever we appeared groveling in slavish adoration, we should drop into the airs of superiority quite naturally, and accept the greatness with which the world insisted upon endowing us. Here is an instance out of Lord L.'s travels of that calm, good-natured, undoubting way in which a great man accepts the homage of his inferiors. 
After making some profound and ingenious remarks about the town of Brussels, his lordship says, "Staying some day at the Hotel de Bellevue, a greatly overrated establishment and not nearly as comfortable as the Hotel de France, I made acquaintance with Doctor L, the physician of the mission." He was desirous of doing the honors of the place to me, and he ordered for us a dîner en gourmand at the chief restaurateur's, maintaining it surpassed the Rocher at Paris. Six or eight partook of the entertainment, and we all agreed it was infinitely inferior to the Paris display and much more extravagant. So much for the copy, and so much for the gentleman who gave the dinner. Doctor L, desirous to do his lordship the honor of the place, feasts him with the best victuals money can procure, and my lord finds the entertainment extravagant and inferior. Extravagant? It was not extravagant to him. Inferior. Mister L did his best to satisfy those noble jaws, and my lord receives the entertainment and dismisses the giver with a rebuke. It is like a three-tailed pasha grumbling about an unsatisfactory bakshish. But how should it be otherwise in a country where lordolatry is part of our creed, and where our children are brought up to respect the peerage? As the Englishman's second Bible. End of chapter three. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter four: The Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jamie Arango. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter Four: The Court Circular and Its Influence on Snobs. Example is the best of precepts. So let us begin with a true and authentic story. Showing how young aristocratic snobs are reared, and how early their snobbishness may be made to bloom, a beautiful and fashionable lady, pardon, gracious madam, that your story should be made public, but it is so moral that it is ought to be known to the universal world, told me that in her early youth she had a little acquaintance, who is now indeed a beautiful and fashionable lady too. In, me, in mentioning Miss Snobkey, daughter of Sir Snobkey Snobkey, whose presentation at court caused such a sensation, need I say more? When Miss Snobkey was so very young as to be in the nursery regions and to walk off early mornings in St James's Park, protected by a French governess and followed by a huge hirsute flunkey in the canary-coloured livery of the Snobkeys, she used occasionally in these promenades to meet with young Lord Claude Lollipop, the Marquis de Syllabub's younger son. In the very height of the season, from some unexpected cause, the Snobkeys suddenly determined upon leaving town. Miss Snobkey spoke to her female friend and confidant, "What will poor Claude Lollipop say when he hears of my absence?" asked the tender-hearted child. "Oh, perhaps he won't hear of it," answers the confidant. "My dear, he will read it in the papers," replied the dear little fashionable rogue of seven years old. She knew already her importance, and how all the world of England, how all the world be genteel people, how all the silver fork worshippers, how all the tattle mongers, how all the grocers' ladies, the tailors' ladies, the attorneys' and merchants' ladies, and the people living at Clapham and Brunswick Square, who have no more chance of consorting with a snobby than my beloved reader has of dining with the Emperor of China. Yet watched the movements of the Snobkeys with interest, and were glad to know when they came to London and left it. Here is the account of Miss Snobkey's dress and that of her mother, Lady Snobkey, from the papers. Miss Snobkey, 
habit de coeur, composed of a yellow nankeen illusion dress over a slip of rich pea-green corduroy, trimmed en tablier with bouquets of Brussels sprouts, the body and sleeves handsomely trimmed with calico and festooned with a pink train and white radishes, headdress, carrots, and lappets. Lady Snobke, costume de coeur, composed of a train of the most superb pecan bandanas, elegantly trimmed with spangles, tinfoil, and red tape, bodice and underdress of sky-blue velveteen, trimmed with bouffants and nudes of bell poles, stomacher of muffins, headdress of bird's nest, with a bird of paradise, over a rich brass knocker and ferronier, this splendid costume by Madame Crinoline of Regent Street was the object of universal admiration. This is what you read. Oh, Mrs. Ellis, oh, mothers, daughters, aunts, grandmothers of England, this is the sort of writing which is put in the newspapers for you. How can you help being the mothers, daughters, and c of snobs so long as this balderdash is set before you? You stuff the little rosy foot of a Chinese young lady of fashion into a slipper that is about the size of a salt cruet and keep the poor little toes there imprisoned and twisted up so long that the dwarfishness becomes irremediable later the foot would not expand to the natural size were you to give her a washing tub for a shoe and for all her life she has little feet and is a cripple oh my dear mrs miss wiggins thank your stars that your those beautiful feet of yours though i declare when you walk they are so small as to be almost invisible Thank your stars that society never so practiced upon them. But look around and see how many friends of ours in the highest circles have had their brains so prematurely and hopelessly pinched and distorted. How can you expect that those poor creatures are to move naturally when the world and their parents have mutilated them so cruelly? As long as the court circular exists, how the deuce of P are people whose names are chronicled in it ever to believe themselves the equals of the cringing race which daily reads the abominable trash? I believe that ours is the only country in the world now where the court circular remains in full flourish, where you read, This day His Royal Highness Prince Pattypan was taken an airing in his go-kart. The princess Pimini was taken a drive, attended by her ladies of honor, and accompanied by her doll. We laugh at the solemnity with which St. Simon announces that Sa Majesty Saint Recommend aujourd'hui under our very noses the same folly is daily going. That wonderful and mysterious man, the author of the court circular, drops in with his budget at the newspaper offices every night. I once asked the editor of a paper to allow me to lie in wait and see him. I am told that in a kingdom where there is a German king consort, Portugal it must be, for the queen of that country married a German prince who is greatly admired and respected by the natives, whenever the consort takes the diversion of shooting among the rabbit wardens of Sintra or the pheasant preserve of Mafra, he has a keeper to load his guns as a matter of course, and then they are handed to the nobleman, his equerry, and the nobleman hands them to the prince, who blazes away, gives back the discharged gun to the nobleman, who gives it to the keeper, and so on. But the prince won't take the gun from the hands of the loader. As long as this unnatural and monstrous etiquette continues, snobs there must be. The three persons engaged in this transaction are, for the time being, snobs. The keeper, the least snob of all, because he is discharging his daily duty, but he appears here as a snob, that is to say, in a position of debasement before another human being, the prince, with whom he is allowed to communicate through another party. A free Portuguese gamekeeper, who professes himself to be unworthy to communicate directly with any person, confesses himself to be a snob. 2. The nobleman in waiting is a snob. If it degrades the prince to receive the gun from the gamekeeper, it is degrading to the nobleman in waiting to execute the, that service. He acts as a snob towards the keeper, whom he keeps from communicating with the prince. A snob to the prince, to whom he pays a degrading homage. 3. 
The King Consort of Portugal is a stop for insulting fellow men in this way. There is no harm in his accepting the service of the keeper directly, but indirectly he insults the service performed and the servants who perform it, and therefore I say respectfully is a most undoubted royal snob. And then you read in the Diario de Governo, yesterday His Majesty the King took the diversion of shooting the woods of Sintra, attended by Colonel the Honorable Whiskerandu Sombrero. His Majesty returned to the necessidades to lunch, etc. Oh, that court circular, once more, I exclaim. Down with the court circular, that engine and propagator of snobbishness. I promise to subscribe for a year to any daily paper that shall come out without a court circular. Were it in the morning herald itself, when I read that trash, I rise in my wrath. I feel myself disloyal, a regicide, a member of the Calf's Head Club. The only court circular story which ever pleased me was that of the King of Spain, who in great part was roasted, because there was not time for the Prime Minister to command the Lord Chamberlain to desire the grand gold stick, to order the first page in waiting, to bid the chief of the flunkies to request the house maid of honor to bring up a pail of water to put his majesty out. I am like the Pasha of Three Tales, to whom the Sultan sends his court circular, the bowstring. It chokes me. May its usage be abolished forever. End of chapter 4This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 5 of The Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M.B. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 5 What Snobs Admire. Now let us consider how difficult it is even for great men to escape from being snobs. It is very well for the reader whose fine feelings are disgusted by the assertion that kings, princes, lords are snobs, to say, you are confessedly a snob yourself. In professing to depict snobs, it is only your own ugly mug which you are copying, with a narcissus-like conceit and fatuity. But I shall pardon this explosion of ill-temper on the part of my constant reader, reflecting upon the misfortune of his birth and country. It is impossible for any Briton, perhaps, not to be a snob in some degree. If people can be convinced of this fact, an immense point is gained, surely. If I have pointed out the disease, let us hope that other scientific characters may discover the remedy. If you, who are a person of the middle ranks of life, are a snob, you whom nobody flatters particularly, you who have no toadies, you whom no cringing flunkies or shopmen bow out of doors, you whom the policeman tells to move on, you who are jostled in the crowd of this world, and amongst the snobs our brethren, Consider how much harder it is for a man to escape who has not your advantages, and is all his life long subject to adulation, the butt of meanness. Consider how difficult it is for the snob's idol not to be a snob. As I was discoursing with my friend Eugenio in this impressive way, Lord Buckram passed us, the son of the Marquis of Bagwig, and knocked at the door of the family mansion in Red Lion Square. His noble father and mother occupied, as everybody knows, distinguished posts in the courts of late sovereigns. The Marquis was Lord of the Pantry, and her ladyship Lady of the Powder Closet to Queen Charlotte. Buck, as I call him, for we are very familiar, gave me a nod as he passed, and I proceeded to show Eugenio how it was impossible that this nobleman should not be one of ourselves, having been practised upon by snobs all his life. 
His parents resolved to give him a public education, and sent him to school at the earliest possible period. The Reverend Otto Rose, D.D., principal of the Preparatory Academy for Young Noblemen and Gentlemen, Richmond Lodge, took this little lord in hand, and fell down and worshipped him. He always introduced him to the fathers and mothers who came to visit their children at the school. He referred with pride and pleasure to the most noble the Marquis of Bagwig, as one of the kind friends and patrons of his seminary. He made Lord Buckram a bait for such a multiplicity of pupils, that a new wing was built to Richmond Lodge, and thirty-five new little white dimity beds were added to the establishment. Madame Rose used to take out the little lord in the one-horse chaise with her when she paid visits, until the rector's lady and the surgeon's wife almost died with envy. His own son and Lord Buckram, having been discovered robbing an orchard together, the doctor flogged his own flesh and blood most unmercifully for leading the young lord astray. He parted from him with tears. There was always a letter directed to the most noble the Marquis of Bagwig, on the doctor's study table, when any visitors were received by him. At Eton a great deal of snobbishness was thrashed out of Lord Buckram, and he was birched with perfect impartiality. Even there, however, a select band of sucking tuft hunters followed him. Young Croesus lent him three-and-twenty brand-new sovereigns out of his father's bank. Young Snaily did his exercises for him, and tried to know him at home, but young Bull licked him in a fight of fifty-five minutes, and he was caned several times with great advantage for not sufficiently polishing his master Smith's shoes. Boys are not all toadies in the morning of life. But when he went to the university, crowds of toadies sprawled over him. The tutors toadied him, the fellows in hall paid him great clumsy compliments. The dean never remarked his absence from chapel, or heard any noise issuing from his rooms. A number of respectable young fellows, it is among the respectable, the Baker Street class, that snobbishness flourishes, more than among any set of people in England, a number of these clung to him like leeches. There was no end now to Croesus's loans of money, and Buckram couldn't ride out with the hounds, but Snaily a timid creature by nature, was in the field and would take any leap at which his friend chose to ride. Young Rose came up to the same college, having been kept back for that express purpose by his father. He spent a quarter's allowance in giving Buckram a single dinner, but he knew there was always pardon for him for extravagance in such a cause, and a ten-pound note always came to him from home when he mentioned Buckram's name in a letter. What wild visions entered the brains of Mrs. Podge and Miss Podge, the wife and daughter of the principal of Lord Buckram's college, I don't know, but that reverend old gentleman was too profound a flunky by nature ever for one minute to think that a child of his could marry a nobleman. He therefore hastened on his daughter's union with Professor Crabbe. When Lord Buckram, after taking his honorary degree, for alma mater is a snob too, and truckles to a lord like the rest. When Lord Buckram went abroad to finish his education, you all know what dangers he ran, and what numbers of caps were set at him. Lady Leech and her daughters followed him from Paris to Rome, and from Rome to Baden-Baden. Miss Leggett burst into tears before his face when he announced his determination to quit Naples, and fainted on the neck of her mamma. Captain McDragon of McDragonstown, County Tipperary, called upon him to explain his intentions with respect to his sister, Miss Amelia McDragon of McDragonstown, and proposed to shoot him unless he married that spotless and beautiful young creature, who was afterwards led to the altar by Mr. Muff at Cheltenham. If perseverance and forty thousand pounds down could have tempted him, Miss Lydia Croesus would certainly have been Lady Buckram. Count Tarovsky was glad to take her with half the money, as all the genteel world knows. 
and now perhaps the reader is anxious to know what sort of man this is who wounded so many ladies hearts and who had been such a prodigious favourite with men if we were to describe him it would be personal besides it really does not matter in the least what sort of man he is or what his personal qualities are suppose he is a young nobleman of literary turn and that he published poems ever so foolish and feeble the snobs would purchase thousands of his volumes the publishers who refused my passion flowers and my grand epic at any price would give him his own suppose he is a nobleman of jovial turn and has a fancy for wrenching off knockers frequenting gin shops and half murdering policemen the public will sympathize good-naturedly with his amusements and say he is a hearty honest fellow suppose he is fond of play and the turf and has a fancy to be a back-leg and occasionally condescends to pluck a pigeon at cards the public will pardon him and many honest people will court him as they would court a housebreaker if he happened to be a lord suppose he is an idiot yet by the glorious constitution he is good enough to govern us suppose he is an honest high-minded gentleman so much the better for himself but he may be an ass and yet respected or a ruffian and yet be exceedingly popular or a rogue and yet excuses will be found for him snobs will still worship him male snobs will do him honour and females look kindly upon him however hideous he may be End of chapter 5。This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 6 of the Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Lynn. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 6. On Some Respectable Snobs. Having received a great deal of obloquy for dragging monarchs, princes, and the respected nobility into the snob category, I trust to please everybody in the present chapter by stating my firm opinion that it is among the respectable classes of this vast and happy empire that the greatest profusion of snobs is to be found. I pace down my beloved Baker Street. I am engaged on a life of Baker, founder of this celebrated street. I walk in Harley Street, where every other house has a hatchment, Wimpole Street, that is as cheerful as the catacombs, a dingy mausoleum of the genteel, I rove round Regent's Park, where the plaster is patching off the house walls, where Methodist preachers are holding forth the three little children in the green enclosures, and puffy valetudinarians are cantering in the solitary mud. I thread the doubtful zigzags of Mayfair, where Mrs. Kitty Lorimer's brougham may be seen drawn up next door to old Lady Lollipop's belozenged family coach. I roam through Belgravia, that pale and polite district where all the inhabitants look prim and correct, and the mansions are painted a faint, whitey brown. I lose myself in the new squares and terraces of the brilliant brand-new Bayswater and Tyburn Junction line, and in one and all of these districts the same truth comes across me. I stop before any house at hazard and say, O oh, house, you are inhabited. O oh, knocker, you are knocked at. O oh, undressed flunky, sunning your lazy calves as you lean against the iron railings, you are paid by snobs. It is a tremendous thought, that, and it is almost sufficient to drive a benevolent mind to madness to think that perhaps there is not one in ten of those houses where the peerage does not lie on the drawing-room table. Considering the harm that foolish lying book does, I would have all the copies of it burned, as the barber burned all Quixote's books of humbugging chivalry. Look at this grand house in the middle of the square. The Earl of Lefcorib lives there. He has fifty thousand a year. A déjeuner d'encens given at his house last week cost, who knows how much. The mere flowers for the room and bouquets for the ladies cost four hundred pounds. 
That man in drab trousers coming crying down the stops is a dun. Lord Lufcrib has ruined him and won't see him. That is his lordship peeping through the blind of his study at him now. Go thy ways, Lufcrib. Thou art a snob, a heartless pretender, a hypocrite of hospitality, a rogue who passes forged notes upon society. But I am growing too eloquent. You see that nice house, number 23, where a butcher's boy is ringing the area bell? He has three mutton chops in his tray. They are for the dinner of a very different and very respectable family. For Lady Susan Scraper and her daughters, Miss Scraper and Miss Emily Scraper. The domestics, luckily for them, are on board wages. Two huge footmen in light blue and canary, a fat, steady coachman who is a Methodist, and a butler who would never have stayed in the family, but that he was orderly to General Scraper when the General distinguished himself at Walsheron. His widow sent his portrait to the United Service Club, and it is hung up in one of the back dressing closets there. He is represented at a parlour window with red curtains. In the distance is a whirlwind, in which cannon are firing off, and he is pointing to a chart on which are written the words, Walsheron, Tobago. Lady Susan is, as everybody knows by referring to the British Bible, a daughter of the great and good Earl Bagwig before mentioned. She thinks everything belonging to her the greatest and best in the world. The first of men, naturally, are the Buckrams, her own race. Then follow in rank the Scrapers. The general was the greatest general. His eldest son, Scraper Buckram Scraper, is at present the greatest and best. His second son, the next greatest and best, and herself the paragon of women. Indeed, she is a most respectable and honourable lady. She goes to church, of course. She would fancy the church in danger if she did not. She subscribes to church and parish charities, and is a directress of meritorious charitable institutions, of Queen Charlotte's lying-in hospital, the washerwoman's asylum, the British drummer's daughter's home, and so on. She is a model of a matron. The tradesman never lived who could say that he was not paid on the quarter-day. The beggars of her neighbourhood avoid her like a pestilence, for while she walks out, protected by John, that domestic has always two or three mendicity tickets ready for deserving objects. Ten guineas a year will pay all her charities. There is no respectable lady in all London who gets her name more often printed for such a sum of money. Those three mutton chops which you see entering at the kitchen door will be served on the family plate at seven o'clock this evening the huge footman being present, and the butler in black, and the crest and coat of arms of the scrapers blazing everywhere. I pity Miss Emily Scraper. She is still young, young and hungry. Is it a fact that she spends her pocket money in buns? Malicious tongues say so. But she has very little to spare for buns, the poor little hungry soul. For the fact is that when the footmen and the ladies' maids and the fat coach horses which are jobbed, and the six dinner-parties in the season, and the two great solemn evening parties, and the rent of the big house, and the journey to an English or foreign watering-place for the autumn are paid, my lady's income has dwindled away to a very small sum, and she is as poor as you or I. You would not think it when you saw her in a big carriage rattling up to the drawing-room, and caught a glimpse of her plumes, lappets, and diamonds, waving over her ladyship's sandy hair and majestical hooked nose, you would not think it when you hear Lady Susan Scraper's carriage, bawled out at midnight so as to disturb all Belgravia. You would not think it when she comes rustling into church, the obsequious John behind with the bag of prayer books. Is it possible, you would say, that so grand and awful a personage as that can be hard up for money? Alas, so it is. She never heard such a word as snob, I will engage, in this wicked and vulgar world. And, oh, stars and garters, how she would start if she heard that she, she, as solemn as Minerva, she, as chaste as Diana, without that heathen goddess's unladylike propensity for field sports, that she, too, was a snob. A snob she is. As long as she sets that prodigious value upon herself, upon her name, upon her outward appearance, and indulges in that intolerable pomposity, as long as she goes parading abroad like Solomon in all his glory, as long as she goes to bed, as I believe she does, with a turban and a bird of paradise in it, and a court train to her nightgown, as long as she is so insufferably virtuous and condescending, 
as long as she does not cut at least one of those footmen down into mutton-chops for the benefit of the young ladies. I had my notions of her from my old schoolfellow, her son Sidney Scraper, a chancery barrister without any practice, the most placid, polite, and genteel of snobs, who never exceeded his allowance of two hundred a year, and who may be seen any evening at the Oxford and Cambridge Club, simpering over the quarterly review, in the blameless enjoyment of his half-pint of port. End of chapter 6This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 7 of The Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Lynn. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 7 on some respectable snobs. Look at the next house to Lady Susan Scraper's, the first mansion with the awning over the door. That canopy will be let down this evening for the comfort of the friends of Sir Allyred and Lady S. de Moggins, whose parties are so much admired by the public and the givers themselves. Peach-coloured liveries laced with silver, and pea-green plush inexpressibles render the de Moggins flunkies the pride of the ring when they appear in Hyde Park, where Lady de Moggins, as she sits upon her satin cushions, with her dwarf spaniel in her arms, bows to the very selectest of the genteel. Times are altered now with Mary Ann, or, as she calls herself, Marian de Moggins. She was the daughter of Captain Flack of the Rathdrum Fencibles, who crossed with his regiment over from Ireland to Kermarthenshire ever so many years ago, and defended Wales from the Corsican invader. The Rathdrums were quartered at Pontwildum, where Marian wooed and won her de Moggins, a young banker in the place. His attentions to Miss Flack at a race-ball were such that her father said de Moggins must either die on the field of honour or become his son-in-law. He preferred marriage. His name was Muggins, then, and his father, a flourishing banker, army contractor, smuggler, and general jobber, almost disinherited him on account of this connection. There is a story that Muggins the Elder was made a baronet for having lent money to a R-Y-L P-R-S-N-G-E. I do not believe it. The R-Y-L family always paid their debts from the Prince of Wales downwards. Howbeit, to his life's end, he remained simple Sir Thomas Muggins, representing Pontwildum in Parliament for many years after the war. The old banker died in course of time, and, to use the affectionate phrase common on such occasions, cut up prodigiously well. His son Alfred Smith Moggins succeeded to the main portion of his wealth, and to his titles and the bloody hand of his scutcheon. It was not for many years after that he appeared as Sir Allured Moggins Smith de Moggins, with a genealogy found out for him by the editor of Fluke's Peerage, and which appears as follows in that work. De Moggins, Sir Allured Moggins Smith, second baronet. This gentleman is a representative of one of the most ancient families of Wales, who trace their descent until it is lost in the mists of antiquity. A genealogical tree, beginning with Shem, is in the possession of the family, and is stated by a legend of many thousand years' date to have been drawn on papyrus by a grandson of the patriarch himself. Be this as it may, there can be no doubt of the immense antiquity of the race of Moggins. In the time of Boadicea, Hagen Moggin of the Hundred Beeves was a suitor and a rival of Caractacus for the hand of that princess. He was a person gigantic in stature, and was slain by Suetonius in the battle which terminated the liberties of Britain. From him descended directly the princes of Pontwildum, Moggin of the Golden Harp, See the Mabinogian of Lady Charlotte Guest, Bogan Meridoc op Mogan, the black fiend son of Mogan, and a long list of bards and warriors celebrated both in Wales and Armorica. The independent princes of Mogan long held out against the ruthless kings of England, until finally Gam Mogan's made his submission to Prince Henry, son of Henry the Fourth, 
and under the name of Sir David Gam de Moggins was distinguished at the Battle of Agincourt. From him the present baronet is descended, and here the descent follows in order until it comes to Thomas Muggins, first baronet of Pontoldom Castle, for twenty-three years member of Parliament for that borough, who had issue Alured Muggins Smith, the present baronet, who married Marion, daughter of the late General P. Flack of Ballyflack, in the Kingdom of Ireland, of the Counts Flack of the H.R. Empire. Sir Alured has issue Alured Caradoc, born 1819, Marion, 1811, Blanche Adeliza, Emily Doria, Adelaide Oblins, Katinka Rostopchin, Patrick Flack, died 1809. Arms. A mullion garbled, jewels on a saltire reversed of the second. Crest. A tomtit rampant regardant. Motto. Un Roy un Moggins. It was long before Lady de Moggins shone as a star in the fashionable world. At first, poor Muggins was in the hands of the Flax, the Clancy's, the Tools, the Shanahan's, his wife's Irish relations. And whilst he was yet but heir apparent, his house overflowed with claret and the national nectar, for the benefit of Hibernian relatives. Tom Tufto absolutely left the street in which they lived in London, because he said it was infected with such a confounded smell of whiskey from the house of those Irish people. It was abroad that they learned to be genteel. They pushed into all foreign courts, and elbowed their way into the halls of ambassadors. They pounced upon the stray nobility, and seized young lords travelling with their bear-leaders. They gave parties at Naples, Rome, and Paris. They got a royal prince to attend their soirees at the latter place, and it was here that they first appeared under the name of de Moggins, which they bear with such splendour to this day. All sorts of stories are told of the desperate efforts made by the indomitable Lady de Moggins to gain the place she now occupies, and those of my beloved readers who live in middle life and are unacquainted with the frantic struggles, the wicked feuds, the intrigues, cabals, and disappointments which, as I am given to understand, reign in the fashionable world, may bless their stars that they at least are not fashionable snobs. The intrigues set afoot by the Demogans to get the Duchess of Buckskin to her parties would strike a talleyrand with admiration. She had a brain fever after being disappointed of an invitation to Lady Aldermanbury's The Descent, and would have committed suicide but for a ball at Windsor. I have the following story from my noble friend Lady Clapperclaw herself, Lady Kathleen O'Shaughnessy that was, and daughter of the Earl of Turf and Thunder. When that odious, disguised Irish woman, Lady Muggins, was struggling to take her place in the world, and was bringing out her hideous daughter Blanche, said old Lady Clapperclaw, Marion has a hump back and doesn't show, but she's the only lady in the family. When that wretched Polly Muggins was bringing out Blanche with her radish of a nose and her carrot of ringlets and her turnip for a face, she was most anxious, as her father had been a cowboy on my father's land, to be patronized by us, and asked me point-blank in the midst of a silence at Count Volavent's, the French ambassador's dinner, why I had not sent her a card for my ball. "'Because my rooms are already too full, and your ladyship would be crowded inconveniently,' says I. "'Indeed, she takes up as much room as an elephant. Besides, I wouldn't have her, and that was flat.' "'I thought my answer was a settler to her, but the next day she comes weeping to my arms. "'Dear Lady Clapperclaw,' says she, "'it's not for me. I ask it for my blessed Blanche, a young creature in her first season, and not at your ball. "'My tender child will pine and die of vexation.' "'I don't want to come. I will stay at home to nurse Sir Alured in the gout. "'Mrs. Bolster is going, I know. She will be Blanche's chaperone. "'You wouldn't subscribe for the Rathdrum Blanket and Potato Fund, "'you who come out of the parish,' says I, "'and whose grandfather, honest man, kept cows there. "'Will twenty guineas be enough, dearest Lady Clapperclaw? Twenty guineas is sufficient,' says I, and she paid them. "'So I said Blanche may come, but not you, mind.' and she left me with a world of thanks. Would you believe it? When my ball came, the horrid woman made her appearance with her daughter. Didn't I tell you not to come? said I, in a mighty passion. What would the world have said? cries my lady Muggins. My carriage is gone for Sir Alured to the club. Let me stay only ten minutes, dearest Lady Clapperclaw. 
"'Well, as you are here, madam, you may stay and get your supper,' I answered, and so left her, and never spoke a word more to her all night. "'And now,' screamed out old Lady Clapperclaw, clapping her hands, and speaking with more brogue than ever, "'what do you think, after all my kindness to her, the wicked, vulgar, odious, impudent upstart of his cowboy's granddaughter has done? She cut me up yesterday in High Park, and hasn't sent me a ticket for her ball to-night, though they say Prince George is to be there.' Yes, such is the fact. In the race of fashion, the resolute and active de Moggins has passed the poor old clapper-claw. Her progress in gentility may be traced by the sets of friends whom she has courted, and made, and cut, and left behind her. She has struggled so gallantly for polite reputation that she has won it, pitilessly kicking down the ladder as she advanced degree by degree. Irish relations were first sacrificed. She made her father dine in the steward's room— to his perfect contentment, and would send Sir Alured thither likewise, but that he is a peg on which she hopes to hang her future honours, and is, after all, paymaster of her daughter's fortunes. He is meek and content. He has been so long a gentleman that he is used to it, and acts the part of governor very well. In the daytime he goes from the Union to Arthur's, and from Arthur's to the Union. He is a dead hand at piquet, and loses a very comfortable maintenance to some young fellows at whist at the Travellers. His son has taken his father's seat in Parliament, and has, of course, joined young England. He is the only man in the country who believes in the de Mogginses, and sighs for the days when a de Mogins led the van of battle. He has written a little volume of spoony puny poems. He wears a lock of the hair of Laud, the confessor and martyr, and fainted when he kissed the Pope's toe at Rome. He sleeps in white kid gloves and commits dangerous excesses upon green tea. End of chapter 7。This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter Eight of the Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter Eight. Great City Snobs. There is no disguising the fact that this series of papers is making a prodigious sensation among all classes in this empire. Notes of admiration, of interrogation, of remonstrance, approval, or abuse come pouring into Mr. Punch's box. We have been called to task for betraying the secrets of three different families of de Moggins. No less than four lady scrapers have been discovered, and young gentlemen are quite shy of ordering half a pint of port and simpering over the quarterly review at the club lest they should be mistaken for Sidney Scraper, Esquire. "'What can be your antipathy to Baker Street?' asks some fair remonstrant, evidently writing from that quarter. "'Why only attack the aristocratic snobs?' says one estimable correspondent. "'Are not the snobbish snobs to have their turn?' "'Pitch into the university snobs,' writes an indignant gentleman, who spelt elegant with two eyes. "'Show up the clerical snob,' suggests another. "'Being at Maurice's Hotel, Paris, some time since,' some wag hints, "'I saw Lord B. leaning out of the window with his boots in his hand "'and bawling out, "'Garçon, sirez-moi ces bottes!' "'Oughtn't he to be brought in among the snobs?' "'No, far from it. "'If his lordship's boots are dirty, "'it is because he is Lord B. and walks.' There is nothing snobbish in having only one pair of boots, or a favorite pair, and certainly nothing snobbish in desiring to have them cleaned. Lord B., in so doing, performed a perfectly natural and gentlemanlike action, for which I am so pleased with him that I have had him designated in a favorable and elegant attitude, and put at the head of this chapter in the place of honor. No, we are not personal in these candid remarks. As Phidias took the pick of a score of beauties before he completed a Venus, so have we to examine, perhaps, a thousand snobs, 
before one is expressed on paper. Great city snobs are the next in the hierarchy, and ought to be considered. But here is a difficulty. The great city snob is commonly most difficult of access. Unless you are a capitalist, you cannot visit him in the recesses of his bank parlor in Lombard Street. Unless you are a sprig of nobility, there is little hope of seeing him at home. In a great city snob firm, there is generally one partner whose name is down for charities, and who frequents Exeter Hall. You may catch a glimpse of another, a scientific city snob, at my Lord N.'s soirees, or the lectures of the London Institution, of a third, a city snob of taste, at picture auctions, at private views of exhibitions, or at the opera or the philharmonic, but intimacy is impossible in most cases with this grave, pompous, and awful being. A mere gentleman may hope to sit at almost anybody's table, to take his place at my lord duke's in the country, to dance a quadrille at Buckingham Palace itself. Beloved Lady Wilhelmina Wagglewiggle, do you recollect the sensation we made at the ball of our late adored sovereign Queen Caroline at Brandenburg House, Hammersmith? But the city snob's doors are, for the most part, closed to him, and hence all that one knows of this great class is mostly from hearsay. In other countries of Europe, the banking snob is more expansive and communicative than with us, and receives all the world into his circle. For instance, Everybody knows the princely hospitalities of the Charles child families at Paris, Naples, Frankfurt, etc. They entertain all the world, even the poor, at their fetes. Prince Polonia at Rome and his brother, the Duke of Stracchino, are also remarkable for their hospitalities. I like the spirit of the first named nobleman. Titles not costing much in the Roman territory, he has the head clerk of the banking house made a marquis, and his lordship will screw a bajaco out of you in exchange as dexterously as any commoner could do. It is a comfort to be able to gratify such grandees with a farthing or two. It makes the poorest man feel that he can do good. The Polonias have intermarried with the greatest and most ancient families of Rome, and you see their heraldic cognizance, a mushroom or on an azure field, quartered in a hundred places in the city, with the arms of the colonas and dorias. City snobs have the same mania for aristocratic marriages. I like to see such. I am of a savage and envious nature. I like to see these two humbugs, which, dividing, as they do, the social empire of this kingdom between them, hate each other naturally, making truce and uniting for the sordid interests of either. I like to see an old aristocrat, swelling with pride of race, the descendant of illustrious Norman robbers, whose blood has been pure for centuries, and who looks down upon common Englishmen as a free American does on a nigger. I like to see old Stiffneck obliged to bow down his head and swallow his infernal pride, and drink the cup of humiliation poured out by Pump and Aldgate's butler. Pump and Aldgate, says he, your grandfather was a bricklayer, and his hod is still kept in the bank. Your pedigree begins in a workhouse. Mine can be dated from all the royal palaces of Europe. I came over with a conqueror. I am own cousin to Charles Martel, Orlando Furioso, Philip Augustus, Peter the Cruel, and Frederick Barbarossa. I quarter the royal arms of Brentford in my coat. I despise you, but I want money, and I will sell you my beloved daughter, Blanche Stiffneck, for a hundred thousand pounds to pay off my mortgages. Let your son marry her, and she shall become Lady Blanche Pump and Aldgate. Old Pump and Aldgate clutches at the bargain, and a comfortable thing it is to think that birth can be bought for money. So you learn to value it. Why should we, who don't possess it, set a higher store on it than those who do? Perhaps the best use of that book, The Peerage, is to look down the list and see how many have bought and sold birth how poor sprigs of nobility somehow sell themselves to rich city snobs' daughters, how rich city snobs purchase noble ladies, and so to admire the double baseness of the bargain. Old Pump and Aldgate buys the article and pays the money. 
the sale of the girl's person is blessed by a bishop at st george's hanover square and next year you read at roehampton on saturday the lady blanche pump of a son and heir after this interesting event some old acquaintance who saw young pump in the parlor at the bank in the city said to him familiarly how's your wife pump my boy mr pump looked exceedingly puzzled and disgusted and after a pause said lady blanche pump is pretty well i thank you oh i thought she was your wife said the familiar brute snooks wishing him good-bye and ten minutes after the story was all over the stock exchange where it is told when young pump appears to this very day we can imagine the weary life this poor pump this martyr to mammon is compelled to undergo fancy the domestic enjoyments of a man who has a wife who scorns him who cannot see his own friends in his own house who having deserted the middle rank of life is not yet admitted to the higher but who is resigned to rebuffs and delay and humiliation contented to think that his son will be more fortunate it used to be the custom of some very old-fashioned clubs in the city when a gentleman asked for change a guinea always to bring it to him in washed silver that which had passed immediately out of the hands of vulgar being considered as too coarse to soil a gentleman's fingers so when the city snob's money has been washed during a generation or so has been washed into estates and woods and castles and town mansions it is allowed to pass current as real aristocratic coin old pump sweeps a shop runs of messages becomes a confidential clerk and partner pump the second becomes chief of the house spends more and more money marries his son to an earl's daughter pump tertius goes on with a bank but his chief business in life is to become the father of pump quartus who comes out a full-blown aristocrat and takes his seat as baron pumpington and his race rules hereditarily over this nation of snobs This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 9 of The Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darvinia. THE BOOK OF SNOBS BY WILLIAM MAKEPEACE THACKERAY CHAPTER Nine, ON SOME MILITARY SNOBS As no society in the world is more agreeable than that of well-bred and well-informed military gentlemen, so, likewise, none is more insufferable than that of military snobs. They are to be found of all grades, from the general officer, whose padded old breast twinkles over with a score of stars, clasps, and decorations, to the budding cornet, who is shaving for a beard, and has just been appointed to the sax coburg lancers. I have always admired that dispensation of rank in our country, which sets up this last-named little creature, who was flogged only last week because he could not spell, to command great whiskered warriors, who have faced all dangers of climate and battle, which, because he has money to lodge at the agents, will place him over the heads of men who have a thousand times more experience in desert, and which, in the course of time, will bring him all the honors of his profession, when the veteran soldier he commanded has got no other reward for his bravery than a berth in Chelsea Hospital, and the veteran officer he superseded has slunk into shabby retirement, and ends his disappointed life on a threadbare half-pay. When I read in the Gazette such announcements as Lieutenant and Captain Grigg from the Bombardier Guards to be Captain Vice Grizzle who retires, I know what becomes of the Peninsular Grizzle. I follow him in spirit to the humble country town where he takes up his quarters and occupies himself with the most desperate attempts to live like a gentleman on the stipend of half a tailor's foreman, and I picture to myself little Grigg rising from rank to rank, skipping from one regiment to another, with an increased grade in each, avoiding disagreeable foreign service, and ranking as a colonel at thirty, 
all because he has money, and Lord Grigsby is his father, who had the same luck before him. Grig must blush at first to give his orders to old men in every way his betters, and as it is very difficult for a spoiled child to escape being selfish and arrogant, so it is a very hard task indeed for this spoiled child of fortune not to be a snob. It must have often been a matter of wonder to the candid reader that the army, the most enormous job of all our political institutions, should yet work so well in the field, and we must cheerfully give Grig, and his like, the credit for courage which they display whenever occasion calls for it. The Duke's dandy regiments fought as well as any, they said better than any, but that's absurd. The great Duke himself was a dandy once, and jobbed on, as Marlborough did before him. But this only proves that dandies are brave as well as other Britons, as all Britons. Let us concede that the high-born Grig rode into the entrenchments at Sobran as gallantly as Corporal Wallop, the ex-ploughboy. The times of war are more favourable to him than the periods of peace. Think of Grig's life in the Bombardier Guards, or the Jackboot Guards, his marches from Windsor to London, from London to Windsor, from Knightsbridge to Regent's Park, the idiotic services he has to perform, which consist in inspecting the pipe-clay of his company, or the horses in the stable, or bellowing out, "'Shoulder humps! Carry humps!' all which duties the very smallest intellect that ever belonged to mortal man would suffice to comprehend. The professional duties of a footman are quite as difficult and various. The red jackets who hold gentlemen's horses in St. James's Street could do the work just as well as those vacuous, good-natured, gentlemanlike, rickety little lieutenants, who may be seen sauntering around Pall Mall, in high-heeled little boots, or rallying round the standard of their regiment in the palace court, at eleven o'clock when the band plays. Did the beloved reader ever see one of the young fellows staggering under the flag, or, above all, going through the operation of saluting it? It is worth a walk to the palace to witness that magnificent piece of tomfoolery. I have had the honour of meeting once or twice an old gentleman, whom I look upon to be a specimen of army training, and who has served in crack regiments, or commanded them all his life. I allude to Lieutenant General, the Honourable Sir George Granby Tufto, K.C.B., K.T.S., K.H., K.S.W., etc., etc. His manners are irreproachable generally. In society he is a perfect gentleman, and a most thorough snob. A man can't help being a fool, be he ever so old, and Sir George is a greater ass at sixty-eight than he was when he first entered the army at fifteen. He distinguished himself everywhere. His name is mentioned with praise in a score of gazettes. He is the man, in fact, whose padded breast, twinkling over with innumerable decorations, has already been introduced to the reader. It is difficult to say what virtues this prosperous gentleman possesses. He never read a book in his life, and with his purple, old gouty fingers, still writes a schoolboy hand. He has reached old age and grey hairs without being the least venerable. He dresses like an outrageously young man to the present moment, and laces and pads his old carcass as if he were still handsome George Tufto of 1800. He is selfish, brutal, passionate, and a glutton. It is curious to mark him at table, and see him heaving in his waistband, his little bloodshot eyes gloating over his meal. He swears considerably in his talk, and tells filthy garrison stories after dinner. On account of his rank and his services, people pay the bestarred and betitled old brute a sort of reverence and he looks down upon you and me, and exhibits his contempt for us, with a stupid and artless candour, which is quite amusing to watch. Perhaps, had he been bred to another profession, he would not have been the disreputable old creature he now is. But what other? He was fit for none, too incorrigibly idle and dull for any trade but this, in which he has distinguished himself publicly as a good and gallant officer." and privately, 
for riding races, drinking port, fighting duels, and seducing women. He believes himself to be one of the most honourable and deserving beings in the world. About Waterloo Place, of afternoons, you may see him tottering in his varnished boots and leering under the bonnets of the women who pass by. When he dies of apoplexy, the Times will have a quarter of a column about his services and battles. Four lines of print will be wanted to describe his titles and orders alone, and the earth will cover one of the wickedest and dullest old wretches that ever strutted over it. Lest it should be imagined that I am of so obstinate a misanthropic nature as to be satisfied with nothing, I beg, for the comfort of the forces, to state my belief that the army is not composed of such persons as the above. He has only been selected for the study of civilians and the military as a specimen of a prosperous and bloated army snob. No, when epaulets are not sold, when corporal punishments are abolished, and Corporal Smith has a chance to have his gallantry rewarded as well as that of Lieutenant Grigg, when there is no such rank as ensign and lieutenant, the existence of which rank is an absurd anomaly and an insult upon all the rest of the army. And should there be no war, I should not be disinclined to be a major general myself. I have a little sheaf of army snobs in my portfolio, but shall pause in my attack upon the forces till next week. End of chapter 9「This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. » Chapter 10 of The Book of Snobs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darvinia The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray Chapter 10. Military Snobs Walking in the park yesterday with my young friend Tag, and discoursing with him upon the next number of the snob, at the very nick of time, who should pass us but two very good specimens of military snobs, the sporting military snob, Captain Rag, and the lurking or rafish military snob, Ensign Famish. Indeed, you are fully sure to meet them lounging on horseback about five o'clock, under the trees by the serpentine, examining critically the inmates of the flashy broughams which parade up and down the ladies' mile. Tag and Rag are very well acquainted, and so the former, with that candour inseparable from intimate friendship, told me his dear friend's history. Captain Rag is a small, dapper North Country man. He went, when quite a boy, into a crack-light cavalry regiment, and by the time he got his troop, had cheated all his brother officers so completely, selling them lame horses for sound ones, and winning their money by all manner of strange and ingenious contrivances, that his colonel advised him to retire, which he did without much reluctance, accommodating a youngster who had just entered the regiment, with a glandered charger at an uncommonly stiff figure. He has since devoted his time to billiards, steeple-chasing, and the turf. His headquarters are Rummers, in Conduit Street, where he keeps his kit, but he is ever on the move in the exercise of his vocation as a gentleman jockey and gentleman leg. According to Bell's life, he is an invariable attendant at all races, and an actor in most of them. He rode the winner at Leamington, he was left for dead in a ditch a fortnight ago at Harrow, and yet there he was, last week, at the Croix de Berny, pale and determined as ever, astonishing the Badao of Paris by the elegance of his seat and the neatness of his rig, as he took a preliminary gallop on that vicious brute, the disowned, before starting for the French Grand National. He is a regular attendant at the corner, where he compiles a limited but comfortable libretto. During season he rides often in the park, mounted on a clever well-bred pony. 
He is to be seen escorting celebrated horsewoman Fanny Highflyer, or in confidential converse with Lord Thimblerig, the eminent handicapper. He carefully avoids decent society, and would rather dine off a stake at the One Ton, with Sam Snaffle the jockey, Captain O'Rourke, and two or three other notorious turf robbers, than with the choicest company in London. He likes to announce at Rummers that he is going to run down and spend his Saturday and Sunday in a friendly way with Hocus, the leg, at his little box near Epsom, where, if reports speak true, many rummish plants are concocted. He does not play billiards often, and never in public. But when he does play, he always contrives to get hold of a good flat, and never leaves him until he has done him uncommonly brown. He has lately been playing a good deal with Famish. When he makes his appearance in the drawing-room, which occasionally happens at a hunt-meeting or a race-ball, he enjoys himself extremely. His young friend is Ensign Famish, who is not a little pleased to be seen with such a smart fellow as Rag, who bows to the best turf company in the park. Rag lets Famish accompany him to Tattersall's, and sells him bargains in horse-flesh and uses Famish's cab. That young gentleman's regiment is in India, and he is at home on sick leave. He recruits his health by being intoxicated every night, and fortifies his lungs, which are weak, by smoking cigars all day. The policemen about the haymarket know the little creature, and the early cabmen salute him. The closed doors of fish and lobster shops open after service, and vomit out little Famish who is either tipsy and quarrelsome, when he wants to fight the cabman, or drunk and helpless, when some kind friend, in yellow satin, takes care of him. All the neighbourhood, the cabman, the police, the early potato-men, and the friends in yellow satin, know the young fellow, and he is called Little Bobby by some of the very worst reprobates in Europe. His mother, Lady Fanny Famish, believes devoutly that Robert is in London solely for the benefit of consulting the physician, is going to have him exchanged into a dragoon regiment, which doesn't go to that odious India, and has an idea that his chest is delicate, and that he takes gruel every evening when he puts his feet in hot water. Her ladyship resides at Cheltenham, and is of a serious turn. Bobby frequents the Union Jack Club, of course, where he breakfasts on pale ale and deviled kidneys at three o'clock, where beardless young heroes of his own sort congregate, and make merry, and give each other dinners, where you may see half a dozen of young rakes of the fourth or fifth order lounging and smoking on the steps, where you behold Slapper's long-tailed leggy mare in the custody of a red jacket, until the captain is primed for the park with a glass of curacoa, and where you see Hobby of the Highland Buffs driving up with Dobby of the Madras Fusiliers, in the great banging swinging cab which the latter hires from Rumble of Bond Street. In fact, military snobs are of such number and variety that a hundred weeks of punch would not suffice to give an audience to them. There is, besides the disreputable old military snob who has seen service, the respectable old military snob who has seen none, and gives himself the most prodigious martinet airs. There is the medical military snob, who is generally more outrageously military in his conversation than the greatest sabreur in the army. There is the heavy dragoon snob, whom young ladies admire with his great stupid pink face and yellow moustaches, a vacuous, solemn, foolish, but brave and honourable snob. There is the amateur military snob who writes captain on his card because he is a lieutenant in the Bungay militia. There is the lady-killing military snob, and more, who need not be named. But let no man, we repeat, charge Mr. Punch with disrespect for the army in general, that gallant and judicious army, every man of which, from F. M. the Duke of Wellington, etc., downwards, with the exception of H. R. H. Field Marshal Prince Albert, 
who, however, can hardly count as a military man, reads punch in every quarter of the globe. Let those civilians who sneer at the acquirements of the army read Sir Harry Smith's account of the Battle of Aliwal. A noble deed was never told in nobler language. And you who doubt if chivalry exists, or the age of heroism has passed by, think of Sir Henry Hardinge, with his son, dear little Arthur, riding in front of the lines at Ferroja. I hope no English painter will endeavour to illustrate that scene, for who is there to do justice to it? The history of the world contains no more brilliant and heroic picture. No, no, the men who perform these deeds with such brilliant valour, and describe them with such modest manliness, such are not snobs. Their country admires them, their sovereign rewards them, and Punch, the universal railer, takes off his hat and says, Heaven save them. End of chapter 10「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」After Snobs Military, Snobs Clerical suggest themselves quite naturally, and it is clear that, with every respect for the cloth, yet having a regard for truth, humanity, and the British public, such a vast and influential class must not be omitted from our notices of the great snob world. Of these clerics, there are some whose claim to snobbishness is undoubted, and yet it cannot be discussed here, for the same reason that Punch would not set up his show in a cathedral. Out of respect for the solemn service celebrated within. There are some places where he acknowledges himself not privileged to make a noise, and puts away his show, and silences his drum, and takes off his hat, and holds his peace. And I know this, that if there are some clerics who do wrong, there are straightway a thousand newspapers to haul up those unfortunates and cry, Fie upon them, fie upon them. While, though the press is always ready to yell and bellow excommunication against these stray, delinquent parsons, it somehow takes very little count of the many good ones, of the tens of thousands of honest men who lead Christian lives, who give to the poor generously, who deny themselves rigidly, and live and die in their duty, without ever a newspaper paragraph in their favour. My beloved friend and reader, I wish you and I could do the same. And let me whisper my belief, entre nous, that of those eminent philosophers who cry out against parsons the loudest, there are not many who have got their knowledge of the church by going thither often. But you, who have ever listened to village bells or walked to church as children on sunny Sabbath mornings, you who have ever seen the parson's wife tending to the poor man's bedside, or the town clergyman threading the dirty stairs of noxious alleys upon his business, Do not raise a shout when one falls away, or yell with the mob that howls after him. Every man can do that. When old Father Noah was overtaken in his cups, there was only one of his sons that dared to make merry at his disaster, and he was not the most virtuous of the family. Let us, too, turn away silently, nor huzzah like a parcel of schoolboys, because some big young rebel suddenly starts up and whoops the schoolmaster. I confess, though, if I had by me the names of those seven or eight Irish bishops, the probates of whose wills were mentioned in last year's journals, and who died leaving behind them some two hundred thousand apiece, I would like to put them up as patrons of my clerical snobs, and operate upon them as successfully as I see from the newspapers Mr. Eisenberg, chiropodist, has lately done upon His Grace the Reverend Lord Bishop of Tapioca. I confess that when those right reverend prelates come up to the gates of paradise with their probates of wills in their hands, I think that their chance is. But the gates of paradise is a far way to follow their lordships, so let us trip down again 
lest awkward questions should be asked about our own favorite vices too and don't let us give way to the vulgar prejudice that clergymen are an overpaid and luxurious body of men what that eminent ascetic the late sydney smith by the way by what law of nature is it that so many smiths in this world are called sydney smith lauded the system of great prizes in the church without which he said gentlemen would not be induced to follow the clerical profession he admitted most pathetically that the clergy in general were by no means to be envied for their worldly prosperity from reading the works of some modern writers of repute you would fancy that a parson's life was passed in gorging himself with plum pudding and port wine and that his reverences fat chaps were always greasy with the crackling of tithe pigs caricaturists delight to represent him so round short-necked pimple-faced apoplectic bursting out of the waistcoat like a black pudding a shovel-hatted fuzz-wigged salinas whereas if you take the real man the poor fellow's flesh-pots are very scantily furnished with meat he labours commonly for a wage that a tailor's foreman would despise he has too such claims upon his dismal income as most philosophers would rather grumble to meet many ties are levied upon his pocket let it be remembered by those who grudge him his means of livelihood he has to dine with the squire and his wife must dress neatly and he must look like a gentleman as they call it and bring up six great hungry sons as such add to this if he does his duty he has such temptations to spend his money as no mortal man could withstand yes you who can't resist purchasing a chest of cigars because they are so good or an ormolu clock at howell and james's because it is such a bargain or a box at the opera because la blanche and greasy are divine in the puritani fancy how difficult it is for a parson to resist spending a half-crown when john breakstone's family are without a loaf or standing a bottle of port for poor old polly rabbits who has her thirteenth child or treating himself to a suit of corduroys for little bob scarecrow whose breeches are sadly out at the elbows think of these temptations brother moralist and philosophers and don't be too hard on the parson but what is this instead of showing up the parsons we are indulging in maudlin praises of that monstrous black-coated race o oh, saintly francis lying at rest under the turf o oh, jimmy and johnny and willie friends of my youth o oh, noble and dear old elias how should he who knows you not respect you and your calling may this pen never write a pennyworth again if it ever casts ridicule upon either this audiobook is brought to you by full audiobooks please like subscribe and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks chapter twelve of the book of snobs this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darvinia. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 12. On Clerical Snobs and Snobbishness. Dear Mr. Snob, an amiable young correspondent writes, who signs himself snobbling ought the clergyman who at the request of a noble duke lately interrupted a marriage ceremony between two persons perfectly authorized to marry to be ranked or not among the clerical snobs this my dear young friend is not a fair question one of the illustrated weekly papers has already seized hold of the clergyman and blackened him most unmercifully by representing him in his cassock, performing the marriage service. Let that be sufficient punishment, and if you please, do not press the query. It is very likely that if Miss Smith had come with a license to marry Jones, the parson in question, not seeing old Smith present, would have sent off the beadle in a cab to let the old gentleman know what was going on, and would have delayed the service until the arrival of Smith Sr., he very likely thinks it his duty to ask all marriageable young ladies, who come without their papa, why their parent is absent, and no doubt 
always sends off the beetle for that missing governor. Or it is very possible that the Duke of Cordelion was Mr. what do you call him's most intimate friend, and has often said to him, "What do you call him, my boy? My daughter must never marry the captain. If ever they try at your church, I beseech you, considering the terms of intimacy on which we are, to send off Rattan in a hack cab to fetch me." In either of which cases, you see, dear Snobling, that though the parson would not have been authorized, yet he might have been excused for interfering. He has no more right to stop my marriage than to stop my dinner, to both of which, as a free-born Briton, I am entitled, by law, if I can pay for them. But consider pastoral solicitude, a deep sense of the duties of his office, and pardon this inconvenient but genuine zeal. But if the clergyman did in the duke's case what he would not do in Smith's, if he has no more acquaintance with the Cordelion family than I have with the royal and serene house of Saxe Coburg Gotha, then, I confess, my dear Snobling, your question might elicit a disagreeable reply, and one which I respectfully decline to give. I wonder what Sir George Tufto would say if a sentry left his post because a noble lord, not the least connected with the service, begged the sentinel not to do his duty. Alas, that the beadle who canes little boys and drives them out cannot drive worldliness out too. What is worldliness but snobbishness? When, for instance, I read in the newspapers that the right reverend, the Lord Charles James, administered the right of confirmation to a party of the juvenile nobility, at the chapel royal, as if the chapel royal were a sort of ecclesiastical almax, and young people were to get ready for the next world in little exclusive genteel knots of the aristocracy, who were not to be disturbed in their journey thither by the company of the vulgar. When I read such a paragraph as that, and one or two such generally appear during the present fashionable season, it seems to me to be the most odious, mean, and disgusting part of that odious, mean, and disgusting publication, the court circular, and that snobbishness is therein carried to quite an awful pitch. What, gentlemen, can't we even in the church acknowledge a republic? There, at least, the Herald's College itself might allow that we all of us have the same pedigree, and are direct descendants of Eve and Adam, whose inheritance is divided amongst us. I hereby call upon all dukes, earls, baronets, and other potentates, not to lend themselves to this shameful scandal and error, and beseech all bishops who read this publication to take the matter into consideration, and to protest against the continuance of the practice, and to declare we won't confirm or christen Lord Tom Noddy or Sir Carnaby Jenks to the exclusion of any other young Christian, the which declaration, if their lordships are induced to make, a great lapis offensionis will be removed, and the snob papers will not have been written in vain. A story is current of a celebrated nouveau riche, who, having had occasion to oblige that excellent prelate, the Bishop of Bullock Smithy, asked his lordship in return to confirm his children privately in his lordship's own chapel, which ceremony the grateful prelate accordingly performed. Can satire go farther than this? Is there even in this most amusing of prints any more naive absurdity? It is as if a man wouldn't go to heaven unless he went in a special train, or as if he thought, as some people think about vaccination, confirmation more effectual when administered at first hand. When that eminent person, the Begum Sum Rue, died, it is said that she left ten thousand pounds to the Pope and ten thousand to the Archbishop of Canterbury, so that there should be no mistake so as to make sure of having the ecclesiastical authorities on her side. This is only a little more openly and undisguisedly snobbish than the cases before alluded to. 
a well-bred snob is just as secretly proud of his riches and honours as a parvenu snob, who makes the most ludicrous exhibition of them, and a high-born marchioness or duchess, just as vain of herself and her diamonds, as Queen Quashiboo, who sews a pair of epaulets on to her skirt and turns out in state in a cocked hat and feathers. It is not out of disrespect to my peerage, which I love and honour. Indeed, have I not said before that I should be ready to jump out of my skin if two dukes would walk down Pall Mall with me? It is not out of disrespect for the individuals that I wish these titles had never been invented. But consider, if there were no tree, there would be no shadow, and how much more honest society would be and how much more serviceable the clergy would be, which is our present consideration, if these temptations of rank and continual baits of worldliness were not in existence, and perpetually thrown out to lead them astray. I have seen many examples of their falling away. When, for instance, Tom Sniffle first went into the country as curate for Mr. Fuddleston, Sir Huddleston Fuddleston's brother, who resided on some other living, there could not be a more kind, hard-working, and excellent creature than Tom. He had his aunt to live with him. His conduct to his poor was admirable. He wrote annually reams of the best intentions and vapid sermons. When Lord Brandyball's family came down into the country and invited him to dine at Brandyball Park, Sniffle was so agitated that he almost forgot how to say grace and upset a bowl of currant jelly sauce in Lady Fanny Toffy's lap. What was the consequence of his intimacy with that noble family? He quarrelled with his aunt for dining out every night, the wretch forgot his poor altogether, and killed his old nag by always riding over to Brandyball, where he revelled in the maddest passion for Lady Fanny. He ordered the neatest new clothes and ecclesiastical waistcoats from London, he appeared with Coraza shirts, lacquered boots, and perfumery. He bought a blood horse from Bob Toffy, was seen at archery meetings, public breakfasts, actually at cover, and I blush to say that I saw him in a stall at the opera, and afterwards riding by Lady Fanny's side in Rotten Row. He double-barreled his name, as many poor snobs do, and instead of T. Sniffle, as formerly, came out in a porcelain card as Reverend T. Darcy Sniffle, Burlington Hotel. The end of all this may be imagined. When the Earl of Brandyball was made acquainted with the curate's love for Lady Fanny, he had that fit of the gout which so nearly carried him off. To the inexpressible grief of his son, Lord Alicampaigne, and uttered that remarkable speech to Sniffle, which disposed of the claims of the latter. "'If I didn't respect the church, sir,' his lordship said, "'by Jove I'd kick you downstairs.' His lordship then fell back into the fit aforesaid, and Lady Fanny, as we all know, married General Podager. As for poor Tom, he was over head and ears in debt as well as in love. His creditors came down upon him. Mr. Hemp of Portugal Street proclaimed his name lately as a reverend outlaw, and he has been seen at various foreign watering places, sometimes doing duty, sometimes coaching a stray gentleman's son at Carlsruhe or Kinsingen, sometimes, must we say it, lurking about the roulette tables with a tuft to his chin. If temptation had not come upon this unhappy fellow in the shape of a Lord Brandyball, he might still have been following his profession, humbly and worthily. He might have married his cousin with four thousand pounds, the wine merchant's daughter. The old gentleman quarrelled with his nephew for not soliciting wine orders from Lord B. for him. He might have had seven children, and taken private pupils, and eked out his income and lived and died a country parson. Could he have done better? You who want to know how great and good and noble such a character may be, read 
Stanley's Life of Dr. Arnold. End of chapter 12「This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks.」Chapter 13 of the Book of Snobs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lawrence The Book of Snobs by William Make peace, Thackeray. Chapter 13. On Clerical Snobs Among the varieties of the snob clerical, the university snob and the scholastic snob ought never to be forgotten. They form a very strong battalion in the black-coated army. The wisdom of our ancestors, which I admire more and more every day, seemed to have determined that education of youth was so paltry and unimportant a matter that almost any man armed with a birch and regulation cassock and degree, might undertake the charge. And many an honest country gentleman may be found to the present day, who takes a very good care to have a character with his butler when he engages him, and will not purchase a horse without the warranty and the closest inspection, but sends off his son, young John Thomas, to school without asking any questions about the schoolmaster, and places the lad at Switchester College, under Dr. Block, because he, the good old English gentleman, had been at Switchester under Dr. Buswig forty years ago. We have a love for all little boys at school, for many scores of thousands of them read and love Punch. May he never write a word that shall not be honest and fit for them to read. He will not have his young friends to be snobs in the future, or to be bullied by snobs, or given over to such to be educated. Our connection with the young at the universities is very close and affectionate. The candid undergraduate is our friend. The pompous old college don trembles in his common room, lest we should attack him and show him up as a snob. When railroads were threatening to invade the land which they have since conquered, it may be recollected what a shrieking and outcry the authorities of Oxford and Eton made lest the iron abominations should come near those seats of pure learning, and tempt the British youth astray. The supplications were in vain. The railroad is upon them, and the old world institutions are doomed. I felt charmed to read in the papers the other day a most voracious puffing advertisement headed, To College and Back for Five Shillings. The college gardens, it said, will be thrown open on this occasion. The college youths will perform a regatta. The chapel of King's College will have its celebrated music, and all for five shillings. The Goths have got into Rome. Napoleon Stevenson draws his Republican lines around the sacred old cities, and the ecclesiastical bigwigs who garrison them must prepare to lay down key and crozier before the Iron Conqueror. If you consider, dear reader, what profound snobbishness the university system produced, you will allow that it is time to attack some of those feudal middle age superstitions. If you go down for five shillings to look at the college youths, you may see one sneaking down the court without a tassel to his cap, another with a gold or silver fringe to his velvet trencher, a third lad with a master's gown and hat, walking at ease over the sacred college grass plats, which common men must not trod on. He may do it because he is a nobleman. Because a lad is a lord, the university gives him a degree at the end of two years, which another is seven in acquiring. Because he is a lord, he has no call to go through an examination. Any man who has not been to college and back for five shillings would not believe in such distinctions in a place of education, so absurd and monstrous they seem to be. The lads with gold and silver lace are sons of rich gentlemen, and called fellow commoners, they are privileged to feed better than their pensioners, and to have wine with their victuals, which the latter can only get in their rooms. The unlucky boys, who have no tassels to their caps, are called scissars, servitors at Oxford, a very pretty and gentlemanlike title. A distinction is made in their clothes because they are poor, for which reason they wear a badge of poverty, and are not allowed to take their meals with their fellow students. 
When this wicked and shameful distinction was set up, it was of a piece with all the rest, a part of the brutal, unchristian, blundering feudal system. Distinctions of rank were then so strongly insisted upon that it would have been thought blasphemy to doubt them, as blasphemous as it is in parts of the United States now for a nigger to set up as the equal of a white man. A ruffian like Henry the Eighth talked as gravely about the divine powers vested in him as if he had been an inspired prophet. A wretch like James I not only believed that there was in himself a particular sanctity, but other people believed him. Government regulated the length of a merchant's shoes, as well as meddled in his trade, prices, exports, machinery. It thought itself justified in roasting a man for his religion, or pulling a Jew's teeth out if he did not pay a contribution, or ordered him to dress in a yellow gabardine, and locked him in a particular quarter. Now a merchant may wear what boots he pleases, and has pretty nearly acquired the privilege of buying and selling without the government laying its paws upon the bargain. The stake for heretics is gone. The pillory is taken down. Bishops are even found lifting up their voices against the remains of persecution, and ready to do away with the last Catholic disabilities. Sir Robert Peel, though he wished it ever so much, has no power over Mr. Benjamin Disraeli's grinders, or any means of violently handling that gentleman's jaw. Jews are not called upon to wear badges. On the contrary, they may live in Piccadilly, or the Minories, according to fancy. They may dress like Christians, and do sometimes in a most elegant and fashionable manner. Why is the poor college servitor to wear that name and badge still? Because universities are the last place into which reform penetrates. But now that she can go to college and back for five shillings, let her travel down thither. End of chapter 13 Recording by David Lawrence in Brampton, Ontario, August the 6th This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 14 of the Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shalif Mulligan. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 14 on University Snobs. All the men of St. Boniface will recognize Hubie and Crump in these two pictures. They were tutors in our time, and Crump is since advanced to be president of the college. He was formerly, and is now, a rich specimen of a university snob. At five and twenty, Crump invented three new meters, and published an edition of an exceedingly improper Greek comedy, with no less than twenty emendations upon the German text of Schnupfenius and Schnapsius. These services to religion instantly pointed him out for advancement in the church, and he is now president of St. Boniface, and very narrowly escaped the bench. Crump thinks St. Boniface the centre of the world, and his position as president the highest in England. He expects the fellows and tutors to pay him the same sort of service that cardinals pay to the Pope. I am sure Crawler would have no objection to carry a stranger, or page to hold up the skirt of his gown as he stalks into chapel. He roars out the responses there, as if it were an honour to heaven that a president of St. Boniface should take a part in the service, and in his own lodge and college acknowledges the sovereign only as his superior. When the allied monarchs came down and were made doctors of the university, a breakfast was given at St. Boniface, on which occasion Crump allowed the Emperor Alexander to walk before him, but took the pa himself of the King of Prussia and Prince Blucher. He was going to put the Hetman Platov to breakfast at the side table with the under-college tutors, but he was induced to relent, and merely entertained that distinguished Cossack with a discourse on his own language, in which he showed that the Hetman knew nothing about it. As for us undergraduates, we scarcely know more about Crump than about the Grand Lama. 
A few favoured youths are asked occasionally to tea at the lodge, but they do not speak unless first addressed by the doctor, and if they venture to sit down, Crump's follower, Mr. Toady, whispers, "'Gentlemen, will you have the kindness to get up? The President is passing.' Or, "'Gentlemen, the President prefers that undergraduates should not sit down.' or words to a similar effect. To do crumb justice, he does not cringe now to great people. He rather patronizes them than otherwise, and in London speaks quite affably to a duke who has been brought up as his college, or holds out a finger to a marquise. He does not disguise his own origin, but brags of it with considerable self-gratulation. I was a charity boy, says he, See what I am now, the greatest Greek scholar of the greatest college, of the greatest university, of the greatest empire in the world. The argument being that this is a capital world for beggars, because he, being a beggar, has managed to get on horseback. Hubie owes his eminence to patient merit and agreeable perseverance. He is a meek, mild, inoffensive creature, with just enough of scholarship to fit him to hold a lecture or set an examination paper. He rose by kindness to the aristocracy. It was wonderful to see the way in which that poor creature groveled before a nobleman or a lord's nephew, or even some noisy and disreputable commoner, the friend of a lord. He used to give the young nobleman the most painful and elaborate breakfasts, and adopt a jaunty genteel air and talk with him although he was decidedly serious, about the opera, of the last run with the hounds. It was good to watch him in the midst of a circle of young tufts, with his mean, smiling, eager, uneasy familiarity. He used to write home confidential letters to their parents, and made it his duty to call upon them when in town, to condole or rejoice with them when a death, birth, or marriage took place in their family, and to feast them whenever they came to the university. I recollect a letter lying on a desk in his lecture-room for a whole term, beginning, My Lord Duke. It was to show us that he corresponded with such dignities. When the late lamented Lord Glenlivet, who broke his neck at a hurdle race, at the premature age of twenty-four, was at the university, the amiable young fellow, passing to his rooms in the early morning, and seeing Hubie's boots at his door, on the same staircase, playfully wadded the inside of the boots with cobbler's wax, which caused excruciating pains to the reverend Mr. Hubie, when he came to take them off the same evening, before dining with the master of St. Crispin's. Everybody gave the credit of this admirable piece of fun to Lord Glenlivet's friend, Bob Tizzy, who was famous for such feats, and who had already made away with the college pump-handle, filed St. Boniface's nose smooth with his face, carried off four images of nigger boys from the tobacconists, painted the senior proctor's horse pea-green, etc., etc. And Bob, who was of the party certainly, and would not peach, was just on the point of incurring expulsion, and so losing the family living which was in store for him, when Glenlivet nobly stepped forward, owned himself to be the author of the delightful jeu d'esprit, apologized to the tutor, and accepted the rustication. Hubie cried when Glenlivet apologized. If the young nobleman had kicked him round the cord, I believe the tutor would have been happy, so that an apology and a reconciliation might subsequently ensue. My lord, said he, in your conduct on this and all other occasions, you have acted as becomes a gentleman. You have been an honour to the university, as you will be to the peerage. I am sure when the amiable vivacity of youth is calmed down, and you are called upon to take your proper share in the government of the nation. And when his lordship took leave of the university, Hubie presented him with a copy of his Sermons to a Nobleman's Family. Hubie was once private tutor to the sons of the Earl of Muffborough, which Glenlivet presented in return to Mr. William Ram, known to the fancy as a Tudbury pet, and the sermons now figure on the boudoir table of Mrs. Ram, 
Behind the bar of a house of entertainment, the game cock and spurs, knee woodstock, oxen. At the beginning of the long vacation, Hubie comes to town and puts up in handsome lodgings near St. James's Square, rides in the park in the afternoon, and is delighted to read his name in the morning papers among the list of persons present at Muffborough House and a Marquise of Farintosh's evening parties. He is a member of Sydney Scrapers Club, where, however, he drinks his pint of claret. Sometimes you may see him on Sundays, at the hour when tavern doors open, whence issue little girls with great jugs of porter, when charity boys walk the streets bearing round dishes of smoking shoulders of mutton and baked taters, when Sheeny and Moses are seen smoking their pipes before their lazy shutters in seven dials, when a crowd of smiling persons in clean outlandish dresses, in monstrous bonnets and flaring printed gowns, or in crumpled glossy coats and silks, that bear the creases of the drawers, where they have lain all the week, file down High Street. Sometimes, I say, you may see Hubie coming out at the church of St. Giles in the fields, with a stout gentlewoman leaning on his arms, whose old face bears an expression of supreme pride and happiness, as she glances round at all the neighbours, and who faces the curate himself, and marches into Holborn, where she pulls the bell of a house over which is inscribed, Hubie Haberdasher. It is a mother of the Reverend F. Hubie, as proud of her son in his white joker, as Cornelia of her jewels at Rome. That is old Hubie bringing up the rear with the prayer books, and Betsy Hubie, the old maid, his daughter. Old Hubie, Haberdasher, and Church Warden. In the front room upstairs, where the dinner is laid out, there is a picture of Muffborough Castle, of the Earl of Muffborough, K. X., Lord Lieutenant for Diddlesex, an engraving from an almanac of St. Boniface College, Oxon, and a sticking plaster portrait of Hubie, when young, in a cap and gown. A copy of his sermons to a nobleman's family is on the bookshelf, by the whole duty of man, the reports of the missionary societies, and the Oxford University calendar. Old Hubie knows part of this by heart, every living belonging to St. Boniface, and the name of every tutor, fellow, nobleman, and undergraduate. He used to go to meeting and preach himself, until his son took orders, but of late the old gentleman has been accused of, of puseyism and is quite pitiless against the dissenters. End of chapter 14「This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks.」Chapter 15 of the Book of Snobs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie von Wallachem The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray Chapter 15 on University Snobs I should like to fill several volumes with accounts of various university snobs. So fond are my reminiscences of them, and so numerous are they. I should like to speak above all of the wives and daughters of some of the professor snobs, their amusements, habits, jealousies, their innocent artifices to entrap young men, the picnics, concerts, and evening parties. I wonder what has become of Emily Blades, daughter of Blades, the professor of the Mandingo language. I remember her shoulders to this day, as she sat in the midst of a crowd of about seventy young gentlemen, from Corbus and Catherine Hall, entertaining them with ogles and French songs on the guitar. Are you married, fair Emily of the shoulders? What beautiful ringlets those were that used to dribble over them! What a waste! What a killing sea-green shot silk gown! What a cameo, the size of a muffin! There were thirty-six young men of the university enough at one time with Emily Blades, and no words are sufficient to describe the pity, the sorrow, the deep, deep commiseration. 
the rage, fury, and uncharitableness, in other words, with which the Miss Drums, daughter of Drums, the professor of phlebotomy, regarded her because she didn't squint, and because she wasn't marked with the smallpox. As for the young university snobs, I am getting too old now to speak of such very familiarly. My recollections of them lie in the far, far past, almost as far back as Pelham's time. We then used to consider snobs raw-looking lads who never missed chapel, who wore high lows and no straps, who walked two hours on the Trumpington Road every day of their lives, who carried off the college scholarships, and who overrated themselves in whole. We were premature in pronouncing our verdict of youthful snobbishness. The man without straps fulfilled his destiny and duty. He eased his old governor, the curate in Westmoreland, or helped his sisters to set up the ladies' school. He wrote a dictionary, or a treatise on conic sections, as his nature and genius prompted. He got a fellowship, and then took to himself a wife and a living. He presides over a parish now, and thinks it rather a dashing thing to belong to the Oxford and Cambridge Club, and his parishioners love him, and snore under his sermons. No, no, he is not a snob. It is not straps that make the gentleman, or high lows that unmake him, be they ever so sick. My son, it is you who are the snob if you lightly despise a man for doing his duty, and refuse to shake an honest man's hand because it wears a burlin glove. We then used to consider it not the least vulgar for a parcel of lads who had been whipped three months previous, and were not allowed more than three glasses of port at home, to sit down to pineapples and ices at each other's rooms, and fuddle themselves with champagne and claret. One looks back to what was called a wine-party, with a sort of wonder. Thirty lads round a table covered with bad sweetmeats, drinking bad wines, telling bad stories, singing bad songs over and over again. Milk-punch, smoking, ghastly headache, frightful spectacle of dessert table next morning and smell of tobacco your guardian the clergyman dropping in in the midst of this expecting to find you deep in algebra and discovering the jib administering soda water there were young men who despised the lads who indulged in the coarse hospitalities of wine parties who prided themselves as giving recherche little french dinners both wine-party-givers and dinner-givers were snobs. They were what used to be called dressy snobs. Jimmy, who might be seen at five o'clock elaborately rigged out, as a camellia in his buttonhole, glazed boots, and fresh kid-gloves twice a day. Jessamy, who was conspicuous for his jewellery, a young donkey glittering all over with chains, rings, and shirt-studs. Jackie, who rode every day solemnly on the Blenheim Road, in pumps and white silk stockings with his hair curled. All three of him flattered themselves they give laws to the university about dress. All three most odious varieties of snobs. Sporting snobs, of course, there were, and are always, those happy beings in whom nature has implanted a love of slang, who loitered about the horsekeeper's stables, and drove the London coaches, a stage in and out, and might be seen swaggering through the courts in pink of early mornings, and indulged in dies and blind hooky at nights, and never missed a race or a boxing match, and rode flat races, and kept bull terriers. Worse snobs even than these were poor miserable wretches who did not like hunting at all, and could not afford it, and were in mortal fear at a two-foot ditch, but who hunted because Glenlivet and King Bars hunted. The billiard snob and the boating snob were varieties of these, and are to be found elsewhere than in universities. Then there were philosophical snobs, who used to ape statesmen at the spouting clubs, and who believed as a fact that government always had an eye on the university for the selection of orators for the House of Commons. There were audacious young freethinkers, who adored nobody or nothing, except perhaps Robespierre and the Koran, and panted for the day 
and the pale name of priest should shrink and dwindle away before the indignation of an enlightened world. But the worst of all university snobs are those unfortunates who go to rack and ruin from their desire to ape their betters. Smith becomes acquainted with great people at college, and is ashamed of his father, the tradesman. Jones has fine acquaintances, and lives after their fashion like a gay free-hearted fellow as he is, and ruins his father, and robs his sister's portion, and cripples his younger brother's outset and knife, for the pleasure of entertaining my lord, and riding by the side of Sir John. And though it may be very good fun for Robinson to fuddle himself at home as he does at college, and to be brought home by the policeman he has just been trying to knock down, think what fun it is for the poor old soul, his mother, the half-pay captain's widow, who has been pinching herself all her life long, in order that that jolly young fellow might have a university education. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 16 of the Book of Snobs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellie. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Zachary Chapter 16 On Literary Snobs what will he say about literary snobs has been a question i make no doubt often asked by the public how can he let off his own profession will that truculent and unsparing monster who attacks the nobility the clergy the army and the ladies indiscriminately hesitate when the turn comes to gorge his own flesh and blood my dear and excellent querist whom does the schoolmaster flog so resolutely as his own son didn't brutus chop his offspring's head off you have a very bad opinion indeed of the present state of literature and of literary men if you fancy that any of us would hesitate to stick a knife into his neighbor penman if the latter's death could do the state any service but the fact is that in the literary profession there are no snobs look around the whole body of british men of letters and i defy you to point out among them a single instance of vulgarity or envy or assumption men and women as far as i have known them are all modest in their demeanour elegant in their manners spotless in their lives and honourable in their conduct to the world and to each other you may occasionally it is true hear one literary man abusing his brother but why not in the least out of malice not at all from envy merely from a sense of truth and public duty suppose for instance i good-naturedly point out a blemish in my friend miss punch's purse and say mr p has a humpback and his nose and chin are more crooked than those features in the apollo and the antonius which we are accustomed to consider as our standards of beauty does this argue malice on my part towards mr punch not in the least it is the critic's duty to point out defects as well as merits and he invariably does his duty with utmost gentleness and candour an intelligent foreigner's testimony about our manners is always worth having and i think in this respect the work of an eminent american mr m p willis is eminently valuable and impartial in his history of ernest clay a crack magazine writer the reader will get an exact account of the life of a popular man of letters in england he is always a lion of society he takes the p a s of dukes and earls all the nobility crowd to see him i forget how many baronesses and duchesses fall in love with him but on this subject let us hold our tongues modesty forbids that we should reveal the names of the heart-broken countesses and dear marchionesses who are pining for every one of the contributors in punch if anybody wants to know how intimately authors are connected with the fashionable world they have but to read the genteel novels what refinement and delicacy pervades the works of mrs barnaby what delightful good company do you meet with in mrs armitage she seldom introduces you to anybody under a marquee i don't know anything more delicious than the pictures of gentle life in ten thousand a year except perhaps the young duke and cunning spy there's a modest grace about them and an air of easy high fashion which only belongs to blood my dear sir to true blood and what linguists many of our writers are lady bulwer lady londonderry sir edward himself they write the french language with a luxurious elegance and ease which sets them far above their continental rivals of whom not one except paul de cock knows a word of english and what britain can read without enjoyment the works of james so admirable for terseness 
and the playful humor and dazzling offhand lightness of Ainsworth. Among other humorists, one might glance at a Gerald, the chivalrous advocate of Toryism and the Church and State, and a Beckett, with a lightsome pen, but the savage earnestness of purpose. A James, whose pure style and wit mingled with buffoonery, was relished by a congenial public. Speaking of critics, perhaps there never was a review that has done so much for literature as the admirable Quarterly. It has its prejudices, to be sure, as which of us has not. It goes out of its way to abuse a great man, or lays mercilessly to such pretenders as Keats and Tennyson. But, on the other hand, it is the friend of all young authors, and has marked and nurtured all the rising talent of the country. It is loved by everybody. There again is Blackwood's magazine, conspicuous for modest elegance and amiable satire. That review never passes the bounds of politeness in a joke. It is the arbiter of manners, and while gently exposing the foibles of Londoners, for whom the beau esprit of Edinburgh entertain a justifiable contempt, it is never coarse in its fun. The fiery enthusiasm of the Antineum is well known, and the bitter wit of the too difficulty literary gazette. The examiner is perhaps too timid, and the spectator too boisterous in its praise. But who can carp at those minor faults? No, no. The critics of England and the authors of England are unrivaled as a body, and hence it becomes impossible for us to find fault with them. Above all, I never knew a man of letters ashamed of his profession. Those who know us know what an affectionate and brotherly spirit is among us all. Sometimes one of us rises in the world. We never attack him or sneer at him under those circumstances, but rejoice to a man at his success. If Jones dines with a lord, Smith never says Jones is a courtier or a cringer. Nor, on the other hand, does Jones, who is in the habit of frequenting the society of great people, give himself any airs on account of the company he keeps. But we'll leave a duke's arm in Pell-Mell to come over and speak to poor Brown, the young Penny a liner. Above all, I never knew a man of letters ashamed of his profession. Those who know us know what an affectionate and brotherly spirit there is among us. That sense of equality and fraternity amongst the authors has always struck me as one of the most amiable characteristics of the class. It is because we know and respect each other that the world respects us so much, that we hold such a good position in society and demean ourselves so irreproachably when there. Literary persons are held in such esteem by the nation that about two of them have been absolutely invited to court during the present reign and it is probable that towards the end of the season one or two will be asked to dinner with sir robert peel they are such favorites with the public that they are continually obliged to have their pictures taken and published and one or two could be pointed out of whom the nation insists upon having a fresh portrait every year nothing can be more gratifying than this proof of affectionate regard which the people has for its instructors literature is held in such honor in england that there is a sum of near twelve thousand pounds per annum set apart to pension deserving persons following that profession and a great compliment this is too to the professors and a proof of their generally prosperous and flourishing condition they are generally so rich and thrifty that scarcely any money is wanted to help them if every word of this is true how i should like to know am i to write about literary snobs End of chapter 16. Recording by Ellie, July 2009. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 17 of the Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellie. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Zachary. Chapter 17. A Little About Irish Snobs. You do not, to be sure, imagine that there are no other snobs in Ireland than those of the amiable party who wish to make pikes of iron railroads. It's a fine Irish economy, and to cut the throats of the Saxon invaders. These are of the venomous sort and had they been invented in his time st patrick would have banished them out of the kingdom along with the other dangerous reptiles i think it is the four masters or else it's oleus magnus or else it's certainly o'neill daunt in the catechism of irish history who relates that when richard the second came to ireland and the irish chiefs did homage to him going down on their knees the poor simple creatures and worshipping and wandering before the english king and the dandies of his court my lords the english noblemen mocked and cheered at the uncles irish admirers mimicked their talk and gestures pulled their poor old beards and laughed at the strange fashion of their garments the english snob rampant always does this to the present day 
There is no snob in existence, perhaps, that has such an indomitable belief in himself, that sneers you down all the rest of the world besides, and has such an insufferable, admirable, stupid contempt of all people but his own, nay, for all sets but his own. Gracious God, what stories about these Irish, these young dandies accompanying King Richard, must have had to tell, when they returned to Parmel and smoked their cigars upon the steps of whites. The Irish snobbishness develops itself not in pride so much as in civility, and mean admirations, and trumpery imitations of their neighbors. And I wonder the Tocqueville and the Beaumont and the Times Commissioner did not explain the snobbishness of Ireland as contrasted with our own. Ours is that of Richard's Norman knights, haughty, brutal, stupid, and perfectly self-confident. Theirs of the poor, wandering, kneeling, simple chieftains. They are on the knees still before English fashion, the simple wild people, and indeed it is hard not to grin at some of their naive exhibitions. Some years since, when a certain great orator was Lord Mayor of Dublin, he used to wear a red gown and a cocked hat, the splendor of which delighted him as much as a new curtain ring in her nose or a string of glass beads around her neck charms Queen Quashinibo. He used to pay visits to people in distress, to appear at meetings hundreds of miles off, in the red velvet gown, and to hear the people crying, Yes, my lord, and no, my lord, and to read the prodigious accounts of his lordship in the papers. It seemed as if the people and he liked to be taken in by this twopenny splendor. Twopenny magnificence, indeed, exists all over Ireland, and may be considered as the great characteristics of the snobbishness of the country. When Mrs. Mulhalligan, the grocer's lady, retires to Kingstown, she has Mulhalliganville painted over the gate of her villa, and receives you at the door that won't shut or gazes at you out of a window that is glazed with an old petticoat. Be it ever so shabby and dismal, nobody ever owns to keeping a shop. A fellow whose stock in trade is a penny roll or a tumbler of lollipops calls his cabin the American flower stores, or the depository for colonial produce, or some such name. As for inns, there are none in the country. Hotels abound as well furnished as Mulhalliganville, but again there is no such people as landlords and landladies. The landlord is out with the hounds, and my lady in the parlor talking with the captain or playing the piano. If a gentleman has a hundred a year to leave for his family, they all become gentlemen. All keep a nag, ride the hounds, and swagger about in the phoenix, and grow tufts on their chin like so many real aristocrats. A friend of mine has taken to be a painter, and lives out of Ireland, where he is considered to have disgraced the family by choosing such a profession. His father is a wine merchant, and his elder brother an apothecary. The number of men one meets in London and on the continent, who have a pretty little property of five and twenty hundred a year in Ireland is prodigious. Those who will have nine thousand a year in land when somebody dies are still more numerous. I myself have met as many descendants from Irish kings as would form a brigade. And who has not met the Irishman who apes the Englishman, and who forgets his country and tries to forget his accent, or to smother the taste of it, as it were? Come dine with me, my boy, says O'Dowd of O'Dowdston, and you'll find us all English there, which he tells you in a progress broad as from here to Kingston Beer. And did you never hear Mrs. Captain McManus talk about Ireland, and her account of her father's estate? Very few men have rubbed through the world without hearing and witnessing some of these Hibernian phenomena, these two penny splendors. And what say you to the summit of society, the castle, with a sham king and sham lords in waiting and sham loyalty, and a sham heroine Altrashid, to go about the sham disguise making believe to be affable and splendid? That castle is the pink and pride of snobbishness. A court circular is bad enough with two columns of print about a little baby that's christened but think of people liking a sham court circular i think the shams of ireland are more outrageous than those of any country a fellow shows you a hill and says that's the highest mountain in all ireland and a gentleman tells you he is descended from brian Boru and has five and thirty hundred a year or miss mcmanus describes her father's estate or old dan rises and says the irish women are the loveliest Irish men the bravest, the Irish land the most fertile in the world, and nobody believes anybody. The latter does not believe his story, nor the hearer. But they make believe to believe, and solemnly do honor to Hamburg, O oh, Ireland, my country, for I make little doubt I am descended from Brian Boru too. When will you acknowledge that two and two make four, and call a pikestaff a pikestaff? That is the very best use you can make of the latter. Irish snobs will dwindle away then, and we shall never hear tell of hereditary bondsmen. End of chapter 17, recording by Ellie, July 2009.
This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 18 of the Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 18 Party Giving Snobs. Our selection of snobs has lately been too exclusively of a political character. Give us private snobs, cry the dear ladies. I have before me the letter of one fair correspondent of the fishing village of Brighthelmstone in Sussex, and could her commands ever be disobeyed? Tell us more, dear Mr. Snob, about your experience of snobs in society. Heaven bless the dear souls! They are accustomed to the word now. The odious, vulgar, horrid, unpronounceable word slips out of their lips with the prettiest glibness possible. I should not wonder if it were used at court amongst the maids of honour. In the very best society, I know it is. And why not? Snobbishness is vulgar. The mere words are not. That which we call a snob by any other name would still be snobbish. Well, then, as the season is drawing to a close, as many hundreds of kind souls, snobbish or otherwise, have quitted London, as many hospitable carpets are taken up, and window blinds are pitilessly papered with the morning herald, and mansions, once inhabited by cheerful owners, are now consigned to the care of the housekeeper's dreary locum tenens, some mouldy old woman, who, in reply to the hopeless clanging of the bell, peers at you for a moment from the area, and then, slowly unbolting the great hall door, informs you my lady has left town, or that the family is in the country, or gone up the rent, or what not. As the season and parties are over, why not consider party-giving snobs for a while, and review the conduct of some of those individuals who have quitted the town for six months? Some of those worthy snobs are making believe to go yachting, and, dressed in telescopes and pea-jackets, are passing their time between Cherbourg and Cowes. Some living higgledy-piggledy in dismal little huts in Scotland, provisioned with canisters of portable soup, and fricando, hermetically sealed in tin, are passing their days slaughtering grouse upon the moors. Some are dozing and bathing away the effects of the season at Kissingen, or watching the ingenious game of trente et quarante at Homburg and Ems. We can afford to be very bitter upon them now they are all gone. Now there are no more parties. Let us have at the party-giving snobs. The dinner-giving, the ball-giving, the dejeuner-giving, the conversazione-giving snobs. Lord, Lord, what havoc might have been made amongst them had we attacked them during the plethora of the season. I should have been obliged to have a guard to defend me from fiddlers and pastry-cooks, indignant at the abuse of their patrons. Already I am told that, from some flippant and unguarded expressions considered derogatory to Baker Street and Harley Street, rents have fallen in these respectable quarters, and orders have been issued that at least Mr. Snob shall be asked to parties there no more. Well, then now they are all away let us frisk at our ease and have it everything like the bull in the china shop they may not hear of what is going on in their absence and if they do they can't bear malice for six months we will begin to make it up with them about next february and let next year take care of itself we shall have no dinners from the dinner-giving snobs no more from the ball-givers no more conversaciones thank musy as james says from the conversationes snob and what is to prevent us from telling the truth the snobbishness of conversationes snobs is very soon disposed of as soon as that cup of washy bohe is handed to you in the tea-room or the muddy remnant of ice that you grasp in the suffocating scuffle of the assembly upstairs good heavens what do people mean by going there what is done there that everybody throngs into those three little rooms? 
was the black hole considered to be an agreeable reunion that britons in the dog days years seek to imitate it after being rammed to a jelly in a doorway where you feel your feet going through lady barbara macbeth's lace flounces and get a look from that haggard and painted old harpy compared to which the gaze of ugolino is quite cheerful after withdrawing your elbow out of poor gasping bob guttleton's white waistcoat from which cushion it was impossible to remove it though you knew you were squeezing poor bob into an apoplexy you find yourself at last in the reception room and try to catch the eye of mrs bottibol the conversazione giver when you catch her eye you are expected to grin and she smiles too for the four hundredth time that night and if she's very glad to see you waggles her little hand before her face as if to blow you a kiss as the phrase is why the deuce should mrs bottibol blow me a kiss i wouldn't kiss her for the world why do i grin when i see her as if i was delighted am i i don't care a straw for mrs bottibol i know what she thinks about me i know what she said about my last volume of poems i had it from a dear mutual friend why i say in a word are we going on ogling and telegraphing each other in this insane way because we are both performing the ceremonies demanded by the great snob society whose dictates we all of us obey well the recognition is over my jaws have returned to their usual english expression of subdued agony and intense gloom and the body ball is grinning and kissing her fingers to somebody else who is squeezing through the aperture by which we have just entered it is lady anne clutterbuck who has her friday evenings as botty ball botty we call her has wednesdays that is miss clementina clutterbuck the cadaverous young woman in green with florid auburn hair who has published her volume of poems the death shriek damien's the faggot of joan of arc and translations from the german of course the conversazione women salute each other calling each other my dear lady anne and my dear good eliza and hating each other as women hate who give parties on wednesdays and fridays with inexpressible pain dear good eliza sees anne go up and coax and wheedle abagosh who has just arrived from syria and beg him to patronize her fridays all this while amidst the crowd and the scuffle and a perpetual buzz and chatter and the flare of the wax candles and an intolerable smell of musk what the poor snobs who write fashionable romances call the gleam of gems the odor of perfumes the blaze of countless lamps a scrubby looking yellow-faced foreigner with cleaned gloves is warbling inaudibly in a corner to the accompaniment of another the great cacafogo mrs bottibol whispers as she passes you by a great creature thump and strump is at the instrument the hetman platoff's pianist you know to hear this cacafogo and thump and strump a hundred people are gathered together a bevy of dowagers stout or scraggy a faint sprinkling of misses six moody-looking lords perfectly meek and solemn wonderful foreign counts with bushy whiskers and yellow faces and a great deal of dubious jewelry young dandies with slim waists and open necks and self-satisfied simpers and flowers in their buttons the old stiff stout bald-headed conversazione on rue whom you meet everywhere who never miss a night of this delicious enjoyment the three last caught lions of the season higgs the traveller biggs the novelist and toffy who has come out so on the sugar question captain flash who is invited on account of his pretty wife and lord ogleby who goes wherever she goes Cuscajeux. who are the owners of all those showy scarfs and white neckcloths ask little tom prig who is there in all his glory knows everybody has a story about every one and as he trips home to his lodgings in german street with his gibus hat and his little glazed pumps thinks he's the fashionablest young fellow in town 
and that he really has passed a night of exquisite enjoyment you go up with your usual easy elegance of manner and talk to miss smith in a corner oh mr snob i'm afraid you're sadly satirical that's all she says if you say it's fine weather she bursts out laughing or hint that it's very hot she vows you are the drollest wretch meanwhile mrs bottibol is simpering on fresh arrivals the individual at the door is roaring out their names poor cacafogo is quavering away in the music-room under the impression that he will be lance in the world by singing inaudibly here and what a blessing it is to squeeze out of the door and into the street where a half hundred of carriages are in waiting and where the link-boy with that unnecessary lantern of his pounces upon all who issue out and will insist upon getting your noble honour's lordship's cab and to think that there are people who after having been to bottibol on wednesday will go to clutterbuck on friday End of chapter eighteen This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 19 of the Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Eads. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 19 Dining Out Snobs. In England, dinner-giving snobs occupy a very important place in society, and the task of describing them is tremendous. There was a time in my life when the consciousness of having eaten a man's salt rendered me dumb regarding his demerits, and I thought it a wicked act and a breach of hospitality to speak ill of him. But why should a saddle of mutton blind you, or a turbet and lobster sauce shut your mouth for ever? With advancing age, men see their duties more clearly. I am not to be hoodwinked any longer by a slice of venison, be it ever so fat, and as for being dumb on account of turbet and lobster sauce, of course I am. Good manners ordain that I should be so, until I have swallowed the compound, but not afterwards. Directly the victuals are discussed, and John takes away the plate, my tongue begins to wag. Does not yours, if you have a pleasant neighbor? A lovely creature, say, of some five and thirty whose daughters have not yet quite come out. They are the best talkers. As for your young misses, they are only put about the table to look at, like the flowers in the centerpiece. Their blushing youth and natural modesty preclude them from easy, confidential, conversational abandon which forms the delight of the intercourse with their dear mothers. It is to these, if he would prosper in his profession, that the dining-out snob should address himself. Suppose you sit next to one of these, how pleasant it is, in the intervals of the banquet, actually to abuse the victuals and the giver of the entertainment. It's twice as piquant to make fun of a man under his very nose. What is a dinner-giving snob, some innocent youth, who is not rep and due in the world may ask, or some simple reader who has not the benefits of London experience? My dear sir, I will show you. Not all, for that is impossible but several kinds of dinner-giving snobs. For instance, suppose you, in the middle rank of life, accustomed to mutton, roast on Tuesday, cold on Wednesday, hashed on Thursday, etc., with small means and a small establishment, choose to waste the former, and set the latter topsy-turvy by giving entertainments unnaturally costly. You come into the dinner-giving snob class at once. Suppose you get in cheap-made dishes from the pastry cooks and hire a couple of green grocers, or carpet-beaters, to figure as footmen, dismissing honest Molly, who waits on common days, and bedezzening your table, ordinarily ornamented with willow-pattern crockery, with two-penny, half-penny Birmingham plate. Suppose you pretend to be richer and grander than you ought to be. You are a dinner-giving snob, and, oh, I tremble to think how many and many a one will read this. A man who entertains in this way, and, alas, how few do not, is like a fellow who would borrow his neighbor's coat to make a show in, or a lady who flaunts in the diamonds from next door. A humbug, in a word, and amongst the snobs he must be set down. 
a man who goes out of his natural sphere of society to ask lords generals aldermen and other persons of fashion but is niggardly of his hospitality towards his own equals is a dinner-giving snob my dear friend jack tuffunt for example knows one lord whom he met at a watering place old lord mumble who is as toothless as a three months old baby and as mum as an undertaker and as dull as well we will not particularize tuftunt never has a dinner now but you see this solemn old toothless patrician at the right hand of mrs tuftunt tuftunt is a dinner-giving snob old livermore old soy old chutney the east indian director old cutler the surgeon etc that society of old fogies in fine who give each other dinners round and round and dine for the mere purpose of guttling these again are dinner-giving snobs again my friend lady mcscrew who has three grenadier flunkies in lace round the table and serves up a scrag of mutton on silver and dribbles you out bad sherry and port by thimblefuls is a dinner-giving snob of the other sort and i confess for my part i would rather dine with old livermore or old soy than with her ladyship stinginess is snobbish ostentation is snobbish too great profusion is snobbish tuft hunting is snobbish but i own there are many people more snobbish than all those whose defects are above mentioned viz those individuals who can and don't give dinners at all the man without hospitality shall never sit sub is dem trabibus with me let the sordid wretch go mumble his bone alone what again is true hospitality alas my dear friends and brother snobs how little do we meet of it after all are the motives pure which induce your friends to ask you to dinner this has often come across me does your entertainer want something from you for instance i am not of a suspicious turn but it is a fact that when hookey is bringing out a new work he asks the critics all round to dinner that when walker has got his picture ready for the exhibition he somehow grows exceedingly hospitable and has his friends of the press to a quiet cutlet and a glass of celery old hunks the miser who died lately leaving his money to his housekeeper lived many years on the fat of the land by simply taking down at all his friends the names and christian names of all the children but though you may have your own opinion about the hospitality of your acquaintances and though men who ask you from sordid motives are most decidedly dinner-giving snobs it is best not to inquire into their motives too keenly be not too curious about the mouth of a gift horse after all a man does not intend to insult you by asking you to dinner though for that matter i know some characters about town who actually consider themselves injured and insulted if the dinner or the company is not to their liking there is guttleton who dines at home off a shilling's worth of beef from the cook shop but if he is asked to dine at a house where there are not peas at the end of may or cucumbers in march along with turbet thinks himself insulted by being invited good ged he says what the deuce do the forkers mean by asking me to a family dinner i can get mutton at home or what infernal impertinence it is of the spooners to get entrees from the pastry cooks and fancy that i am to be deceived with their stories about their french cook then again there is jack puddington i saw that honest fellow to other day quite in a rage because as chance would have it sir john carver asked him to meet the very same party he had met at colonel cramley's the day before and he had not got up a new set of stories to entertain them poor dinner-giving snobs you don't know what small thanks you get for all your pains and money how we dining out snobs sneer at your cookery and pooh-pooh your old hock and are incredulous about your four and six penny champagne and know that the side dishes of to-day are rechauffes from the dinner of yesterday and mark how certain dishes are whisked off the table untested so that they may figure at the banquet to-morrow whenever for my part i see the head man particularly anxious to escomoteur the fricando or a blanc mange i always call out and insist upon massacring it with a spoon all this sort of conduct makes one popular with the dinner-giving snob one friend of mine i know has made a prodigious sensation in good society by announcing apropos of certain dishes when offered to him that he never eats aspect except at lord titup's and that lady jimmy's chef is the only man in london who knows how to dress filet and serpentin or supreme de voler aux troffes
This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 20 of The Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Stearns. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 20. Dinner Giving Snobs Further Considered. If my friends would but follow the present prevailing fashion, I think they ought to give me a testimonial for the paper on Dinner Giving Snobs, which I am now writing. What do you say now to a handsome comfortable dinner service of plate, not including plates, for I hold silver plates to be sheer wantonness, and would almost as soon think of silver teacups. A couple of neat teapots, a coffee pot, trays, etc., with a little inscription to my wife, Mrs. Snob, and a half score of silver tankards for the little snoblings, to glitter on the homely table where they partake of the quotidian mutton. If I had my way, and my plans could be carried out, dinner giving would increase as much on the one hand as dinner giving snobbishness would diminish. To my mind, the most amiable part of the work lately published by my esteemed friend, if upon a very brief acquaintance he will allow me to call him so, Alexis Soyer, the regenerator, what he, in his noble style, would call the most succulent, savoury, and elegant passages, are those which relate not to the grand banquets and ceremonial dinners, but to his dinners at home. The dinner at home ought to be the centre of the whole system of dinner giving. Your usual style of meal, that is, plenteous, comfortable, and in its perfection, should be that to which you welcome your friends, as it is that of which you partake yourself. For, towards what woman in the world do I entertain a higher regard than towards the beloved partner of my existence, Mrs. Snob, who should have a greater place in my affections than her six brothers, three or four of whom we are pretty sure will favour us with their company at seven o'clock, or her angelic mother, my own valued mother-in-law, for whom, finally, would I wish to cater more generously than for your very humble servant, the present writer. Now, nobody supposes that the Birmingham plate is had out. The disguised carpet-beaters, introduced to the exclusion of the neat parlour-maid, the miserable entrees from the pastry-cooks ordered in, and the children packed off, as it is supposed, to the nursery, but really only to the staircase, down which they slide during the dinner-time, waylaying the dishes as they come out, and fingering the round bumps on the jellies, and the forced meat-balls in the soup. Nobody, I say, supposes that a dinner at home is characterized by the horrible ceremony, the foolish makeshifts, the mean pomp and ostentation which distinguish our banquets on grand field-days. Such a notion is monstrous. I would as soon think of having my dearest Bessie sitting opposite me in her turban and bird of paradise, and showing her jolly mottled arms, out of blonde sleeves, in her famous red satin gown, I, or of having Mr. Toole every day in a white waistcoat, at my back shouting, Silence, thaw, the chair. Now, if this be the case, if the bermudgeon plate pomp and the processions of disguised footmen are odious and foolish in everyday life, why not always? Why should Jones and I, who are in the middle rank, alter the modes of our being, to assume an eclat which does not belong to us, to entertain our friends, who, if we are worth anything and honest fellows at bottom, are men of middle rank too, who are not in the least deceived by our temporary splendour, and who play off exactly the same absurd trick upon us when they ask us to dine. If it be pleasant to dine with your friends, as all persons with good stomachs and kindly hearts will, I presume, allow it to be, it is better to dine twice than to dine once. It is impossible for men of small means to be continually spending five and twenty or thirty shillings on each friend who sits down to their table. People dine for less. I myself have seen, at my favourite club, the senior United Service, His Grace the Duke of Wellington, quite contented with the joint, one and three, and half pint of sherry, nine, and if His Grace, why not you and I? This rule I have made, and found the benefit of. 
Whenever I ask a couple of dukes and a marquis or so to dine with me, I sit them down to a piece of beef or a leg of mutton and trimmings. The grandees thank you for this simplicity, and appreciate the same. My dear Jones, ask any of those whom you have the honour of knowing, if such be not the case. I am far from wishing that their graces should treat me in a similar fashion. Splendour is a part of their station, as decent comfort, let us trust, of yours and mine. Fate has comfortably appointed gold plate for some, and has bidden others contentedly to wear the willow pattern, and being perfectly contented, indeed humbly thankful, for look around, O Jones, and see the myriads who are not so fortunate. To wear honest linen, while magnificos of the world are adorned with cambric and point lace, surely we ought to hold as miserable and envious fools those wretched bow tibs of society who sport a lace dicky and nothing besides the poor silly jays who trail a peacock's feather behind them and think to simulate the gorgeous bird whose nature it is to strut on palace terraces and to flaunt his magnificent fantail in the sunshine the jays with peacock's feathers are the snobs of this world and never since the days of aesop were they more numerous in any land than they are at present in this free country how does this most ancient apologue apply to the subject in hand the dinner-giving snob the imitation of the great is universal in this city from the palaces of kensingtonia and belgravia even to the remotest corner of brunswick square peacock's feathers are stuck in the tails of most families scarce one of us domestic birds but imitates the lanky pavonine strut and shrill genteel scream oh you misguided dinner-giving snobs think how much pleasure you lose and how much mischief you do with your absurd grandeurs and hypocrisies you stuff each other with unnatural forced meats and entertain each other to the ruin of friendship let alone health and the destruction of hospitality and good fellowship you who but for the peacock's tail might chatter away so much at your ease and be so jovial and happy when a man goes into a great set company of dinner-giving and dinner-receiving snobs, if he has a philosophical turn of mind, he will consider what a huge humbug the whole affair is. The dishes, and the drink, and the servants, and the plate, and the host and hostess, and the conversation, and the company, the philosopher included. The host is smiling, and hobnobbing, and talking up and down the table, but a prey to secret terrors and anxieties lest the wines he has brought up from the cellar should prove insufficient, lest a corked bottle should destroy his calculations, or our friend the carpet-beater, by making some bee-view, should disclose his real quality of greengrocer, and show that he is not the family butler. The hostess is smiling resolutely through all the courses, smiling through her agony, though her heart is in the kitchen, and she is speculating with terror, lest there be any disaster there, if the souffle should collapse, or if Wiggins does not send the ices in time, she feels as if she would commit suicide, that smiling, jolly woman. The children upstairs are yelling, as their maid is crimping their miserable ringlets with hot tongs, tearing Miss Emily's hair out by the roots, or scrubbing Miss Polly's dumpy nose with mottled soap, till the little wretch screams herself into fits. The young males of the family are employed, as we have stated, in piratical exploits upon the landing-place. The servants are not servants, but the before-mentioned retail tradesmen. The plate is not plate, but a mere shiny Birmingham lacquer, and so is the hospitality, and everything else. The talk is Birmingham talk, the wag of the party, with bitterness in his heart, having just quitted his laundress, who is dunning him for her bill, is firing off good stories, and the opposition wag is furious that he cannot get in innings. Jockins, the great conversationalist, is scornful and indignant with the pair of them, because he is kept out of court. Young Muscadel, that cheap dandy, is talking fashion and omics out of the morning post, and disgusting his neighbour, Mrs. Fox, who reflects that she has never been there. The widow is vexed out of patience, because her daughter Maria has got a place beside young Cambric, the penniless curate, and not by Colonel Goldmore, the rich widower from India. The doctor's wife is sulky, because she has not been let out before the barrister's lady. Old Dr. Cork is grumbling at the wine, and Guttleton sneering at the cookery. And to think that all these people 
might be so happy and easy and friendly were they brought together in a natural unpretentious way and but for an unhappy passion for peacock's feathers in england gentle shades of marat and robespierre when i see how all the honesty of society is corrupted among us by the miserable fashion worship i feel as angry as mrs fox just mentioned and ready to order a general bateau of peacocks end of chapter twenty recording by jennifer stearns this audiobook is brought to you by full audiobooks please like subscribe and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks chapter twenty one of the book of snobs this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie von Mollichem. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 21. Some Continental Snobs. Now that September has come, and all our parliamentary duties are over, perhaps no class of snobs are in such high feather as the continental snobs. I watch these daily, as they commence their migrations from the beach at Folkestone. I see shores of them depart, not perhaps without an innate longing, too, to quit the island along with those happy snobs. Farewell, dear friends, I say, you little know that the individual who regards you from the beach is your friend and historiographer and brother. I went to-day to see our excellent friend Snokes, on board the Queen of the French. Many scores of snobs were there on the deck of that fine ship, marching forth in their pride and bravery. They will be at Ostend in four hours. They will inundate the continent next week. They will carry into far lands the famous image of the British snob. I shall not see them, but am with them in spirit, and indeed, there is hardly country in the known and civilized world in which these eyes have not beheld them. I have seen snobs in pink coats and hunting boots scouring over the Campania of Rome, and have heard the roads and their well-known slang in the galleries of the Vatican and under the shadowy arches of the Colosseum. I have met a snob on a dromedary in the desert and picnicking under the pyramid of Cheops. I like to think how many gallant British snobs there are, at this minute of writing, pushing their head out of every window in the courtyard of Maurice's in the Rue de Rivoli, or roaring out, Garçon du Pang, Garçon du Veng, or swaggering down the Toledo at Naples, or even how many will be on the lookout for snooks on Ostend Pier, for snooks and the rest of the snobs on board the Queen of the French. Look at the Marquis of Carabas and his two carriages. My Lady Marchioness comes on board, looks round with that happy air of mingled terror and impertinence which distinguishes her ladyship, and rushes to her carriage, for it is impossible that she should mingle with the other snobs on deck. There she sits, and will be ill in private. The strawberry leaves on her chariot panels are engraved on her ladyship's heart, if she were going to heaven instead of to Ostend, I rather think she would expect to have the place réservé for her, and would send to order the best rooms. A courier with his money bag of office round his shoulders, a huge scowling footman, whose dark pepper and salt livery glistens with the heraldic insignia of the carabasses, a brazen-looking tawdry French femme de chambre, None but a female pen can do justice to that wonderful tawdry toilette of the lady's maid en voyage, and the miserable dame de compagnie, are ministering to the wants of her ladyship and her king's Charles spaniel. They are rushing to and fro with the haute cologne, pocket handkerchiefs, which are all fringe and cipher, and popping mysterious cushions behind and before, and in every available corner of the carriage. The little Marquis, her husband, is walking about the deck in a bewildered manner, with a lean daughter on each arm, and the carroty tuft hope of the family is already smoking on the foredeck in a travelling costume checked all over, and in little lacquer tip pot jean boots, and a shirt embroidered with pink bow constrictors. What is it? 
that gives travelling snobs such marvellous propensity to rush into costume. Why should a man not travel in a coat, etc., but think proper to dress himself like a harlequin in mourning? See, even young Aldermanbury, the tallow merchant, who has just stepped on board, has got a travelling dress gaping all over with pockets. And little Tom Tapeworm, the lawyer's clerk out of the city, who has but three weeks' leave, turns out in gaiters and a brand-new shooting jacket, and must let the moustaches grow on his little sniffy upper lip for sooth. Pompey Higgs is giving elaborate directions to his servant, and asking loudly, "'Davis, where's the dressing-case?' and, "'Davis, you'd best take the pistol-case into the cabin.' Little Pompey travels with the dressing-case, and without a beard. Whom is going to shoot with his pistols? Who on earth can tell? And what is to do with the servant but wait upon him? I am at a loss to conjecture. Look at honest Nathan Houndstitch and his lady and their little son. What a noble air of blazing contentment illuminates the features of those snobs of eastern race! What a toilet Houndstitch's is! What rings and chains, what gold-headed canes and diamonds! What a tooth the rogue has got to his chin! The rogue! He will never spare himself any cheap enjoyment. Little Houndstitch has a little cane with a gilt head and little mosaic ornaments, altogether an extra air. As for the lady, she has all the colours of the rainbow. She has a pink parasol with a white lining and a yellow bonnet and an emerald green shawl and a shot silk pelisse and drab boots and rhubarb coloured gloves and party coloured glass buttons expanding from the size of a four-penny piece to a crown, glitter and twiddle all down the front of a gorgeous costume. I have said before, I like to look at the peoples on their gala days. They are so picturesquely and outrageously splendid and happy. Yonder comes Captain Bull, spick and span, tied and trim, who travels for four or six months every year of his life who does not commit himself by luxury of raiment or insolence of demeanour, but I think is as great a snob as any man on board. Bull passes the season in London, sponging for dinners and sleeping in a garret near his club. Abroad he has been everywhere. He knows the best wine at every inn in every capital in Europe, lives with the best English company there, has seen every palace and picture gallery from Madrid to Stockholm, speaks an abominable little jargon of half a dozen languages, and knows nothing, nothing. Bull hunts tufts on the continent, and is a sort of amateur courier. He will scrape acquaintance with all carabas before they make Ostend, and will remind his lordship that he met him at Vienna twenty years ago, or gave him a glass of schnapps up the Rigi. We have said Bull knows nothing. He knows the birth, arms, and pedigree of all the peerage, has poked his little eyes into every one of the carriages on board, their panels noted and their crest surveyed. He knows all the continental stories of English scandal, how Count of Roski ran off with Miss Bax at Naples, how very sick Lady Smixmack was with young Cornichon of the French legation at Florence, the exact amount which Jack Duse is one of Bob Greengoose at Baden, what it is that made the stag settle on the continent, the sum for which the Orgogety estates are mortgaged, etc. If he can't catch a lord, he will hook on to a baronet, or else the odd wretch will catch hold of some beardless young stripling of fashion, and show him life in various and amiable and inaccessible quarters. Fah! the odd brood! If he has every one of the vices of the most boisterous youth, at least he is comforted by having no conscience. He is utterly stupid, but of a jovial turn. He believes himself to be quite a respectable member of society, but perhaps the only good action he ever did in his life is the involuntary one of giving an example to be avoided, and showing, and showing what an odious thing in the social picture is that figure of the debauched old man who passes through life rather a decorous Salinas, and dies some day in his garret, alone, unrepenting and unnoted, save by his astonished heirs, who find that the dissolute old miser has left money behind him. See, he is up to old Carabas already. I told you he would. 
Yonder you see the old lady Mary McScrew, and those middle-aged young women, her daughters. They are going to Cheapen and Hegel in Belgium, and up the Rhine, until they meet with a boarding-house, where they can live upon less board wages than her ladyship's pays a footman. But she will exact and receive considerable respect from the British snobs, located in the watering-place which she selects for her summer residence, being the daughter of the Earl of Hagerstown. That broad-shouldered book, with the great whiskers and the cleaned white kid-gloves, is Mr. Fellum Clancy of Paul Doody's town. He calls himself Mr. de Clancy. He endeavours to disguise his native brogue with the richest superposition of English, and if you play at billiards or a cart with him, the chances are that you will win the first game, and he the seven or eight games ensuing. That overgrown lady with the four daughters, and the young dandy from the university, her son, is Mrs. Cousy, the eminent barrister's lady, who would rather die than not be in the fashion. She has a peerage in a carpet-back, you may be sure, but she is altogether cut out by Mrs. Quad, the attorney's wife, whose carriage, with the apparatus of rumbles, dickies, and imperials, scarcely yields in splendour to the Marquis of Carabas's own travelling chariot, and his courier has even bigger whiskers and a larger Morocco money-bag than the Marquise's own travelling gentleman. Remark her well. She is talking to Mr. Spout, the new member for Jabra, who is going out to inspect the operations of the Tolverine, and he'll put some very severe questions to Lord Palmerston next session upon England and her relations with the Prussian blue trade, the naval soap trade, the German tinder trade, etc., Spout will patronize King Leopold at Brussels, will write letters from abroad to the Jarborough Independent, and in his quality of member du Parliament Britannique, will expect to be invited to a family dinner with every sovereign whose dominions he honors with a visit during his tour. The next person is, but hark, the bell for sure is ringing, and shaking Snook's hand cordially, we rush on to the pier, waving him a farewell as a noble black ship cuts keenly through the sunny azure waters, bearing away that cargo of snobs outward bound. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 22 of the Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 22 Continental Snobbery Continued. We are accustomed to laugh at the French for their braggadocio propensities and intolerable vanity about la France, la gloire, l'empereur, and the like, and yet I think in my heart that the British snob, for conceit and self-sufficiency and braggartism in his way, is without a parallel. There is always something uneasy in a Frenchman's conceit. He brags with so much fury, shrieking, and gesticulation yells out so loudly that the Francais is at the head of civilization, the centre of thought, etc., that one can't but see the poor fellow has a lurking doubt in his own mind that he is not the wonder he professes to be. About the British snob, on the contrary, there is commonly no noise, no bluster, but the calmness of profound conviction. We are better than all the world. We don't question the opinion at all. It's an axiom. And when a Frenchman bellows out, La France, monsieur, la France est à la tête du monde civilisé, we laugh good-naturedly at the frantic poor devil. We are the first chop of the world. We know the fact so well in our secret hearts that a claim set up elsewhere is simply ludicrous. My dear brother reader, say, as a man of honor, if you are not of this opinion, do you think a Frenchman your equal? You don't, you gallant British snob. You know you don't. No more, perhaps, does a snob your humble servant, brother. And I am inclined to think it is this conviction, and the consequent bearing of the Englishman towards the foreigner whom he condescends to visit, this confidence of superiority which holds up the head of the owner of every English hat-box from Sicily to St. Petersburg, that makes us so magnificently hated throughout Europe as we are. 
This, more than all our little victories, and of which many Frenchmen and Spaniards have never heard, this amazing and indomitable insular pride, which animates my lord in his travelling carriage, as well as John in the rumble. If you read the old chronicles of the French wars, you find precisely the same character of the Englishman, and Henry V's people behaved with just the cool domineering manner of our gallant veterans of France and the peninsula. Did you never hear Colonel Cutler and Major Slasher talking over the war after dinner? Or Captain Border describing his action with the indomptable? Hang the fellows, says Border. Their practice was very good. I was beat off three times before I took her. Cuss those carabineers of Milhoad, says Slasher. What work they made of our light cavalry, implying a sort of surprise that the Frenchmen should stand up against Britons at all, a good-natured wonder that the blind, mad, vainglorious, brave, poor devils should actually have the courage to resist an Englishman. Legions of such Englishmen are patronizing Europe at this moment, being kind to the Pope, or good-natured to the King of Holland, or condescending to inspect the Prussian reviews. When Nicholas came here, who reviews a quarter of a million pairs of mustaches to his breakfast every morning, we took him off to Windsor and showed him two whole regiments of six or eight hundred Britons apiece, with an air as much as to say, There, my boy, look at that. Those are Englishmen, those are, and your master whenever you please, as the nursery song says. The British snob is long, long past skepticism, and can afford to laugh quite good-humouredly at those conceited Yankees, or besotted little Frenchmen, who set up as models of mankind. They, forsooth! I have been led into these remarks by listening to an old fellow at the Hotel du Nord in Boulogne, and who is evidently of the slasher sort. He came down and seated himself at the breakfast table, with a surly scowl on his salmon-colored bloodshot face, strangling in a tight, cross-barred cravat his linen and his appointment so perfectly stiff and spotless that everybody at once recognized him as a dear countryman. Only our port wine and other admirable institutions could have produced a figure so insolent, so stupid, so gentlemanlike. After a while our attention was called to him by his roaring out, in a voice of plethoric fury, Oh! Everybody turned round at the O, oh, conceiving the colonel to be, as his countenance denoted him, in intense pain. But the waiters knew better, and instead of being alarmed, brought the colonel the kettle. Oh, it appears, is the French for hot water. The colonel, though he despises it heartily, thinks he speaks the language remarkably well. Whilst he was in hosting his smoking tea, which went rolling and gurgling down his throat, and hissing over the hot coppers of that respectable veteran, a friend joined him, with a wizened face and very black wig, evidently a colonel, too. The two warriors, waggling their old heads at each other, presently joined breakfast, and fell into conversation, and we had the advantage of hearing about the old war, and some pleasant conjectures as to the next, which they considered imminent. They pshawed the French fleet. They pooh-poohed the French commercial marine. They showed how, in a war, there would be a cordon, a cordon, by blank, of steamers along our coast, and by blank, ready at a minute to land anywhere on the other shore, to give the French as good a thrashing as they got in the last war, by blank. In fact, a rumbling cannonade of oaths was fired by the two veterans during the whole of their conversation. There was a Frenchman in the room, but as he had not been above ten years in London, of course he did not speak the language and lost the benefit of the conversation. But, oh, my country, said I to myself, it's no wonder that you are so beloved. If I were a Frenchman, how I would hate you. That brutal, ignorant, peevish bully of an Englishman is showing himself in every city of Europe. One of the dullest creatures under heaven, he goes traveling Europe under foot, shouldering his way into galleries and cathedrals, and bustling into palaces with his buck-ram uniform. At church or theater, gala or picture gallery, his face never varies. A thousand delightful sights pass before his bloodshot eyes, and don't affect him. Countless brilliant scenes of life and manners are shown him, but never move him. 
he goes to church and calls the practices there degrading and superstitious as if his altar was the only one that was acceptable he goes to picture galleries and is more ignorant about art than a french shoeblack art nature pass and there is no dot of admiration in his stupid eyes nothing moves him except when a very great man comes his way and then the rigid proud self-confident inflexible british snob can be as humble as a flunkey and as supple as a harlequin end of chapter twenty two This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 23 of the Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Eads. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 23. English Snobs on the Continent. What is the use of Lord Rome's telescope? My friend Pen Whiskey exclaimed the other day. It only enables you to see a few hundred thousands of miles farther. What were thought to be mere nebula turn out to be the most perceivable starry systems, and beyond these you see other nebula, which a more powerful glass will show to be stars again. And so they go on glittering and winking away into eternity with which my friend Pan, heaving a great sigh, as if confessing his inability to look infinity in the face, sank back resigned, and swallowed a large bumper of claret. I, who like other great men have but one idea, thought to myself that as the stars are, so are the snobs. The more you gaze upon these luminaries, the more you behold, now nebulously congregated, now faintly distinguishable, now brightly defined, until they twinkle off in endless blazes, and fade into the immeasurable darkness. I am but as a child playing on the seashore. Some telescope philosopher will arise one day, some great snobonomer, to find the laws of the great science which we are now merely playing with, and to define and settle and classify that which is at present but vague theory, and loose some elegant assertion. Yes, a single eye can but trace a very few and simple varieties of the enormous universe of snobs. I sometimes think of appealing to the public, and calling together a congress of savants, such as met at Southampton, each to bring his contributions and read his paper on the great subject. For what can a single poor few do, even with the subject at present in hand? English snobs on the continent, though they are a hundred thousand times less numerous than on their native island, yet even these few are too many. One can only fix a stray one here and there. The individuals are caught, the thousands escape. I have noted down but three whom I have met with in my walk this morning through this pleasant marine city of Boulogne. There is the English raft snob that frequents estaminets and cabarets, who is heard yelling, We won't go home till morning, and startling the midnight echoes of quiet continental towns with shrieks of English slang. The boozy, unshorn wretch is seen hovering round quays as packets arrive and tippling drains in inn bars where he gets credit. He talks French with slang familiarity. He and his like quite people the debt prisons on the continent. He plays pool at the billiard houses, and may be seen engaged at cards and dominoes of forenoons. His signature is to be seen on countless bills of exchange. It belonged to an honorable family once, very likely. For the English raff most probably began by being a gentleman, and has a father over the water who is ashamed to hear his name. He has cheated the old governor repeatedly in better days, and swindled his sisters of their portions, and robbed his younger brothers. Now he is living on his wife's jointure. She is hidden away in some dismal garret, patching shabby finery, and cobbling up old clothes for her children, the most miserable and slanternly of women. Or sometimes the poor woman and her daughters go about timidly, giving lessons in English and music, or do embroidery and work underhand, to purchase the means for the pot of few. While Raff is swaggering on the quay, or tossing off glasses of cognac at the café, the unfortunate creature has a child still every year, and her constant hypocrisy is to try and make her girls believe that their father is a respectable man, 
and to huddle him out of the way when the brute comes home drunk. Those poor ruined souls get together and have a society of their own, the which it is very affecting to watch, those tawdry pretenses at genality, these flimsy attempts at gaiety, those woeful sallies, that jingling old piano. Oh, it makes the heart sick to see and hear them. As Mrs. Raff, with her company of pale daughters, gives a penny tea to Mrs. Diddler, they talk about bygone times and the fine society they kept, and they sing feeble songs out of tattered old music books, and while engaged in this sort of entertainment, in comes Captain Raff with his greasy hat on one side, and straight away the whole of the dismal room reeks with a mingled odor of smoke and spirits. Has not everybody who has lived abroad met Captain Raff? His name is proclaimed every now and then by Mr. Sheriff's Officer Hemp, and about Boulogne and Paris and Brussels there are so many of his sort that I will lay a wager that I shall be accused of gross personality for showing him up. Many a less irreclaimable villain is transported, many a more honorable man is at present at the treadmill, and although we are the noblest, greatest, most religious, and most moral people in the world, I would still like to know where, except in the United Kingdom, debts are a matter of joke, and making tradesmen suffer a sport that gentlemen own to. It is dishonorable to owe money in France. You never hear people in other parts of Europe brag of their swindling or see a prison in a large continental town which is not more or less peopled with English rogues. A still more loathsome and dangerous snob than the above transparent and passive scamp is frequent on the continent of Europe, and my young snob friends who are travelling thither should be especially warned against him. Captain Legg is a gentleman, like Raff, though perhaps of a better degree. He has robbed his family too, but of a great deal more, and has boldly dishonored bills for thousands, where Raff has been boggling over the clumsy conveyance of a ten-pound note. Leg is always at the best inn, with the finest waistcoats and mustaches, or tearing about in the flashest of britzkas, while poor Raff is tipsifying himself with spirits and smoking cheap tobacco. It is amazing to think that Leg, so often shown up and known everywhere, is flourishing yet. He would sink into utter ruin, but for the constant and ardent love of gentility that distinguishes the English snob. There is many a young fellow of the middle classes who must know Leg to be a rogue and a cheat, and yet from his desire to be in the fashion and his admiration of tip-top swells, and from his ambition to air himself by the side of a lord's son, will let Leg make an income out of him, content to pay so long as he can enjoy that society. Many a worthy father of a family, when he hears that his son is riding about with Captain Legg, Lord Levant's son, is rather pleased that young hopeful should be in such good company. Legg and his friend, Major Macer, make professional tours through Europe, and are to be found at the right places at the right time. Last year I heard how my young acquaintance, Mr. Muff, from Oxford, going to see a little life at a carnival ball at Paris, was accosted by an Englishman, who did not know a word of the d blank language, and hearing Muff speak it so admirably, begged him to interpret to a waiter with whom there was a dispute about refreshments. It was quite a comfort, the stranger said, to see an honest English face, and did Muff know where there was a good place for supper? So those two went to supper, and who should come in, of all men in the world, but Major Macer? And so Leg introduced Macer, and so there came on a little intimacy, and three card loo etc., etc. Year after year, scores of muffs, in various places in the world, are victimized by Leg and Macer. The story is so stale, the trick of seduction so entirely old and clumsy, that it is only a wonder people can be taken in any more. But the temptations of vice and gentility together are too much for young English snobs, and those simple young victims are caught fresh every day. Though it is only to be kicked and cheated by men of fashion, your true British snob will present himself for the honor. I need not allude here to the very common British snob, who makes desperate efforts at becoming intimate with the great continental aristocracy, such as old Rolls, the baker, who has set up his quarters in the Faubourg St. Germain, and will receive none but Carlis, and no French gentleman under the rank of a marquis. We can all of us laugh at that fellow's pretensions well enough, we who tremble before a great man of our own nation. But as you say, my brave and honest John Bull of a snob, a French marquis of twenty descents, is very different from an English peer. 
and a pack of beggarly german and italian furstein and principe awaken the scorn of an honest-minded briton but our aristocracy that's a very different matter they are the real leaders of the world the real old original and no mistake nobility off with your cap snob down on your knees snob and truckle end of chapter 23「ファイブスタンダード・フォー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・ユー・
quiet and unpretending. I like everything quiet. You've not brought your valet with you? Stripes will arrange your dressing things. And that functionary entering at the same time proceeded to gut my portmanteau and to lay out the black kersame, the rich cut velvet Genoa waistcoat, the white choker, and other polite articles of evening costume with great gravity and dispatch. A great dinner party, thinks I to myself, seeing these preparations, and not perhaps displeased at the idea that some of the best people in the neighborhood were coming to see me. Hark, there's the first bell ringing, said Ponto, moving away and in fact a clamorous harbinger of victuals began clanging from the stable turret and announced the agreeable fact that dinner would appear in half an hour if the dinner is as grand as the dinner bell thought i faith i'm in good quarters and had leisure during the half hour's interval not only to advance my own person to the utmost polish of elegance which it is capable of receiving to admire the pedigree of the pontos hanging over the chimney and the ponto crest and arms emblazoned upon the wash-sand basin and jug, but to make a thousand reflections on the happiness of a country life, upon the innocent friendliness and ordiality of rustic intercourse, and to sigh for an opportunity of retiring like ponto to my own fields, to my own vine and fig-tree, with placens exure in my dominus, and a half-score of sweet young pledges of affection sporting round my paternal knee. Clang! At the end of thirty minutes, dinner bell number two pealed from the adjacent turret. I hastened downstairs, expecting to find a score of healthy country folk in the drawing room. There was only one person there, a tall and Roman nosed lady glistering over with bulges in deep mourning. She rose, advanced two steps, made a majestic curtsy during which all the bulges in her awful headdress began to twiddle and quiver and then said mr snob we are very happy to see you at the evergreens and heaved a great sigh this then was mrs major ponto to whom making my very best bow i replied that i was very proud to make her acquaintance as also that of so charming a place as the evergreens another sigh we are distantly related mr snob she said shaking her melancholy head poor dear lord rub-a-dub oh said i not knowing what the deuce mrs major ponto meant major ponto told me that you were the leicester shire snobs a very old family and related to lord snobbington who married laura rubadub who is a cousin of mine as was her poor dear father for whom we are mourning what a seizure only sixty-three and apoplexy quite unknown until now in our family in life we are in death mr snob does lady snobbington bear the deprivation well why really madam i-i don't know i replied more and more confused as she was speaking i heard a sort of cloop by which well-known sound i was aware that somebody was opening a bottle of wine and ponto entered in a huge white neckcloth and a rather shabby black suit my love mrs major ponto said to her husband we were talking about our cousin poor dear lord rub-a-dub his death has placed some of the first families in england in mourning does lady rub-dub keep her house on hill street do you know i didn't know but i said i believe she does at a venture and looking down to the drawing-room table i saw the inevitable abominable maniacal absurd disgusting peerage open on the table interleaved with annotations and open at the article snobbington dinner is served says stripes flinging open the door and i gave mrs major ponto my arm end of chapter twenty four this audiobook is brought to you by full audiobooks please like subscribe and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks Chapter Twenty Five of The Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Clifton. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 25. A Visit to Some Country Snobs. Of the dinner to which we now sat down, I am not going to be a severe critic. The mahogany I hold to be inviolable, but this I will say, that I prefer sherry to marsala when I can get it, and the latter was the wine of which I have no doubt I heard the cloop just before dinner. Nor was it particularly good of its kind, however. Mrs. Major Pontoff did not evidently know the difference, for she called the liqueur Armando de Lo during the whole of the repast, and drank but a half glass of it leaving the rest for the major and his guest stripes was in the livery of the ponto family although shabby but gorgeous in the extreme lots of magnificent worsted lace and livery buttons of a very notable size the honest fellow's hands i remarked were very large and black and a fine odour of the stable was wafted about the room as he moved to and fro in his ministration i should have preferred a clean maid servant but the sensations of the Londoners are too acute, perhaps, on these subjects, and a faithful John, after all, is more genteel. From the circumstance of the dinner being composed of pig's head, mock turtle soup, of pig's fry and roast ribs of pork, I am led to imagine that one of Ponto's black hampshires had been sacrificed a short time previous to my visit. It was an excellent and comfortable repast, only there was a rather sameness to it, certainly. I made a similar remark the next day. During the dinner, Mrs. Ponto asked me many questions regarding the nobility my relatives. When Lady Angelina Skeggs would come out, and if the Countess her mamma, this was said with much archness and hee-heeing, still wore that extraordinary purple hair dye, whether my lord Guttlebury kept beside his French chef, and an English cordon bleu for the roasts, an Italian for the confectionery, who attended at Lady Clipperclaw's conversation -y, and whether Sir John Champion's Thursday mornings were pleasant. Was it true that Lady Carabas, wanting to pawn her diamonds, found that they were paste, and that the Marquis had disposed of them beforehand? How was it that Snuffin, the great tobacco merchant, broke off the marriage which was on the tapet between him and their second daughter? And was it true that a mulatto lady came over from the Havana and forbade the match? Upon my word, madam, I had begun, and was going on to say that I didn't know one word about all these matters which seemed so to interest Mrs. Major Ponto, when the Major giving me a tread or stamp with his large foot under the table said come on come on snob my boy we are all titled you know we know you're one of the fashionable people about town we saw your name at lady clapperclaw's soirees and the champagne breakfast and as for the rub-a-dubs of course as relations oh of course i dine there twice a week i said and then i remembered that my cousin humphrey snob of the middle temple is a great frequenter of genteel societies and to have seen his name in the morning post at the tag end of several party lists so taking the hint i am ashamed to say that i indulged mrs major ponto with a deal of information about the first families in england such as would astonish those great personages if they knew it i described to her most accurately the three reigning beauties of last season at Almex, told her in confidence that his grace the d of w was going to be married the day after his statue was put up that his grace the d of d was also about to lead the fourth daughter of the archduke stephen to the hymeneal altar and talked to her in a word just in the style of mrs gore's last fashionable novel Mrs. Major was quite fascinated by this brilliant conversation. She had begun to trot out scraps of French, just for all the world as they do in the novels, and kissed her hand to me quite graciously, telling me to come soon to café, un petit musique au salon, with which she tripped off like an elderly fairy. Shall I open a bottle of port, 
or do you ever drink such a thing as hollands and water says ponto looking ruefully at me this was a very different style of thing to what i had been led to expect from him at our smoking-room at the club where he swaggers about his horses in his cellar and slapping me on the shoulder used to say come down to mangle snob my boy and i'll give you as good a day's shooting and as good a glass of claret as any in this country well said i i like hollands much better than port and gin even better than hollands this was lucky it was gin and stripes brought in hot water on a splendid plated tray the jingling of a harp and piano soon announced that mrs pondo's own pew de music had commenced and the smell of the stable again entering the dining-room in the person of stripes summoned us to cafe and a little concert she beckoned me with a winning smile to the sofa on which she made room for me and where we could command a fine view of the backs of the young ladies who were performing the musical entertainment very broad backs they were too strictly according to the present mode for crinoline or its substitutes is not an expensive luxury and young people in the country can afford to be in the fashion at very trifling charges miss emily ponto at the piano and her sister maria at that somewhat exploded instrument the harp were in light blue dresses that looked all flounce and spread out like mr green's balloon when inflated brilliant touch emily has and what a fine arm maria's is miss ponto remarked good-naturedly pointing out the merits of her daughter's and waving her own arm in such a way as to show that she was not a little satisfied with the beauty of that member i observed that she had about nine bracelets and bangles consisting of chains and padlocks the major's miniature and a variety of brass serpents with fiery ruby or tender turquoise eyes writhing up to her elbow almost in the most profuse contortions you recognize those polkas they were played at the devonshire house on the twenty third of july the day of the grand fete so i said yes i knew em quite intimately and began wagging my head as if in acknowledgment of those old friends when the performance was concluded i had the felicity of a presentation and conversation with the two tall and scraggy miss pontos and miss wirt the governess sat down to entertain us with variations on sitch getting up the stairs they were determined to be in the fashion for the performance of getting up the stairs i have no other name but that it was a stunner first miss wirt with great deliberation played the original and beautiful melody cutting it as it were out of the instrument and firing off each note so loud clear and sharp that i am sure stripes must have heard it in the stable what a finger says mrs ponto and indeed it was a finger as knotted as a turkey's drumstick and splaying all over the piano when she had banged out the tune slowly she began a different manner of getting up the stairs and did so with a fury and swiftness quite incredible she spun up the stairs she whirled up the stairs she galloped up the stairs she rattled up the stairs and then having got the tune to the top landing as though it were she hurled it down again shrieking to the bottom floor where it sank in a crash as if exhausted by the breathless rapidity of the descent then miss work played getting up the stairs with the most pathetic and ravishing solemnity plaintive moans and sobs issued from the keys you wept you trembled as though you were getting up the stairs miss work's hands seemed to faint and wail and die in variations again and she went up with a savage clang and rush of trumpets as if miss wirt was storming a breach and although i knew nothing of music as i sat and listened with my mouth open to this wonderful display my coffee grew cold and i wondered the windows did not crack and the chandelier start out of the beam at the sound of this earthquake of a piece of music glorious creature isn't she said mrs ponto squirts's favorite pupil inestimable to have such a creature 
Lady Carabas would give her eyes for her. A prodigy of accomplishments. Thank you, Miss Wirt. And the young ladies gave a heave and a gasp of admiration. A deep, breathing, gushing sound, such as you hear at church when the sermon comes to a full stop. Miss Wirt put her two great double-knuckled hands round a waist of her two pupils, and said, My dear children, I hope you will be able to play it soon, as well as your poor little governess. When I lived with the Dursonanes, it was dear Duchess's favorite, and Lady Barbara and Lady Jane Macbeth learned it. It was while hearing Jane play that, I remember that dear Lord Castletoddy first fell in love with her, and though he is but an Irish peer, with not more than fifteen thousand a year, I persuaded Jane to have him. Do you know Castle Toddy, Mr. Snob? Round Towers, Sweet Place, Country Mayo. Old Lord Castle Toddy, the present lord was then Lord Inishawan, was a most eccentric old man, they say. He was mad. I heard His Royal Highness, the poor Duke of Sussex, such a man, my dears, but alas, addicted to smoking. I heard His Royal Highness say to the Marquis of Angley, I am sure that Castletoddy is mad, but Inishwan wasn't in marrying my sweet Jane, though the dear child had but her ten thousand pounds pour to portage. Most invaluable person, whispered Mrs. Major Ponto to me, he has lived in the very highest society, and I, who would be accustomed to see the governess bullied in the world, was delighted to find this one ruling the roast, and to think that even the majestic Miss Ponto bent before her. As for my pipe, so to speak, it went out at once. I haven't a word to say against a woman who is intimate with every duchess in the Red Book, she wasn't the rosebud, but she had been near it. She had rubbed shoulders with the great, and about those we talked all the evening incessantly, and about the fashions, and about the court, until bedtime came. And are there snobs in this Elysium? I exclaimed, jumping into the lavender perfume bed. Porto's snoring boomed from the neighboring bedroom in reply. End of chapter 25「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」「ファイブ」The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray Chapter 26 on Some Country Snobs Something like a journal of the proceedings at the Evergreens may be interesting to those foreign readers of Punch who want to know the customs of an English gentleman's family and household. There's plenty of time to keep the journal. Piano strumming begins at six o'clock in the morning. It lasts until breakfast, but with a minute's intermission, when the instrument changes hands and Miss Emily practices in place of her sister, Miss Maria. In fact, the confounded instrument never stops when the young ladies are at their lessons. Miss Wirt hammers away at those stunning variations and keeps her magnificent finger in exercise. I asked this great creature in what other branches of education she instructed her pupils. The modern languages, says she modestly, French, German, Spanish, and Italian, Latin and the rudiments of Greek if desired, English, of course, the practice of elocution, geography and astronomy, and the use of the globes, algebra, but only as far as quadratic equations, for a poor ignorant female, you know, Mr. Snob, cannot be expected to know everything. Ancient and modern history no young woman can be without, 
and of these I make my beloved pupils perfect mistresses. Botany, geology, and mineralogy I consider as amusements, and with these I assure you we manage to pass the days at the evergreens not unpleasantly. Only these, thought I, what an education! But I looked in one of Miss Porto's manuscript song-books, and found five faults of French in four words, and in a waggish mood asking Miss Wirt whether Dante Algeri was so called because he was born at Algiers, received a smiling answer in the affirmative which made me rather doubt about the accuracy of Miss Wirt's knowledge. When the above little morning occupations are concluded, these unfortunate young women perform what they call calisthenic exercises in the garden. I saw them to-day without any crinoline pulling the garden roller. Dear Mrs. Ponto was in the garden, too, and as limp as her daughter's, in a faded bandeau of hair, in a battered bonnet, in a holland pinafore and patterns on a broken chair, snipping leaves off a vine. Mrs. Ponto measures many yards about in an evening. Yea, heavens, what a guy she is in that skeleton morning costume! Besides stripes, they keep a boy called Thomas or Thomas. Thomas works in the garden or about the pigsty and stable. Thomas wears a page's costume of eruptive buttons. When anybody calls and stripes is out of the way, Thomas flings himself like mad into Thomas's clothes and comes out metamorphosed like Harlequin in the pantomime. Today, as Mrs. P. was cutting the grapevine, as the young ladies were at the roller, down comes Thomas like a roaring whirlwind, with Mrs., Mrs., there's company coming. Away scurried the young ladies from the roller, down comes Mrs. P. from the old chair, off flies Thomas to change his clothes, and in an incredibly short space of time, Sir John Hawbuck, my Lady Hawbuck, and Master Hugh Hawbuck are introduced into the garden, with brazen effrontery by Thomas, who says, Please, Sir Jan and my lady, to walk this year away. I know Mrs. is in the rose garden. And there, sure enough, she was, in a pretty little garden bonnet, with beautiful curling ringlets, with the smartest of aprons, and the freshest of pearl-colored gloves. This amazing woman was in the arms of her dearest Lady Hawbuck. Dearest Lady Hawbuck, how good of you! always among my flowers, can't live away from them. Sweets to the sweet, hum a ha ha, says Sir John Hawbuck, who piques himself on his gallantry and says nothing without a hum a ha ha. Where's your pinafore? cries Master Hugh. We thaw you in it over the wall, didn't we, Pa? Hum a ha ha, burst out Sir John, dreadfully alarmed. Where's Ponto? Why wasn't he at quarter sessions? How are his birds this year? Mrs. Ponto, had those Carabas pheasants done any harm to your wheat? Ha ha ha! And all this while he was making the most ferocious and desperate signals to his youthful heir. Well, she wath in her pinafore, wathn't thee, ma? said Hugh, quite unabashed, which question Lady Hawbuck turned away with a sudden query regarding her dear darling daughters, and the enfant terrible was removed by his father. I hope you weren't disturbed by the music, Ponto says. My girls, you know, practice four hours a day, you know. Must do it, you know. Absolutely necessary. As for me, you know, I'm an early man, and in my farm every morning at five. No, no laziness for me. The facts are these. Ponto goes to sleep directly after dinner on entering the drawing-room, and wakes up when the ladies leave off practice at ten. From seven till ten, from ten till five, is a very fair allowance of slumber for a man who says he's not a lazy man. It is my private opinion that when Ponto retires to what is called his study, he sleeps too. He locks himself up there daily two hours with the newspaper. I saw the hobbock scene out of the study which commands the garden. It's a curious object, that study. Ponto's library mostly consists of boots. He and Stripes have important interviews here of mornings, when the potatoes are discussed, or the fate of the calf ordained, or sentence passed on the pig, etc. 
All the major's bills are docketed on the study table, and displayed like a lawyer's briefs. Here, too, lie displayed his hooks, knives, and other gardening irons, his whistles and strings of spare buttons. He has a drawer of endless brown paper for parcels, and another containing a prodigious and never-failing supply of string. What a man can want with so many gig-whips I can never conceive. These and fishing-rods and landing-nets and spurs and boot-trees and balls for horses, and surgical instruments for the same, and favorite pots of shiny blacking with which he paints his own shoes in the most elegant manner and buckskin gloves stretched out on their trees, and his gorget, sash, and saber of the horse-marines, with his boot-hooks underneath in atrophy, and the family medicine-chest, and in a corner the very rod with which he used to whip his son, Wellesley Ponto, when a boy. Wellesley never entered the study but for that awful purpose. All these, with Mogg's road-book, the gardener's chronicle, and a backgammon board, formed the major's library. Under the trophy there is a picture of Mrs. Ponto in a light blue dress and train, and no waist when she was first married. A fox's brush lies over the frame, and serves to keep the dust off that work of art. My library's small, says Ponto, with the most amazing impudence, but well selected, my boy, well selected. I have been reading the History of England all the morning. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 27 of the Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shalifa Mulligan. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 27. A Visit to Some Country Snobs We had the fish, which, as a kind reader may remember, I had brought down in a delicate attention to Mrs. Ponto, the fairy gave the repast of next day, and caught an oyster sauce, twice laid salt cod, and scalloped oysters, formed part of the bill of fare, until I began to fancy that the Ponto family— like our late revered monarch George the Second, had a fancy for stale fish, and about this time, the pig being consumed, we began upon a sheep. But how shall I forget the solemn splendour of a second course, which was served up in great state by stripes in a silver dish and cover, a napkin round his dirty thumbs, and consisted of a land rail, not much bigger than a corpulent sparrow. My love, "'Will you take any game?' says Ponto, with prodigious gravity, and stuck his fork into the little mousel of an island in the silver sea. Stripes, too, at intervals, dribbled out the marsala with a solemnity which would have done honour to Duke's butler. The Barmecide's dinner to Shackerback was only one degree removed from these solemn banquets. As there were plenty of pretty country places close by, a comfortable country town, with good houses of gentlefolks, a beautiful old parsonage, close to the church whizzy we went, and where the Carabas family have their ancestral calves and monumented Gothic pew, and every appearance of good society in the neighbourhood. I rather wondered we were not enlivened by the appearance of some of the neighbours at Evergreens, and asked about them. We can't in our position of life— "'We can't well associate with the attorney's family, as I leave you to suppose,' says Mrs. Ponto confidentially. "'Of course not,' I answered, though I didn't know why. "'And the doctor?' said I. "'A most excellent worthy creature,' says Mrs. P. "'Saved Maria's life. Really, learned man. But what can one do in one's position? One may ask one's medical men to one's table, certainly.' "'But his family, my dear Mr. Snob.' "'Half a dozen little gallipots, interposed Miss Ward, the governess. <laughs> the young ladies laughed in chorus. "'We only live with the county families,' Miss Ward continued, tossing up her head. Also's note. "'I have since heard that this aristocratic lady's father was a library button-maker in St. Martin's Lane, 
where he met with misfortunes, and his daughter acquired her taste for heraldry. But it may be told to her credit that out of her earnings she has kept the bedridden old bankrupt in great comfort and secrecy in Pentonville, and furnished her brother's outfit for the cadetship which her patron, Lord Swigglebeagle, gave her when he was at the Board of Control. I have this information from a friend. To hear Miss Wirt herself, you would fancy that her papa was a Rothschild, and that the Marquis of Europe were convulsed when he went to the Gazette. End of Auster's Note the duke is abroad we are at feud with the carabasses the ring would don't come down to christmas in fact nobody's here till the hunting season positively nobody who's is the large red house just out, out of the town what the chateau calico <laughs> that purse proud ex line and draper must yardly with the yellow liveries and the wife in red velvet how can you my dear mrs snob be so satirical the impertinence of those people is really something quite overwhelming. Well, then, there is a parson, Dr. Chrysostom. He is a gentleman, at any rate. At this, Mrs. Ponto looked at Miss Word. After the eyes had met, and they had wagged their heads at each other, they looked up to the ceiling. So did the young ladies. They thrilled. It was evident I had said something very terrible. "'Another black sheep in the church?' thought I, with a little sorrow, for I don't care to own that I have a respect for the cloth. "'I—I I hope there's nothing wrong?' "'Wrong?' says Mrs. P., clasping her hands with a tragic air. "'Oh!' says Miss Word, and the two girls gasping in chorus. "'Well,' says I, "'I'm very sorry for it. I never saw a nicer-looking old gentleman or a better school.' or heard a better sermon. He used to preach those sermons in a surplice, hissed out Mrs. Ponto. He's beauty eyed, Mr. Snob. Heavenly powers, says I, admiring the pure art of these female theologians, and strive scheming with the tea. It's so weak that no wonder Ponto's sleep isn't disturbed by it. Of mornings we used to go out shooting, we had Ponto's own fields to sport over, where we got the land rail, and the non-preserved part of the Harbuck property, and one evening in a stubble of Ponto skirting the Caribous woods, we got among some pheasants and had some real sport. I shot a hen, I know, greatly to my delight. Back it, says Ponto, in rather a hurried manner, and hears somebody crying. So I pocketed the bird. "'You infernal poaching thieves!' roars out a man from the hedge in the garb of a gamekeeper. "'I wish I could catch you on the side of the hedge. I'd put a brace of barrels into you, that I would.' "'Curse that snapper!' says Ponto, moving off. "'He's always watching me like a spy.' "'Carry off the birds, you sneaks, and sell them in London!' roars the individual, who it appears was a keeper of Lord Carabas. "'You'll get six shillings a brace for him.' "'You know the price of him well enough, and so does your master too, your scoundrel,' says Ponto, still retreating. "'We kill him on our ground,' cries Mr. Snapper. "'We don't set traps for other people's bird. We're no decoy ducks. We're no sneaking poachers. We don't shoot ends, like that a cockney who's got a tail of one sticking out of his pocket. Only just come across the hatch, that's all.' "'I tell you what,' says Stripes, who was out with us as keeper this day. In fact, his keeper, coachman, coachman, gardener, valet, and bailiff, with Thomas under him. If you'll come across, John Snapper, and take your coat off, I'll give you such a whopping as you've never had since the last time I did it at Wattlebury Fair. Whoop on your own weight, Mrs. Snapper said, whistling his dogs and disappearing into the wood. And so he came out of this controversy rather victoriously, but I began to alter my preconceived ideas of rural felicity. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 28 of The Book of Snobs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Clifton. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 28 on some country snobs. Be hanged to your aristocrats, Ponto said, in some conversation we had regarding the family at Carabas, between whom and the Evergreens there was a feud. When I first came into the country, it was the year before Sir John Buff contested in the blue interest. The Marquis, then Lord St. Michael's, who, of course, was orange to the core, paid me and Mrs. Ponto such attentions that I fairly confess that I was taken in by the old humbug, and thought that I'd met with a rare neighbor. Gad, sir! We used to get pines from Carabas and pheasants from Carabas, and it was Ponto when we come over and shoot, and Ponto or pheasants want thinning, and my lady would insist upon her dear Mrs. Ponto coming over to Carabas to sleep, and put me, I don't know to what expense, for turbans and velvet gowns for my wife's toilet. Well, sir, the election takes place, and though I was always a liberal, personal friendship of course induces me to plump for st michael's who comes in at the head of the poll next year mrs p insists upon going to town with lodging in clarges street at ten pounds a week with a hired brougham and new dresses for herself and the girls and the deuce and all to pay our first cards were to the carabas house my ladies are returned by a great big flunky and i leave you to fancy my poor betsy's discomfiture as the lodging-house maid took in the cards and lady st michael's drives away though she actually saw us at the drawing-room window would you believe it sir that though we called four times afterward those infernal aristocrats never returned our visit that though Lady St. Michael gave nine dinner-parties and four dejeuners at season, she never asked us to one, and that she cut us dead at the opera, though Betsy was nodding to her the whole night. We wrote to her for tickets for Almex. She writes to say that all hers were promised and said, in the presence of Wiggins, her lady's maid, who told it to Diggs, my wife's woman, that she couldn't conceive how people in our station of life could so far forget themselves as to wish to appear in any such place. Go to Castle Carabas? I'd sooner die than set my foot in the house of that impertinent, insolvent, insolent jackanapes, and I hold him in scorn. After this Ponto gave me some private information regarding Lord Carabas's pecuniary affairs, and how he owed money all over the county, how Jukes the carpenter was utterly ruined and couldn't get a shilling of his bill, how Biggs the butcher hanged himself for the same reason, how the six big footmen never received a guinea of wages, and Snoffle, the state coachman, actually took off his blown glass wig of ceremony and flung it at Lady Carabas's feet on the terrace before the castle. All which stories, as they are private, I do not think proper to divulge. But these details did not stifle my desire to see the famous mansion of Castle Carabas, nay, possibly excite my interest to know more about that lordly house and its owners at the entrance of the park there are a pair of great gaunt mildewed lodges mouldy doric temples with black chimney-pots in the finest classic taste and the gates of course are surmounted by the chabot the well-known supporters of the carabas family give the lodge-keeper a shilling says ponto who drove me near to it in his four-wheeled cruelty chase I warrant it's the first piece of ready money he has received for some time. I don't know whether there was any foundation for this sneer, but the gratuity was received with a curtsy, and the gate opened for me to enter. Poor old portress, says I inwardly, you little know that it is the historian of snobs whom you let in. The gates were passed. A damp green stretch of park spread right and left immeasurably, confined by a chilly grey wall and a damp, long, straight road between two huge rows of moist, dismal lime-trees leads up to the castle. In the midst of the park there is a great black tank or lake bristling over with rushes, and here and there covered over with patches of pea-soup. 
A shabby temple rises on an island in this delectable lake, which is approached by a rotten barge that lies at roost in a dilapidated boathouse. Clumps of elms and oaks dot over the huge green flat. Every one of them would have been down long since, but that the Marquis is not allowed to cut the timber. Up that long avenue the snobographer walked in solitude. At the seventy-ninth tree on the left-hand side, the insolvent butcher hanged himself. I scarcely wondered at the dismal deed. So woeful and sad were the impressions connected with the place. So for a mile and a half I walked alone and thinking of death. I forgot to say the house is in full view all the way, except when intercepted by the trees on the miserable island in the lake, an enormous red-brick mansion square, vast and dingy. It is flanked by four stone towers with weathercocks. In the midst of the grand façade is a huge ionic portico, approached by a vast, lonely, ghastly staircase. Rows of black windows, framed in stone, stretch on either side, right and left, three stories and eighteen windows of a row. You may see a picture of the palace and staircase in The Views of England and Wales, with four carved and gilt carriages waiting at the gravel walk, and several parties of ladies and gentlemen in wigs and hoops dotting the fatiguing lines of stairs. But these stairs are made in great houses for people not to ascend. The first Lady Carabas, they are but eighty years in the peerage, if she got out of her gilt coach in a shower, would be wet to the skin before she got halfway to the carved ionic portico, where four dreary statues of peace, plenty, piety, and patriotism are the only sentinels. You enter these palaces by back doors. That was the way the Krabuses got their peerage, the misanthronic Ponto said after dinner. Well, I rang the bell at a little low side door. It clanged and jingled and echoed for a long, long while till at length a face as of a housekeeper peered through the door and as she saw my hand in my waistcoat pocket opened it unhappy lonely housekeeper i thought is miss caruso in her island more solitary the door clapped to and i was in castle carabas the side entrance in all says the housekeeper the holligator hover the mantelpiece was brought home by admiral st michael's when a kept with Lord Hanson. The harms on the cheers is the harms of the Carabas family. The hall was rather comfortable. We went clapping up a clean stone back stair, and then into a back passage cheerfully decorated with a ragged light green Kidderminster, and issued upon the Great All. The Great All is seventy-two feet in length, fifty-six in breadth, and thirty-eight feet high. The carvings of the chimneys, representing the birth of Venus and Hercules and Eyelash, is by Van Chislam, the most famous sculpture of this hog and country. The ceiling by Calamanco, representing painting, horticulture, and music. The naked female figure with the barrel organ, introducing George, first Lord Carabas, to the Temple of the Muses. The winter ornaments is by Vanderputty. The floor is Patagonian marble, and the chandelier in the center was presented to Lionel, second marquis by Louis the Sixteenth, whose head was cut off in the French Revelation. We now enter the South Gallery. One hundred and forty-eight in length by thirty-two in breadth, it is profusely ornamented by the choicest works of heart. Sir Andrew Katz, founder of the Carabas family and banker of the Prince of Orange, Neller her present ladyship by Lawrence, Lord St. Michael's by the same, he is represented sitting on a rock in velvet pantaloons, Moses in the bulrushes, the bull very fine by Paul Potter, the toilet of Venus, Fantaski, Flemish boars drinking, Van Ginnemus, Jupiter and Europa, de Horn, the Grand Junction Canal, Venus by Candletti, and Italian Bandix by Silvetta Rosa, and so this worthy woman went on from one room to another, from the blue room to the green, and the green to the grand salon, and, and the grand salon to the tapestry closet, cracking her list of pictures and wonders, and, and furtively turning up a corner of a brown holland to show the color of the old, faded, seedy, moldy, dismal hangings. 
At last we came to her ladyship's bedroom. In the centre of this dreary apartment there is a bed about the size of one of those whizgig temples in which the genus appears in pantomime. The huge gilt edifice is approached by steps and so tall that it might be let off in floors for sleeping rooms for all the Carabas family. An awful bed. A murder might be done at one end of that bed, and people sleeping at the other end be ignorant of it. Gracious powers! Fancy little Lord Carabas in a nightcap ascending those steps after putting out the candle. The sight of that seedy and solitary splendor was too much for me. I should go mad were I that lonely housekeeper in those enormous galleries, in that lonely library, filled up with ghastly folios that nobody dares read, with an inkstand on the center table like the coffin of a baby, and sad portraits staring at you from the bleak walls with their solemn, moldy eyes. No wonder that Carabas does not come down here often. It would require two thousand footmen to make the place cheerful. No wonder the coachman resigned his wig, that the masters were insolvent, and the servants perish in this huge dreary out-at-elbow place. A single family has no more right to build itself a temple of that sort than to erect a tower of Babel. Such a habitation is not decent for a mere mortal man, but after all, I suppose poor Carabas had no choice. Fate put him there as it sent Napoleon to St. Helena. Suppose it had been decreed by nature that you and I should be Marquis? We wouldn't refuse, I suppose, but take Castle Carabas and all, with debts, duns, and mean makeshifts, and shabby pride, and swindling magnificence. Next season, when I read of Lady Carabas's splendid entertainments in the Morning Post, and see the poor old insolvent cantering through the park, I shall have a much tenderer interest in those great people than I have had heretofore. Poor old shabby snob! Ride on, and fancy the world is still on its knees before the house of Carabas. Give yourself airs, poor old bankrupt Magnifico, who are under money obligations to your flunkies, and must stoop so as to swindle poor tradesmen. And for us, oh, my brother snobs, oughtn't we to feel happy if our walk through life is more even, and that we are out of the reach of that surprising arrogance and that astounding meanness to which this wretched old victim is obliged to mount and descend? This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 29 of The Book of Snobs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Clifton The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray Chapter 29 A Visit to Some Country Snobs Notable as my reception had been, under that unfortunate mistake of Mrs. Ponto, that I was related to Lord Snobbington, which I was not permitted to correct, it was nothing compared to the bowing and kittooing, the raptures and flurry which proceeded and welcomed the visit of a real, live lord and lord's son a brother officer of coronet wellesley ponto in the one hundred and twentieth hussars who came over with the young coronet from guttlesbury where their distinguished regiment was quartered this was my lord giles lord saltire's grandson and heir a very young short sandy-haired and tobacco-smoking nobleman who cannot have left the nursery very long and who though he accepted the honest major's invitation to the evergreens in a letter written in a schoolboy handwriting with a number of faults of spelling may yet be a very fine classical scholar for what i know having had his education at eton where he and young ponto were inseparable at any rate if he can't write he has mastered a number of other accomplishments wonderful for one of his age and size he is one of the best shots and riders in england he rode his horse abracadabra and won the famous guttlebury steeplechase he has horses entered at half the races in the country 
under other people's names, for the old lord is a strict hand, and will not hear of betting or gambling. He has lost and won such sums of money as my lord George himself might be proud of. He knows all the stables, and all the jockeys, and has all the information, and is a match for the best leg at Newmarket. Nobody was ever known to be too much for him at play or in the stable. Although his grandfather makes him a moderate allowance, by the aid of post obits and convenient friends, he can live in a splendor becoming his rank. He has not distinguished himself in the knocking down of policemen much. He is not big enough for that, but as a lightweight, his skill is of the very highest order. At billiards he is said to be first-rate. He drinks and smokes as much as any two of the biggest officers in his regiment. With such high talents, who can say how far he may not go? He may take to politics as a dull assessment, and be prime minister after Lord George Bentnick. My young friend, Wellesley Ponto, is a gaunt and bony youth, with a pale face profusely blotched. From his continually pulling something on his chin, I am led to fancy that he believes he has what is called an imperial growing there. That is not the only tuft that is hunted in the family, by the way. He can't, of course, indulge in those expensive amusements which render his aristocratic comrade so respected. He bets pretty freely when he is in the cash, and rides when somebody mounts him, for he can't afford more than his regulation chargers. At drinking he is by no means inferior. And why do you think he brought his noble friend, Lord Giles, to the Evergreens? Why? because he intended to ask his mother to order his father to pay his debts, which she couldn't refuse before such an exalted presence. Young Ponto gave me all this information with the most engaging frankness. We are old friends. I used to tip him when he was at school. Gad, says he, our wedgment so doothed expensive. Must hunt, you know. A man couldn't live in the wedgment if he didn't. Meth expenses on off. Must dine at meth. Must drink champagne and claret. Ours ain't a port and sherry light infantry mess. Uniform's awful. Fitch so our colonel will have em though. Must be a distinction, you know. At his own expense, Fitch altered the plumes in the men's caps. You called them shaving brushes, snob, my boy. Most absurd and unjust, that attack of yours, by the way. That altuation alone cost him five hundred pound. The year before last he horthed the wedgment at an immense expense, and we're called the Queen's own piebald from that day. Ever seen it on parade? The Emperor Nicholas burst into tears of envy when he saw us at Windsor. And ye see, continued my young friend, I brought Giles down with me, as the governor is very sulky about shelling out, just to talk my mother over who could do anything with him. Giles told her that I was Fitzschultz's favorite of the whole regiment, and gad, she thinks the horse guards will give me my troop for nothing. And he humbugged the governor that I was the greatest screw in the army. Ain't that a good dodge? With this, Wellesley left me to go and smoke a cigar in the stables with Lord Giles, and make merry over the cattle there under striped superintendence. Young Ponto laughed with his friend at the venerable four-wheeled cruelty chase, but seemed amazed that the latter should ridicule more than an ancient chariot of the build of 1824, emblazoned immensely with the arms of the Pontos and the Snailies, from which latter distinguished family Mrs. Ponto issued. I found poor Pon in his study among his boots, in such a rueful attitude of despondency, that I could not but remark it. Look at that, says the poor fellow, handing me over a document. It's the second change in uniform since he's been in the army, and yet there's no extravagance about the lad. Lord Giles tells me that he is the most careful youngster in the regiment, God bless him. But look at that. By heaven, snob, look at that and say, how can a man of nine hundred keep out of the bench? He gave a sob as he handed me the paper across the table, and his old face, and his old corduroys, and his shrunk shooting jacket, and his lean shanks looked, as he spoke, more miserably haggard, bankrupt, and threadbare. Lieutenant Wellesley Ponto, 120th Queen's Own Piebald Hussars, 
To Knopf and Stecknadel, Conduit Street, London, L.S.D. Dress jacket, richly laced with gold, 35 pounds. Ditto police, ditto and trimmed with sable, 60 pounds. Undress jacket, trimmed with gold, 15 pounds, 15 shillings. Ditto police, 30 pounds. Dress pantaloons, 12 pounds. Ditto overalls, gold lace on sides, 6 pounds, 6 shillings. Undress ditto, ditto, 5 pounds, 5 shillings. Blue braided frock, 14 pounds, 14 shillings. Forage cap, 3 pounds, 3 shillings. Dress cap, gold lines, plume and chain, 25 pounds. Gold barreled sash, 11 pounds, 18 shillings. Sword, 11 pounds, 11 shillings. Ditto belt and sabache, 16 pounds, 16 shillings. Pouch and belt, 15 pounds, 15 shillings. Sword knot, 1 pound, 4 shillings. Cloak, 13 pounds, 13 shillings. Valise, 3 pounds, 13 shillings, 6 pence. Regulation saddle, 7 pounds, 17 shillings, 6 pence. Ditto bridle, complete, 10 pounds, 10 shillings. Address housing, complete, 30 pounds. A pair of pistols, 10 pounds, 10 shillings. A black sheepskin, edged, 6 pounds, 18 shillings. Total, 347 pounds, 9 shillings. That evening Mrs. Ponto and her family made their darling Wellesley give a full, true, and particular account of everything that had taken place at Lord Fitzschultz's, how many servants waited at dinner, and how the ladies Schneider dressed, and what his royal highness said when he came down to shoot, and who was there? What a blessing that boy is to me, she said, as my pimple-faced young friend moved off to resume smoking operations with Giles in the now vacant kitchen and poor ponto's dreary and desperate look shall i ever forget that o oh, you parents and guardians o oh, you men and women of sense in england o oh, you legislators about to assemble in parliament read over that tailor's bill above printed read over that absurd catalogue of insane gimmicks and madman's tomfoolery and say how are you ever to get rid of snobbishness when society does so much for its education three hundred and forty pounds for a young chap saddle and breeches before george i would rather be a hottentot or a highlander we laugh at poor jocko the monkey dancing in uniform or at poor james the flunkey with his quivering calves and plush tights or at the nigger marquis of marmalade dressed out with sabre and epaulets and giving himself the airs of a field marshal lo is not one of the queen's piebalds in full fig as great and foolish a monster This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 30 of the Book of Snobs by W. M. Thackeray. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Snobs by W. M. Thackeray. Chapter 30 On Some Country Snobs. At last came that fortunate day at the Evergreens when I was to be made acquainted with some of the county families with whom only people of Ponto's rank condescended to associate. And now, although poor Ponto had just been so cruelly made to bleed on occasion of his son's new uniform, and though he was in the direst and most cutthroat spirits with an overdrawn account of the bankers and other pressing evils of poverty, although a tenpenny bottle of marsala and an awful parsimony presided generally at his table, yet the poor fellow was obliged to assume the most frank and jovial air of cordiality and all the covers being removed from the hangings and new dresses being procured for the young ladies and the family plate being unlocked and displayed the house and all within assumed a benevolent and festive appearance the kitchen fires began to blaze the good wine ascended from the cellar a professed cook actually came over from guttlebury to compile culinary abominations stripes was in a new coat and so was ponto for wonder and tumis's button suit was worn en permanence and all this to show off the little lord thinks i all this in honour of a stupid little cigarified cornet of dragoons who can barely write his name while an eminent and profound moralist like somebody is fobbed off with cold mutton and relays of pig well well a martyrdom of cold mutton is just bearable i pardon mrs ponto from my heart i do especially as i wouldn't turn out of the best bedroom in spite of all her hints but held my ground in the shins tester vowing that lord gules as a young man was quite small and hearty enough to make himself comfortable elsewhere 
The great Ponto party was a very august one. The Hawbucks came in their family coach, with the blood-red band emblazoned all over it, and their man in yellow livery waited in country fashion at table, only to be exceeded in splendor by the Hipsleys, the opposition baronet, in light blue. The old ladies Fitzague drove over in their little old chariot with the fat black horses, the fat coachman, the fat footman. Why are dowagers as horses and footmen always fat? And soon after these personages had arrived with their auburn fronts and red beaks and turbans came the Honourable and Reverend Lionel Petipois, who with General and Mrs. Sago formed the rest of the party. Lord and Lady Frederick Howlett were asked, but they have friends at Ivy Bush, Mrs. Ponto told me, and that very morning the Castle Haggard sent an excuse, as her ladyship had a return of the quinsy. Between ourselves, Lady Castle Haggard's quinsy always comes on when there is dinner at the Evergreens. If the keeping of polite company could make a woman happy, surely my kind hostess, Mrs. Ponto, was on that day a happy woman. Every person present— except the unlucky impostor who pretended to a connection with the snobbington family and general sago who had brought home i don't know how many lakhs of rupees from india was related to the peerage or the baronage mrs p had her heart's desire if she had been an earl's daughter herself could she have expected better company and her family were in the oil trade at bristol as all her friends very well know what I complained of in my heart was not the dining, which for this once was plentiful and comfortable enough, but the prodigious dullness of the talking part of the entertainment. Oh, my beloved brother, snobs of the city, if we love each other no better than our country brethren, at least we amuse each other more. If we bore ourselves, we are not called upon to go ten miles to do it. For instance, the Hipsleys came ten miles from the south, and the Hawbucks ten miles from the north of the Evergreens, and were magnates in two different divisions of the county of Mangle Wurzelshire. Hipsley, who was an old baronet with a bothered estate, did not care to show his contempt for Hawbuck, who is a new creation and rich. Hawbuck, on his part, gives himself patronizing airs to General Sago, who looks upon the Pontos as little better than paupers. Old Lady Blanche, says Ponto, I hope will leave something to her goddaughter, my second girl. We've all of us half poisoned ourselves with taking her physic. Lady Blanche and Lady Rose Fitzague have, the first, a medical, and the second, a literary turn. I'm inclined to believe the former had a wet compress around her body on the occasion when I had the happiness of meeting her. She doctors everybody in the neighborhood of which she is the ornament, and has tried everything on her own person. She went into court and testified publicly her faith in St. John Long. She swore by Dr. Buchan. She took quantities of Gambouge's universal medicine and whole boxfuls of Parr's life pills. She has cured a multiplicity of headaches by Squinstone's eye snuff. She wears a picture of Hahnemann in her bracelet and a lock of Priesnitz hair in a brooch. She talked about her own complaints and those of her confidant for the time being to every lady in the room successively, from our hostess down to Miss Wirt, taking them into corners and whispering about bronchitis, hepatitis, St. Vitus, neuralgia, cephalalgia, and so forth. I observed poor fat Lady Hawbuck in a dreadful alarm, after some communication regarding the state of her daughter Miss Lady Hawbuck's health, and Mrs. Sago turned quite yellow and put down her third glass of Madeira at a warning glance from Lady Blanche. Lady Rose talked literature and about the book club at Gettleberry, and is very strong in voyages and travels. She has a prodigious interest in Borneo, and, and displayed a knowledge of the history of the Punjab and Kafirland that does credit to her memory. Old General Sago, who sat perfectly silent and plethoric, roused up as from a lethargy when the former country was mentioned, and gave the company his story about a hog-hunt and ram-jugger. I observed her ladyship treated with something like contempt her neighbor the Reverend Lionel Petupois, a young divine, whom you may track through the country by little awakening books, at half a crown a hundred, which dribble out of his pockets wherever he goes. I saw him give Miss Wirt a sheaf of The Little Washerwoman on Putney Common, and to Miss Hawbuck a couple of dozen of Meat in the Tray, or The Young Butcher Boy Rescued and on paying a visit to Guttlebury Gal, I saw two notorious fellows waiting their trial there and temporarily occupied with a game of cribbage, to whom his reverence offered a tract as he was walking over Crackshins Common, and who robbed him of his purse, umbrella, and cambric handkerchief, leaving him the tracts to distribute elsewhere. End of chapter 30「ファイブアンドトゥーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォーフォ
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Clifton The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray Chapter 31 A Visit to Some Country Snobs Why, dear Mr. Snob, said a young lady of rank and fashion, to whom I present my best compliments, if you found everything so snobbish at the evergreens, if the pig bored you and the mutton was not to your liking, and Mrs. Ponto was a humbug and Miss Wirt a nuisance with her abominable piano practice, why did you stay so long? Ah, oh, Miss, what a question! Have you never heard of gallant British soldiers storming batteries, of doctors passing nights in plague wards of lazarettos, and other instances of martyrdom? What do you suppose induced gentlemen to walk two miles up to the batteries of Seboran, with a hundred and fifty thundering guns bowling them down by hundreds? Not pleasure, surely. What causes your respected father to quit his comfortable home for his chambers after dinner, and pore over the most dreary law papers until long past midnight? Mademoiselle, duty which must be done alike by military or legal, or literary gents. There's a power of martyrdom in our profession. You won't believe it? Your rosy lips assume a smile of incredulity, a most naughty and odious expression in a young lady's face. Well, then, the fact is that my chambers, number 24, Pump Court, Temple, were being painted by the Honourable Society, and Mrs. Slamkin, my laundress, having occasion to go into Durham to see her daughter, who is married, and has presented her with the sweetest little grandson. A few weeks could not be better spent than in rusticating. But, ah, uh, how delightful Pump Court looked when I revisited its well-known chimney-pots! Carry Lugi, welcome, welcome, O oh frog and smut! But if you think there is no moral in the foregoing account of the Pontine family, you are, madam, most painfully mistaken. In this very chapter we are going to have the moral. Why, the whole of the papers are nothing but the moral, setting forth as they do the folly of being a snob. You will remark that in the country snobography, my poor friend Ponto has been held up almost exclusively for the public gaze, and why? Because we went to no other house? Because other families did not welcome us to their mahogany? No, no, Sir John Hobbuck of the Hawes, Sir John Hipsley of Briary Hall, don't shut the gates of hospitality. Of General Sago's mulligatawny, I could speak from experience. And the two old ladies at Guttlesbury, were they nothing? Do you suppose that an agreeable young dog who shall be nameless would not be made welcome? Don't you know that people are too glad to see anybody in the country? But those dignified personages do not enter into the scheme of the present work, and are but minor characters of our snob drama, just as in the play kings and emperors are not half so important as many humble persons. The doge of Venice, for instance, gives way to Othello, who is but a nigger, and the king of France to Falconbridge, who is a gentleman of positively no birth at all. So, with the exalted characters above mentioned, I perfectly well recollect that the claret at Hawbucks was not by any means so good as that of Hipsley's, while, on the contrary, some white hermitage at the Hawes, by the way, the butler only gave me half a glass each time, was supernacular. And I remember the conversations. Oh, madam, madam, how stupid they were! The subsoil ploughing, the pheasants and poaching, the row about the representation of the country, the Earl of Mangle Woosershire being at variance with his relative and nominee, the Honourable Marmaduke Tom Noddy, all these I could put down had I the mind to violate the confidence of private life and a great deal of conversation about the weather, the Mangelwoosershire hunt, new manures, and eating and drinking, of course. But, qui bono, 
in these perfectly stupid and honourable families there is not that snobbishness which it is our purpose to expose an ox is an ox a great hulking fat-sided bellowing munching beef he ruminates according to his nature and consumes his destined portion of turnips or oil cake until the time comes for his disappearance from the pastures to be succeeded by other deep-lunged and fat-ribbed animals perhaps we do not respect an ox we rather acquiesce in him the snob my dear madam is the frog that tries to swell himself to ox size let us pelt the silly brute out of his folly look i pray you at the case of my unfortunate friend ponto a good-natured kindly english gentleman not overwise but quite passable fond of port wine of his family of country sports and agriculture hospitably minded with as pretty a little patrimonial country house as heart can desire and a thousand pounds a year it is not much but entre noir people can live for less and not uncomfortably for instance there is the doctor whom mrs p does not condescend to visit that man educates a merific family and is loved by the poor for miles around and gives them port wine for physic and medicine gratis and how those people can get on with their pittance as mrs ponto says is a wonder to her again there is the clergyman dr chrysostom mrs p says they quarrelled about poosyism but i am given to understand it was because mrs c had the paw of her at the haws you may see what the value of his living is any day in the clerical guide but you don't know what he gives away even petipolis allows that in whose eyes the doctor's surplus is a scarlet abomination and so does petipolis do his duty in his way and administer not only his tracts and his talk but his money and his means to his people as a lord's son by the way mrs ponto is uncommonly anxious that he should marry either of the girls whom lord giles does not intend to choose well although pond's income would make up almost as much as that of these three worthies put together oh my dear madam see what in hopeless penury the poor fellow lives what tenant can look to his forbearance what poor man can hope for his charity master's the best of men honest stripes says and when we was in the regiment a more free-handed chap didn't live but the way in which mrs du sayu i wonder the young ladies is alive that i do they live upon a fine governess and fine masters and have clothes made by lady Crobbs's own milliner and their brother rides with earls to cover and only the best people in the country visit at the evergreens and mrs ponto thinks herself a paragon of wives and mothers and a wonder of the world for doing all this misery and humbug and snobbishness on a thousand a year what an inexpressible comfort it was my mere madam when stripes put down my portmandeau in the four-wheeled chase and poor p on being touched with sciatica drove me over to Carabas Arms at Guttlebury, where we took leave. There were some bagmen there in the commercial room, and one talked about the house he represented, and another about his dinner, and a third about the inns on the road, and so forth. A talk, not very wise, but honest and to the purpose, about as good as that of the country gentleman, and oh, how much pleasanter than listening to Miss Wirt's showpieces on the piano, and Mrs. Ponto's genteel cackle about the fashion and the country families. End of chapter three. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter thirty two of the Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Julie from Wallachem. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 32 Snobium Gatherum. While I see the great effect which these papers are producing on an intelligent public, I have a strong hope that before long we shall have a regular snob department in the newspapers, just as we have the police courts and the court news at present. When a flagrant case of bone-crushing or poor law abuse occurs in the world, who so eloquent as at times to point it out? When a gross instance of snobbishness happens, why should not the indignant journalist call the public attention to that delinquency too? How, for instance, could that wonderful case of the Earl of Mangelwurzel and his brother be examined in the snobbish point of view, and let alone the hectoring, the bullying, the vaporing, the bad grammar, the mutual recriminations, lie-givings, challenges, retractions, which abound in the fraternal dispute, put out of the question these points as concerning the individual nobleman and his relative, with whose personal affairs we have nothing to do, and consider how intimately corrupt, how habitually grovelling and mean, how entirely snobbish in a word, a whole county must be, which can find no better cheese or leaders than these two gentlemen. We don't want, the great county of Mangelwurzelshire seems to say, that a man should be able to write good grammar, or that he should keep a Christian tongue in his head, or that he should have the commonest decency of temper, or even a fair share of good sense, in order to represent us in Parliament. All we require is, that a man should be recommended to us by the Earl of Mangelwurzelshire, and all that we require of the Earl of Mangelwurzelshire is that he should have fifty thousand a year, and hunt the country. Oh, you pride of all Snobland! Oh, you crawling, truckling, self-confessed lackeys and parasites! But this is going to savage. Don't let us forget our usual amenity, and the tone of playfulness and sentiment with which the beloved reader and writer have pursued their mutual reflections hitherto. Well, snobbishness pervades the little social farce, as well as a great state comedy, and the self-same moral is tacked to either. There was, for instance, an account in the papers of a young lady who, misled by fortune-teller, actually went part of the way to India, as far as Becknick was, I think, in search of a husband who was promised her there. Do you suppose this poor deluded little soul would have left a shop for a man below her in rank, or for anything but a darling of a captain in epaulets and a red coat? It was her snobbish sentiment that misled her, and made her vanities a prey to the swindling fortune-teller. Case two was that of Mademoiselle de Saugrenu, the interesting young Frenchwoman with a profusion of jetty ringlets, who lived for nothing at a boarding-house at Gosford, was it then conveyed to Farum Gratis, and being there, and lying on the bed of the good old lady her entertainer, the dear girl took occasion to rip open the mattress and steal a cash-box, with which she fled to London. How would you account for the prodigious benevolence exercised towards the interesting young French lady? Was it her jetty ringlets, or her charming face? Bah! Do ladies love others for having faces and black hair? She said she was a relation of the Saugrenu, talked of her ladyship around, and of herself as the Saugrenu. The honest boarding-house people were at her feet at once. Good, honest, simple, lord-loving children of Snobland. Finally, there was a case of the right honourable Mr. Vernon at York. The right honourable was the son of a nobleman, and practised on an old lady. He procured from her dinners, money, wearing apparel, spoons, implicit credence, and an entire refit of linen. Then he cast his nets over a family of father, mother, and daughters, one of whom he proposed to marry. The father lent him money, the mother made jams and pickles for him, the daughters vied with each other in cooking dinners for the right honourable. At what was the end, one day the traitor fled, with a teapot and a basket full of cold victuals. It was a right honourable which baited the hook which gorged all these greedy simple snobs. Would they have been taken in by a commoner? What old lady is there, my dear sir, 
who would take in you and me, were we ever so ill to do and comfort us and clothe us, and give us her money and her silver forks? Alas and alas! What mortal man that speaks the truth can hope for such a landlady? And yet all these instances of fond and credulous snobbishness have occurred in the same week's paper with who knows how many score more. Just as we had concluded the above remarks, comes a pretty little note, sealed with a pretty little butterfly, bearing a northern postmark, and to the following effect. Nineteenth of November. Mr. Punch, taking great interest in your snob papers, we are very anxious to know under what class of that respectable fraternity you would designate us. We are three sisters, from seventeen to twenty-two. Our father is honestly and truly of a very good family. You will say it is snobbish to mention that, but I wish to state the plain fact. Our maternal grandfather was an earl. Note 1. The introduction of grandpapa is, I fear, snobbish. We can afford to take in a stamped edition of you and all Dickens' works, as fast as they come, but we do not keep such a thing as a peerage, or even a baronetage, in the house. We live with every comfort, excellent cellar, etc., etc. But as we cannot well afford a butler, we have a knee table made, though our father was a military man, has travelled much, been in the best society, etc. We have a coachman and helper, but we don't put the latter into buttons, nor make them wait at table, like stripes and tummers. No, too. That is, as you like. I don't object to buttons and moderations. We are just the same to persons who with a handle to their name as to those without it. We wear a moderate modicum of crinoline. Note 3. Quite right. And are never limp. Note 4. Bless you. In the morning. We have good and abundant dinners on China, though we have played. Note 5 snobbish, and I doubt whether you ought to dine as well alone as with company. You will be getting two good dinners. And just as good when alone as with company. Now, my dear Mr. Punch, will you please give us a short answer in your next number, and I will be so much obliged to you. Nobody knows who are writing to you, not even our father. Nor will we ever tease. Note 6. We like to be teased, but tell Papa. You again, if you will only give us an answer. Just for fun. Now do. If you get as far as this, which is doubtful, you will probably fling it into the fire. If you do, I cannot help it. But I am of a sanguine disposition, and entertain a lingering hope. At all events, I shall be impatient for next Sunday, for you reach us on that day, and I am ashamed to confess we cannot resist opening you in the carriage driving home from church. Note 7. O oh, goddess and stars, what will Captain Gordon and Exeter Hall say to this? I remain, etc., etc., for myself and sisters. Excuse this scrawl, but I always write headlong. Note 8. Dear little enthusiast. P.S. You were rather stupid last week, don't you think? Note 9. You were never more mistaken as in your life. We keep no gamekeeper, and yet have always abundant game for friends to shoot in spite of the poachers. We never write on perfumed paper. In short, I can't help thinking that if you knew us, you would not think us snobs. To this I reply in the following manner. My dear young ladies, I know your post-town, and shall be at church if there the Sunday after next. When will you please to wear a tulip or some little trifle in your bonnets, so that I may know you? You will recognize me and my dress, a quiet-looking young fellow, in a white top coat, a crimson satin neckcloth, light blue trousers, with glossy tip boots, and an emerald breastpin. I shall have a black crape around my white head, and my usual bamboo cane with a richly gilt knob. I am sorry there will be no time to get up moustaches between now and next week. From seventeen to two and twenty, you gods, what ages, dear young creatures, I can see you all three. Seventeen suits me, as near as my own time of life, but mind I don't say two and twenty is too old. 
No, no, and that pretty roguish, demure middle one. Peace, peace, thou silly little fluttering heart. You snobs, dear young ladies, I will pull any man's nose who says so. There is no harm in being of a good family. You can't help it, poor dears. What's in a name? What's in a handle to it? I confess openly that I should not object to being a duke myself, and between ourselves you might see worse leg for a garter. You snobs, dear little good-natured things. No, that is, I hope not. I think not. I won't be too confident. None of us should be, that we are not snobs. That very confidence savours of arrogance, and to be arrogant is to be a snob. In all the social gradations from sneak to tyrant, nature has placed a most wondrous and various progeny of snobs. But are there no kindly natures, no tender hearts, no souls humble, simple, and truth-loving? Ponder well on this question, sweet young ladies. And if you can answer it, as no doubt you can, lucky are you, and lucky the respected Herr Papa, and lucky the three handsome young gentlemen who are about to become each other's brothers-in-law. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 33 of The Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 33 Snobs and Marriage. Everybody of the middle rank who walks through this life with a sympathy for his companions on the same journey, at any rate every man who has been jostling in the world for some three or four lustres, must make no end of melancholy reflections upon the fate of those victims whom society, that is, snobbishness, is immolating every day. With love and simplicity and natural kindness, snobbishness is perpetually at war. People dare not be happy for fear of snobs. People dare not love for fear of snobs. People pine away lonely under the tyranny of snobs. Honest, kindly hearts dry up and die. Gallant, generous lads, blooming with hearty youth, swell into bloated old bachelorhood and burst and tumble over. Tender girls wither into shrunken decay, and perish solitary, from whom snobbishness has cut off the common claim to happiness and affection with which nature endowed us all. My heart grows sad as I see the blundering tyrant's handiwork. As I behold it, I swell with cheap rage, and glow with fury against the snob. Come down, I say, thou skulking dullness! Come down, thou stupid bully, and give up thy brutal ghost. And I arm myself with the sword and spear, and, taking leave of my family, go forth to do battle with that hideous ogre and giant, that brutal despot in snob castle, who holds so many gentle hearts in torture and thrall. When Punch is king, I declare there shall be no such thing as old maids and old bachelors. The Reverend Mr. Malthus shall be burned annually instead of Guy Fawkes. Those who don't marry shall go into the workhouse. It shall be a sin for the poorest not to have a pretty girl to love him. The above reflections came to mind after taking a walk with an old comrade, Jack Spigot by name, who is just passing into the state of old bachelorhood, after the manly and blooming youth in which I remember him. Jack was one of the handsomest fellows in England when we entered together in the Highland Buffs, but I quitted the cutty kilts early and lost sight of him for many years. Ah, how changed he is from those days! He wears a waistband now, and has begun to dye his whiskers. His cheeks, which were red, are now mottled. His eyes, once so bright and steadfast, are the colour of peeled plover's eggs. 
"'Are you married, Jack?' says I, remembering how consumedly in love he was with his cousin Letty Lovelace when the cutty-kilts were quartered at Strathbungo some twenty years ago. "'Married? No,' says he. "'Not money enough. Hard enough to keep myself much more a family on five hundred a year. Come to Dickinson's. There's some of the best Madeira in London there, my boy.' So we went, and talked over old times. The bill for dinner and wine consumed was prodigious, and the quantity of brandy and water that Jack took showed what a regular boozer he was. "'A guinea or two guineas! What the devil do I care what I spend for my dinner?' says he. "'And Letty Lovelace?' says I. Jack's countenance fell. However, he burst into a loud laugh presently. "'Ha! Letty Lovelace!' says he. "'She's Letty Lovelace still, but, gad, such a wizened old woman! She's as thin as a thread-paper. You remember what a figure she had. Her nose has got red, and her teeth blue. She's always ill, always quarrelling with the rest of the family, always psalm-singing, and always taking pills. Gad, I had a rare escape there!' Push round the grog, old boy. Straightway memory went back to the days when Letty was the loveliest of blooming young creatures. When to hear her sing was to make the heart jump into your throat. When to see her dance was better than Montessu or Noble, they were the ballet queens of those days. When Jack used to wear a locket of her hair with a little gold chain round his neck. And, exhilarated with Toddy, after a sederant of the cutty-kilt mess, used to pull out this token, and kiss it, and howl about it, to the great amusement of the bottle-nosed old major, and the rest of the table. "'My father and hers couldn't put their horses together,' Jack said. "'The general wouldn't come down with more than six thousand. My governor said it shouldn't be done under eight. Lovelace told him to go and be hanged, and so we parted company.' They said she was in a decline. Gammon, she's forty, and as tough and as sour as this bitter lemon peel. Don't put much into your punch, Snob, my boy. No man can stand punch after wine. And what are your pursuits, Jack? says I. Sold out when the governor died. Mother lives at Bath. Go down there once a year for a week. Dreadful slow. Shilling whist. Four sisters, all unmarried except the youngest. Awful work. Scotland in August. Italy in the winter. Cursed rheumatism. Come to London in March and toddle about at the club, old boy. And we won't go home till morning, till daylight does appear. And here's the wreck of two lives, mused the present snobographer, after taking leave of Jack Spigot. Pretty merry Letty Lovelace's rudder lost, and she cast away, and handsome Jack Spigot stranded on the shore like a drunken trinculo. What was it that insulted nature, to use no higher name, and perverted her kindly intentions towards them? What cursed frost was it that nipped the love that both were bearing, and condemned the girl to sour sterility, and the lad to selfish old bachelorhood. It was the infernal snob tyrant who governs us all, who says, Thou shalt not love without a lady's maid, thou shalt not marry without a carriage and horses, thou shalt have no wife in thy heart, and no children on thy knee, without a page in buttons, and a French bon. Thou shalt go to the devil unless thou has a broom, marry poor, and society shall forsake thee. Thy kinsmen shall avoid thee as a criminal, thy aunts and uncles shall turn up their eyes and bemoan the sad, sad manner in which Tom or Harry has thrown himself away. You, young woman, may sell yourself without shame and marry old Croesus. You, young man, may lie away your heart and your life for a jointure. But if you are poor, 
Woe be to you! Society, the brutal snob autocrat, consigns you to solitary perdition. Wither, poor girl, in your garret. Rot, poor bachelor, in your club. When I see those graceless recluses, those unnatural monks and nuns of the order of St. Beelzebub, my hatred for snobs and their worship and their idols passes all continents. Let us hew down that man-eating juggernaut, I say, that hideous Dagon. And I glow with the heroic courage of Tom Thumb, and join battle with the giant snob. Footnote. This, of course, is understood to apply only to those unmarried persons whom a mean and snobbish fear about money has kept from fulfilling their natural destiny. Many persons there are devoted to celibacy because they cannot help it. Of these a man would be a brute who spoke roughly. Indeed, after Miss O'Toole's conduct to the writer, he would be the last to condemn. But never mind. These are personal matters. End of footnote. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 34 of The Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 34. Snobs and Marriage. In that noble romance called Ten Thousand a Year, I remember a profoundly pathetic description of the Christian manner in which the hero, Mr. Aubrey, bore his misfortunes. After making a display of the most florid and grandiloquent resignation, and quitting his country mansion, the writer supposes Aubrey to come to town in a post-chaise and pair, sitting bodkin, probably, between his wife and sister. It is about seven o'clock, carriages are rattling about, knockers are thundering, and tears bedim the fine eyes of Kate and Mrs. Aubrey, as they think that in happier times at this hour their Aubrey used formerly to go out to dinner to the houses of the aristocracy, his friends. This is the gist of the passage, the elegant words I forget, but the noble, noble sentiment I shall always cherish and remember. What can be more sublime than the notion of a great man's relatives in tears about his dinner? With a few touches, what author ever more happily described a snob? We were reading the passage lately at the house of my friend Raymond Gray, Esquire, barrister at law, an ingenuous youth without the least practice, but who has, luckily, a great share of good spirits, which enables him to bide his time, and bear laughingly his humble position in the world. Meanwhile, until it is altered, the stern laws of necessity and the expenses of the northern circuit oblige Mr. Gray to live in a very tiny mansion, in a very queer small square, in the airy neighbourhood of Gray's Inn Lane. What is the more remarkable is that Gray has a wife there. Mrs. Gray was a Miss Harley Baker, and I suppose I need not say that is a respectable family. Allied to the Cavendishes, the Oxfords, the Marybones, they still, though rather déchu from their original splendour, hold their heads as high as any. Mrs. Harley Baker, I know, never goes to church without John behind to carry her prayer-book. Nor will Miss Welbeck, her sister, walk twenty yards a-shopping without the protection of Figby, her sugar-loaf page, though the old lady is as ugly as any woman in the parish, and as tall and whiskery as a grenadier. The astonishment is how Emily Harley Baker could have stooped to marry Raymond Gray. She, who was the prettiest and proudest of the family, she, 
who refused Sir Cockle Biles of the Bengal service, she who turned up her little nose at Essex Temple, Q.C., and connected with the noble house of Albin, she who had but four thousand pounds pour tout potage to marry a man who had scarcely as much more. A scream of wrath and indignation was uttered by the whole family when they heard of this mesalliance. Mrs. Harley Baker never speaks of her daughter now but with tears in her eyes and as a ruined creature. Miss Welbeck says, I consider that man a villain, and has denounced poor good-natured Mrs. Perkins as a swindler at whose ball the young people met for the first time. Mr. and Mrs. Gray, meanwhile, live in Gray's Inn Lane, aforesaid, with a maid-servant and a nurse, whose hands are very full, and in a most provoking and unnatural state of happiness. They have never once thought of crying about their dinner, like the wretchedly puling and snobbish womankind of my favourite snob, Aubrey, of ten thousand a year but on the contrary, accept such humble victuals as fate awards them, with a most perfect and thankful good grace. Nay, actually have a portion for a hungry friend at times, as the present writer can gratefully testify. I was mentioning these dinners, and some admirable lemon puddings which Mrs. Gray makes, to our mutual friend the great Mr. Goldmore, the East India director when that gentleman's face assumed an expression of almost apoplectic terror, and he gasped out, "'What? Do they give dinners?' He seemed to think it a crime and a wonder that such people should dine at all, and that it was their custom to huddle round their kitchen fire over a bone and a crust. Whenever he meets them in society, it is a matter of wonder to him, and he always expresses his surprise very loud, how the lady can appear decently dressed, and the man have an unpatched coat to his back. I have heard him enlarge upon this poverty before the whole room at the conflagrative club, to which he and I and Gray have the honour to belong. We meet at the club on most days. At half-past four, Goldmore arrives in St. James's Street from the city, and you may see him reading the evening papers in the bow-window of the club, which enfilades Pall Mall, a large plethoric man, with a bunch of seals in a large bow-windowed light waistcoat. He has large coat-tails, stuffed with agents' letters and papers about companies of which he is a director. His seals jingle as he walks. I wish I had such a man for an uncle and that he himself were childless, I would love and cherish him, and be kind to him. At six o'clock in the full season, when all the world is in St. James's Street, and the carriages are cutting in and out among the cabs on the stand, and the tufted dandies are showing their listless faces out of whites, and you see respectable grey-headed gentlemen waggling their heads to each other through the plate-glass windows of Arthur's, and the redcoats wish to be Briarian so as to hold all the gentlemen's horses, and that wonderful red-coated royal porter is sunning himself before Marlborough House, at the noon of London time you see a light yellow carriage with black horses, and a coachman in a tight floss-silk wig, and two footmen in powder and white and yellow liveries, and a large woman inside in shot silk, a poodle, and a pink parasol, which drives up to the gate of the conflagrative, and the page goes and says to Mr. Goldmore, who is perfectly aware of the fact, as he is looking out of the windows with about forty other conflagrative bucks, "'Your carriage, sir!' G. wags his head. "'Remember, eight o'clock precisely,' says he to Mulligatawney, the other East India director, and, ascending the carriage, plumps down by the side of Mrs. Goldmore for a drive in the park, and then home to Portland Place. As the carriage whirls off, all the young bucks in the club feel a secret elation. It is a part of their establishment, as it were. That carriage belongs to their club, 
and their club belongs to them. They follow the equipage with interest. They eye it knowingly as they see it in the park. But halt, we are not come to the club snobs yet. Oh, my brave snobs, what a flurry there will be among you when those papers appear! Well, you may judge from the above description what sort of a man Goldmore is. A dull and pompous Leadenhall Street Croesus, good-natured withal and affable, cruelly affable. Mr. Goldmore can never forget, his lady used to say, that it was Mrs. Gray's grandfather who sent him to India, and though that young woman has made the most imprudent marriage in the world, and has left her station in society, her husband seems an ingenious and laborious young man, and we shall do everything in our power to be of use to him. So they used to ask the Greys to dinner twice or thrice in a season, when, by way of increasing the kindness, Buff the butler is ordered to hire a fly to convey them to and from Portland Place. Of course I am much too good-natured a friend of both parties not to tell Gray of Goldmore's opinion in him, and the nabob's astonishment at the idea of the briefless barrister having any dinner at all. Indeed, Goldmore's saying became a joke against Gray amongst us wags at the club, and we used to ask him when he tasted meat last, whether we should bring him home something from dinner, and cut a thousand other mad pranks with him in our facetious way. One day, then, coming home from the club, Mr. Gray conveyed to his wife the astounding information that he had asked Goldmore to dinner. "'My love!' says Mrs. Gray, in a tremor. "'How could you be so cruel? Why, the dining-room won't hold, Mrs. Goldmore!' "'Make your mind easy, Mrs. Gray. Her ladyship is in Paris. It is only Croesus that's coming.' and we are going to the play afterwards, to Sadler's Wells. Goldmore said at the club that he thought Shakespeare was a great dramatic poet, and ought to be patronised, whereupon, fired with enthusiasm, I invited him to our banquet. "'Goodness gracious! What can we give him for dinner? He has two French cooks. You know Mrs. Goldmore is always telling us about them, and he dines with aldermen every day.' "'A plain leg of mutton, my Lucy, I prithee get ready at three. Have it tender and smoking and juicy. And what better meat can there be?' says Gray, quoting my favourite poet. "'But the cook is ill, and you know that horrible patty-pan the pastry-cook's—' "'Silence, foul!' says Gray, in a deep tragedy voice. "'I will have the ordering of this repast. Do all things as I bid thee. Invite our friend Snob here to partake of the feast. Be mine the task of procuring it. Don't be expensive, Raymond, says his wife. Peace, thou timid partner of the briefless one. Goldmore's dinner shall be suited to our narrow means. Only do thou in all things my commands and seeing by the peculiar expression of the rogue's countenance that some mad waggery was in preparation, I awaited the morrow with anxiety. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter thirty five of the Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Stearns. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter thirty five. Punctual to the hour, by the way, I cannot omit to mark down my hatred, scorn, and indignation towards those miserable snobs who come to dinner at nine when they are asked at eight, in order to make a sensation in the company, being the loathing of honest folks, the backbiting of others, the curses of cooks, 
pursue these wretches, and avenge the society on which they trample. Punctual, I say, to the hour of five, which Mr. and Mrs. Raymond Gray had appointed, a youth of an elegant appearance, in a neat evening dress, whose trim whiskers indicated neatness, whose light step denoted activity, for, in sooth, he was hungry, and always is at the dinner hour, whatsoever the hour may be, and whose rich golden hair, curling down his shoulders, was set off by a perfectly new four-and-nine-penny silk hat, was seen wending his way down Biddlestone Street, Biddlestone Square, Gray's Inn. The person in question, I need not say, was Mr. Snob. He was never late when invited to dine. But to proceed my narrative, Mr. Snob may have flattered himself that he made a sensation as he started down Biddlestone with his richly gilt, knobbed cane, and, indeed, I vow I saw heads looking at me from Mrs. Squilby's, the brass-plated milliner opposite Raymond Gray's, who has three silver paper bonnets and two fly-blown prints of fashion in the window. Yet what was the emotion produced by my arrival compared to that which the little street thrilled, when at five minutes past five the floss-wigged coachman, the yellow hammer-cloth and flunkies, the black horses and blazing silver harness of Mr. Goldmore whirled down the street. It is a very little street, of very little houses, most of them with very large brass plates like Miss Squilby's, coal merchants, architects and surveyors, two surgeons, a solicitor, a dancing master, and, of course, several house agents occupy the houses, little two-storied edifices with little stucco porticos. Goldmore's carriage overtopped the roofs almost. The first floors might shake hands with Croesus as he lolled inside. All the windows of those first floors thronged with children and women in a twinkling. There was Mrs. Hammerley in curl papers, Mrs. Saxby with a front awry, Mr. Riggles peering through the gauze curtains, holding the while his hot glass of rum and water. In fine, a tremendous commotion in Biddlestone Street, as the Goldmore carriage drove up to Mr. Raymond Gray's door. "'How kind it is of him to come with both the footmen,' said little Mrs. Gray, peeping at the vehicle too. The huge domestic descending from his perch gave a rap at the door, which almost drove in the building. All the heads were out. The sun was shining, the very organ-boy paused. The footman, the coach, and Goldmore's red face and white waistcoat were blazing in splendor. The Herculean plushed one went back to open the carriage door. Raymond Gray opened his, in his shirt-sleeves. He ran up to the carriage. "'Come in, Goldmore,' says he. "'Just in time, my boy. Open the door, what do you call him, and let your master out.' And what do you call him, obeyed mechanically, with a face of wonder and horror, only to be equalled by the look of stupefied astonishment which ornamented the purple countenance of his master. "'What tame will you please have the cage, sir?' says what do you call him, in that peculiar, unspellable, inimitable, flunkified pronunciation, which forms one of the chief charms of existence. Best have it to the theatre at night. Gray exclaims, it is but a step from here to the wells, and we can walk there. I've got tickets for all. Be at Sadler's Wells at eleven. Yes, at eleven, exclaims Gordmore, perturbedly, and walks with a flurried step into the house, as if he were going to execution. As indeed he was, with that wicked grey as a jack catch over him. The carriage drove away, followed by numberless eyes from doorsteps and balconies. Its appearance is still a wonder in Biddlestone Street. "'Go in there and amuse yourself with Snob,' says Grey, open the little drawing-room door. "'I'll call out as soon as the chops are ready. Fanny's below, seeing to the pudding.' "'Gracious mercy,' said Goldmore to me, quite confidentially. "'How could he ask us?' I really had no idea of this, this utter destitution. "'Dinner! Dinner!' roars out Gray, from the dining-room, whence issued a great smoking and frying, and entering that apartment we find Mrs. Gray ready to receive us, and looking perfectly like a princess who, by some accident, had a bowl of potatoes in her hand, which vegetables she placed on the table. Her husband was meanwhile cooking mutton-chops on a gridiron over the fire." "'Fanny has made the roly-poly pudding,' says he. "'The chops are my part. "'Here's a fine one. "'Try this, Goldmore.' "'And he popped a fizzling cutlet on that gentleman's plate. "'What words, 
What notes of exclamation can describe than a Bob's astonishment? The tablecloth was a very old one, darned in a score places. There was mustard in a teacup, a silver fork for Goldmore. All ours were ironed. I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth, says Gray, gravely. That fork is the only one we have. Fanny has it generally. Raymond, cries Mrs. Gray, with an imploring face. She was used to better things, you know, and I hope one day to get her a dinner service. I am told the electroplate is uncommonly good. Where the deuce is that boy with the beer? And now, said he, springing up, I'll be a gentleman. And so he put on his coat, and sat down quite gravely, with four fresh mutton chops, which he had by this time broiled. We don't have meat every day, Mr. Goldmore, he continued, and it's a treat to me to get a dinner like this. You little know, you gentlemen of England, who live at home at ease, what hardships briefless barristers endure. Gracious mercy, said Mr. Goldmore. Where's the half and half? Fanny, go over to the keys and get the beer. Here's sixpence. And what was our astonishment when Fanny got up as if to go? Gracious mercy, let me, cries Goldmore. Not for worlds, my dear sir. She's used to it. They wouldn't serve you as well as they serve her. Leave her alone. La bless you, Raymond said, with astounding composure. And Mrs. Gray left the room, and actually came back with a tray on which there was a pewter flagon of beer. Little Polly, to whom, at her christening, I had the honour of presenting a silver mug ex officio. Followed with a couple of tobacco pipes, and the queerest roguish look in her round little chubby face. "'Did you speak to Tapling about the gin, Fanny, my dear?' Gray asked, after bidding Polly put the pipes on the chimney-piece, which that little person had some difficulty in reaching. The last was turpentine, and even your brewing didn't make good punch of it. You would hardly suspect, Goldmore, that my wife, a Harley Baker, would ever make gin punch? I think my mother-in-law would commit suicide if she saw her. Don't always be laughing at Mama, Raymond, said Mrs. Gray. Well, well, she wouldn't die, and I don't wish she would. And you don't make gin punch, and you don't like it either. And, Goldmore, do you drink your beer out of the glass or out of the pewter? Gracious mercy! ejaculates Cocious once more, as little Polly, taking the pot with both her little bunches of hands, offers it, smiling, to that astonished director. And so, in a word, the dinner commenced, and was presently ended in a similar fashion. Gray pursued his unfortunate guest with the most queer and outrageous description of his struggles, misery, and poverty. He described how he cleaned the knives when they were first married, and how he used to drag the children in a little cart, how his wife would toss pancakes, and what parts of his dress she made. He told Tibbets his clerk, who was in fact the functionary, who had brought the beer from the public house, which Mrs. Fanny had fetched from the neighbouring apartment, to fetch the bottle of port wine, when the dinner was over, and told Goldmore, as wonderful a history, about the way in which that bottle of wine had come into his hands as any of his former stories had been. When the repast was all over, and it was near time to move to the play, and Mrs. Gray had retired, and we were sitting ruminating, rather silently, over the last glasses of the port, Grace suddenly breaks the silence by slapping Goldmore on the shoulder and saying, "'Now, Goldmore, tell me something.' "'What?' asks Crocious. "'Haven't you had a good dinner?' Goldmore started, as if a sudden truth had just dawned upon him. He had had a good dinner, and didn't know it until then. The three mutton chops consumed by him were best of the mutton kind. The potatoes were perfect of their order. As for the roly-poly, it was too good.' The porter was frothy and cool, and the port wine was worthy of the guilds of a bishop. I speak with ulterior views, for there is more in Gray's cellar. Well, says Goldmore, after a pause, during which he took time to consider the momentous question Gray put to him. Upon my word, now you say so, I—I I have. I really have had a monstrous good dinner. Monstrous good. Upon my word. Here's your health, Gray, my boy, and your amiable lady— and when Mrs. Goldmore comes back, I hope we shall see you more in Portland Place. And with this the time came for the play, and we went to see Mr. Phelps at Sadler's Wells. The best of this story, for the truth of every word of which I pledge my honour, is, that after this banquet, which Goldmore enjoyed so, the honest fellow felt a prodigious compassion and regard for the starving and miserable giver of the feast, and determined to help him in his profession, 
and being a director of the newly established Antibilious Life Assurance Company, he has had Gray appointed standing counsel with a pretty annual fee, and only yesterday, in an appeal from Bombay, Bakmiji Bamaji versus Ramchatter Bahadur, in the Privy Council, Lord Brougham complimented Mr. Gray, who was in the case, on his curious and exact knowledge of the Sanskrit language. Whether he knows Sanskrit or not, I can't say. But Goldmore got him the business, and so I cannot help having a lurking regard for that pompous old bigwig. End of chapter 35 Recording by Jennifer Stearns This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 36 of The Book of Snobs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Stearns The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 36. Snobs and Marriage. We bachelors and clubs are very much obliged to you, says my old school and college companion, Essex Temple, for the opinion which you hold of us. You call us selfish, purple-faced, bloated, and other pretty names. You state, in the simplest possible terms, that we shall go to the deuce. You bid us rot in loneliness, and deny us all claims to honesty, conduct, decent Christian life. Who are you, Mr. Snob, to judge us? Who are you, with your infernal benevolent smirk and grin, that laugh at all our generation? I will tell you my case, says Essex Temple, mine and my sister Polly's, and you make what you like of it, and sneer at old maids and bully old bachelors, if you will. I will whisper to you confidentially that my sister was engaged to Sergeant Sturker, a fellow whose talents one cannot deny, and be hanged to them, but whom I have always known to be mean, selfish, and a prig. However, women don't see these faults in the men whom love throws in their way. Shirker, who has about as much warmth as an eel, made up to Polly years and years ago, and was no bad match for a briefless barrister, as he was then. Have you ever read Lord Eldon's Life? Do you remember how this sordid old snob narrates his going out to purchase two pence worth of sprats, which he and Mrs. Scott fried between them, and how he parades his humility, and exhibits his miserable poverty, he who, at that time, must have been making a thousand pounds a year? Well, Shirker was just as proud of his prudence, just as thankful for his own meanness, and, of course, would not marry without a competency. Who so honourable? Polly waited, and waited faintly, from year to year. He wasn't sick at heart. His passion never disturbed his six hours sleep, or kept his ambition out of mind. He would rather have hugged an attorney any day than have kissed Polly, though she was one of the prettiest creatures in the world. And while she was pining alone upstairs, reading over the stock of half a dozen frigid letters that the confounded prig had consented to write to her, he, be sure, was never busy with anything but his briefs in chambers, always frigid, rigid, self-satisfied, and at his duty. The marriage trailed on year after year, while Mr. Sergeant Shirker grew to be the famous lawyer he is. Meanwhile, my younger brother, Pump Temple, who was in the 120th Hussars, and had the same little patrimony which fell to the lot of myself and Polly, must fall in love with our cousin, Fanny Figtree, and marry her out of hand. You should have seen the wedding, six bridesmaids in pink, to hold the fan, bouquet, gloves, scent bottle, and pocket handkerchief of the bride, basketfuls of white favors in the vestry, to be pinned on the footmen and horses, a genteel congregation of curious acquaintance in the pews, a shabby one of poor on the steps, all the carriages of our acquaintance, whom Aunt Figtree had levied for the occasion, and, of course, four horses from Mr. Pump's bridal vehicle. Then comes the breakfast, or déjeuner, if you please, with a brass band in the street, and policemen, to keep order. The happy bridegroom spends about a year's income in dresses for the bridesmaids and pretty presents, 
and the bride must have a trousseau of laces, satins, jewel-boxes, and tomfoolery, to make her fit to be a lieutenant's wife. There was no hesitation about pump. He flung about his money as if he had been dross. And Mrs. P. Temple, on the horse Tom Tiddler, which her husband gave her, was the most dashing of military women at Brighton or Dublin. How old Mrs. Figtree used to bore me and Polly with stories of Pump's grandeur and the noble company he kept. Polly lives with the fig trees, as I am not rich enough to keep a home for her. Pump and I have always been rather distant. Not having the slightest notions about horse flesh, he has a natural contempt for me. And in our mother's lifetime, when the good old lady was always paying his debts and petting him, I'm not sure there was not a little jealousy. It used to be Polly that kept the peace between us. She went to Dublin to visit Pump, and brought back grand accounts of his doings, gayest man about town, aide de camp to the Lord Lieutenant. Fanny admired everywhere, her excellency godmother to the second boy, the eldest with a string of aristocratic Christian names that made the grandmother wild with delight. Presently Fanny and Pump obligingly came to London, where the third was born. Polly was godmother to this, and who so loving as she and Pump now? Oh, Essex, says she to me, he is so good, so generous, so fond of his family, so handsome. Who can help loving him, and pardoning his little errors? One day, while Mrs. Pump was yet in the upper regions, and Dr. Fingerfree's brougham at her door every day, having business at Guildhall, whom should I meet in Cheapside but Pump and Polly? The poor girl looked more happy and rosy than I have seen her these twelve years. Pump, on the contrary, was rather blushing and embarrassed. I couldn't be mistaken in her face and its look of mischief and triumph. She had been committing some act of sacrifice. I went to the family stockbroker. She had sold out two thousand pounds that morning and given them to Pump. Quarrelling was useless. Pump had the money. He was off to Dublin by the time I reached his mother's, and Polly radiant still. He was going to make his fortune. He was going to embark the money in the bog of Allen. I don't know what. The fact is, he was going over to pay his losses upon the last Manchester steeplechase, and I leave you to imagine how much principal or interest poor Polly ever saw back again. It was more than half her fortune, and he has had another thousand cents from her. Then came efforts to stave off ruin and prevent exposure. Struggles on all our parts, and sacrifices that. Here Mr. Essex Temple began to hesitate. That needn't be talked of, but they are of no more use than such sacrifices ever are. Pump and his wife are abroad. I don't like to ask where. Polly has the three children, and Mr. Sergeant Shirker has formally written to break off an engagement, on the conclusion of which Miss Temple must herself have speculated when she alienated the greater part of her fortune. And here's your famous theory of poor marriages, Essex Temple cries, concluding the above history. How do you know that I don't want to marry myself? How do you dare sneer at my poor sister? What are we but martyrs of the reckless marriage system which Mr. Snob, forsooth, chooses to advocate? And he thought he had the better of the argument, which, strange to say, is not my opinion. But for the infernal snob worship— might not every one of these people be happy? If poor Polly's happiness lay in linking her tender arms around such a heartless prig as a sneak who has deceived her, she might have been happy now, as happy as Raymond Raymond in the ballad, with the stone statue by his side. She is wretched, because Mr. Sergeant Shirker worships money and ambition, and is a snob and a coward. If the unfortunate Pump Temple and his giddy hussy of a wife have ruined themselves, and drag down others into their calamity, it is because they loved rank, and horses, and plate, and carriages, and court guides, and millinery, and would sacrifice all to attain those objects. And who misguides them? If the world were more simple, would not these foolish people follow the fashion? Does not the world love court guides, and millinery, and plate, and carriages? Mercy on us! Read the fashionable intelligence. Read the court circular. Read the genteel novels, survey mankind, from Pimlico to Red Lion Square, and see how the poor snob is aping the rich snob, how the mean snob is groveling at the feet of the proud snob, and the great snob is lording it over his humble brother. 
Does the idea of equality ever enter Dives' head? Will it ever? Will the Duchess of Fitzbattle Axe, I like a good name, ever believe that Lady Crushes, her next-door neighbour, in Belgrave Square, is as good a lady as her grace? Will Lady Croesus ever leave off pining the Duchess's parties, and cease patronizing Mrs. Broadcloth, whose husband has not got his baronetcy yet? Will Mrs. Broadcloth ever heartily shake hands with Mrs. Seedy, and give up those odious calculations about poor dear Mrs. Seedy's income? Will Mrs. Seedy, who is starving in her great house, go and live comfortably in a little one, or in lodgings? Will her landlady, Miss Letsom, ever stop wondering at the familiarity of tradespeople, or rebuking the insolence of Suki, the maid, who wears flowers under her bonnet like a lady? But why hope? Why wish for such times? Do I wish all snobs to perish? Do I wish these snobs' papers to determine? Suicidal fool, art not thou, too, a snob and a brother? End of chapter 36 Recording by Jennifer Stearns, Concord, New Hampshire This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 37 of The Book of Snobs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dennis Sayers the Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray Chapter 37 Club Snobs As I wish to be particularly agreeable to the ladies, to whom I make my most humble obeisance, we will now, if you please, commence maligning a class of snobs, against whom, I believe, most female minds are embittered. I mean club snobs. I have seldom heard even the most gentle and placable woman speak without a little feeling of bitterness against those social institutions, those palaces swaggering in St. James, which are open to the men, while the ladies have but their dingy three-windowed brick boxes in Belgravia, or in Paddingtonia, or in the region between the road of Edgware and that of Gray's Inn. In my grandfather's time it used to be Freemasonry that roused their anger. It was my great-aunt, whose portrait we still have in the family, who got into the clock-case at the Royal Rosicrucian Lodge at Bungay, Suffolk to spy the proceedings of the society of which her husband was a member, and, being frightened by the sudden whirring and striking eleven of the clock, just as the deputy grand master was bringing in the mystic gridiron for the reception of a neophyte, rushed out into the midst of the lodge assembled, and was elected by a desperate unanimity deputy grand mistress for life though that admirable and courageous female never subsequently breathed a word with regard to the secrets of the initiation yet she inspired all our family with such a terror regarding the mysteries of j chen and boaz that none of our family have ever since joined the society or worn the dreadful Masonic insignia. It is known that Orpheus was torn to pieces by some justly indignant Thracian ladies for belonging to an harmonic lodge. Let him go back to Eurydice, they said, whom he is pretending to regret so. But the history is given in Dr. Lemprier's elegant dictionary in a manner much more forcible than any this feeble pen can attempt. At once, then, and without verbiage, let us take up this subject matter 
of clubs. Clubs ought not, in my mind, to be permitted to bachelors. If my friend of the cuddy kilts had not our club, the Union Jack, to go to, I belong to the UJ and nine other similar institutions, who knows but he never would be a bachelor at this present moment. Instead of being made comfortable and cockered up with every luxury as they are at clubs, bachelors ought to be rendered profoundly miserable, in my opinion. Every encouragement should be given to the rendering their spare time disagreeable. There can be no more odious object, according to my sentiments, than young Smith in the pride of health, commanding his dinner of three courses, than middle-aged Jones, wallowing, as I may say, in an easy padded armchair over the delicious novel or brilliant magazine, or than old Brown, that selfish old reprobate, for whom mere literature has no charms, stretched on the best sofa, sitting on the second edition of the Times, having the morning chronicle between his knees, the herald pushed in between his coat and waistcoat, the standard under his arm, the globe under the other opinion, and the daily news in perusal. I'll trouble you for punch, Mr. Wiggins, says the unconscionable old gormandizer, interrupting our friend, who is laughing over the periodical in question. This kind of selfishness ought not to be. No, no. Young Smith, instead of his dinner and his wine, ought to be where? At the festive tea-table, to be sure, by the side of Miss Higgs, sipping the boia or tasting the harmless muffin, while old Mrs. Higgs looks on, pleased at their innocent dalliance, and my friend Miss Wirt, the governess, is performing Thalberg's last sonata in treble X, totally unheeded, at the piano. Where should the middle-aged Jones be? At his time of life, he ought to be the father of a family. At such an hour, say at nine o'clock at night, the nursery bell should have just rung the children to bed. He and Mrs. J. ought to be, by rights, seated on each side of the fire by the dining-room table, a bottle of port wine between them, not so full as it was an hour since. Mrs. J. has had two glasses. Mrs. Grumble, Jones' mother-in-law, has had three. Jones himself has finished the rest, and dozes comfortably until bedtime. And Brown, that old newspaper-devouring miscreant, what right has he at a club at a decent hour of night? He ought to be playing his rubber with Miss Mechwerter, his wife, and the family apothecary. His candle ought to be brought to him at ten o'clock, and he should retire to rest just as the young people were thinking of a dance. How much finer, simpler, nobler are the several employments I have sketched out for these gentlemen than their present nightly orgies at this horrid club. And, ladies, think of men who do not merely frequent the dining-room and library, but who use other apartments of those horrible dens which it is my purpose to batter down. Think of Cannon, the wretch, with his coat off, at his age and size, clattering the balls over the billiard-table all night, and making bets with that odious Captain Spot. Think of Pam in a dark room with Bob Trumper, Jack Deuceace, and Charlie Vole, playing the poor dear misguided wretch, guinea points and five pounds on the rubber. Above all, think, 
Oh, think of that den of abomination which I am told has been established in some clubs called the smoking room. Think of the debauchees who congregate there, the quantities of reeking whiskey punch, or more dangerous sherry cobbler which they consume. Think of them coming home at cock crow and letting themselves into the quiet house with the chub key. Think of them, the hypocrites, taking off their insidious boots before they slink upstairs, the children sleeping overhead, the wife of their bosom, alone with the waning rushlight in the two-pair front, the chamber so soon to be rendered hateful by the smell of their stale cigars. I am not an advocate of violence. I am not by nature of an incendiary turn of mind. But, if, my dear ladies, you are for assassinating Mr. Chubb and burning down clubhouses in St. James, there is one snob who will not think the worse of you. The only men who, as I opine, ought to be allowed the use of clubs, are married men without a profession. The continual presence of these in a house cannot be thought, even by the most loving of wives, desirable. Say the girls are beginning to practice their music, which in an honourable English family ought to occupy every young gentlewoman three hours. It would be rather hard to call upon poor papa to sit in the drawing-room all that time and listen to the interminable discords and shrieks which are elicited from the miserable piano during the above necessary operation. A man with a good ear, especially, would go mad if compelled daily to submit to this horror. Or suppose you have a fancy to go to the milliners, or to Howell and James. It is manifest, my dear madam, that your husband is much better at the club during these operations than by your side in the carriage or perched in wonder upon one of the stools at shawl and gimcracks, whilst young counter-dandies are displaying their wares. This sort of husbands should be sent out after breakfast, and, if not members of Parliament, or directors of a railroad or an insurance company, should be put into their clubs, and told to remain there until dinner-time. No sight is more agreeable to my truly regulated mind than to see the noble characters so worthily employed. Whenever I pass by St. James Street, having the privilege, like the rest of the world, of looking in at the windows of blights, or foodles, or snooks, or the great bay at the contemplative club, I behold with respectful appreciation the figures within, the honest, rosy old fogies, the mouldy old dandies, the waist-belts and glossy wigs and tight cravats of those most vacuous and respectable men. Such men are best there during the daytime, surely. When you part with them, dear ladies, think of the rapture consequent on their return. You have transacted your household affairs, you have made your purchases, you have paid your visits, you have aired your poodle in the park, your French maid, has completed the toilette which renders you so ravishingly beautiful by candlelight, and you are fit to make home pleasant to him who has been absent all day. Such men surely ought to have their clubs, and we will not class them among club snobs, therefore, on whom let us reserve our attack for the next chapter. End of chapter 37, read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California.
This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 38 of the Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caroline Shapiro. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 38 Club Snobs. Such a sensation has been created in the clubs by the appearance of the last paper on club snobs as can't but be complimentary to me who am one of their number. I belong to many clubs the Union Jack, the Sash and Marlin Spike, military clubs. The True Blue, the No Surrender, the Blue and Buff, the Guy Fox, and the Cato Street political clubs. The Brummel and the Regent, dandy clubs. The Acropolis, the Palladium, the Areopagus, the Nix, the Pentelicus, the Illicis, and the Polyphloys Biothalassus, literary clubs. I never could make out how the latter set of clubs got their names. I don't know Greek, for one, and I wonder how many other members of those institutions do. Ever since the club snobs have been announced, I observe a sensation created on my entrance into any one of these places. Members get up and hustle together. They nod, they scowl, as they glance towards the present snob. Infernal impudent jackanapes! If he shows me up, says Colonel Bludger, I'll break every bone in his skin. I told you what would come of admitting literary men into the club, says Ranville Ramville to his colleague Spoony of the tape and sealing wax office. These people are very well in their proper places, and as a public man I make a point of shaking hands with them and that sort of thing, but to have one's privacy obtruded upon by such people is really too much. Come along, Spoony, and the pair of prigs retire superciliously. As I came into the coffee-room at the No Surrender, old Jockins was holding out to a knot of men, who were yawning as usual. There he stood, waving the standard, and swaggering before the fire. What, says he, did I tell Peel last year? If you touch the corn laws, you touch the sugar question. If you touch the sugar, you touch the tea. I am no monopolist. I am a liberal man, but I cannot forget that I stand on the brink of a precipice. And if we're to have free trade— Give me reciprocity. And what was Sir Robert Peel's answer to me? Mr. Jockins, he said. Here Jockins' eye suddenly turning on your humble servant. He stopped his sentence with a guilty look. His stale old stupid sentence, which every one of us at the club has heard over and over again. Jockins is a most pertinacious club snob. Every day he is at that fireplace, holding that standard, of which he reads up the leading article and pours it out oro rotundo with the most astonishing composure in the face of his neighbor, who has just read every word of it in the paper. Jockins has money, as you may see by the tie of his neckcloth. He passes the morning swaggering about the city in bankers' and brokers' parlors and says, I spoke with Peel yesterday and his attentions are so-and-so. Graham and I were talking over the matter, and I pledge you my word of honor his opinion coincides with mine, and that what do you call him is the only measure government will venture on trying. By evening paper time he is at the club. I can tell you the opinion of the city, my lord, says he, and the way in which Jones Lloyd looks as it is briefly this. Rothschilds told me so themselves. In Mark Lane people's minds are quite made up. He is considered rather a well-informed man. He lives in Belgravia, of course, in a drab-colored genteel house, and it's everything about him that is properly grave, dismal, and comfortable. His dinners are in the Morning Herald, among the parties for the week, and his wife and daughters make a very handsome appearance at the drawing-room once a year, when he comes down to the club in his deputy lieutenant's uniform. He is fond of beginning a speech to you by saying, When I was in the house, I, etc., in fact, he sat for Skittlebury for three weeks in the first reform parliament, and was unseated for bribery, since which he has three times unsuccessfully contested that honorable borough. Another sort of political snob I have seen at most clubs, and that is the man who does not care so much for home politics, but is great upon foreign affairs. 
I think this sort of man is scarcely found anywhere but in clubs. It is for him the papers provide their foreign articles at the expense of some ten thousand a year each. He is the man who is really seriously uncomfortable about the designs of Russia and the atrocious treachery of Louis Philippe. He it is who expects a French fleet in the Thames and has a constant eye upon the American president, every word of whose speech, goodness help him, he reads. He knows the names of the contending leaders in Portugal and what they are fighting about, and it is he who says that Lord Aberdeen ought to be impeached and Lord Palmerston hanged or vice versa. Lord Palmerston's being sold to Russia, the exact number of rubles paid by what house in the city is a favorite theme with this kind of snob. I once overheard him, it was Captain Spitfire, Royal Navy, who had been refused a ship by the Whigs, by the way, indulging in the following conversation with Mr. Minns after dinner. Why wasn't the Princess Skragamovsky at Lady Palmerston's party, Minns? Because she can't show. Why can't she show? Shall I tell you, Minns, why she can't show? The Princess Skragamovsky's back is flayed alive, Minns. I tell you, it's raw, sir. On Tuesday last, at twelve o'clock, three drummers of the Preobajinsky Regiment arrived at Ashburnham House, and at half-past twelve, in the yellow drawing-room at the Russian Embassy, before the ambassadress and four ladies' maids, the Greek papa and the secretary of embassy, Madame de Skragamovsky, received thirteen dozen. She was knouted, sir, knouted in the midst of England, in Berkeley Square, for having said that the Grand Duchess Olga's hair was red. And now, sir, will you tell me Lord Palmerston ought to continue minister? Minns. Good God! Minns follows Spitfire about and thinks him the greatest and wisest of human beings. End of chapter 38 Recording by Caroline Shapiro, Oakland, California, U.S. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 39 of The Book of Snobs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caroline Shapiro The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray Chapter 39 Club Snobs Why does not some great author write The Mysteries of the Clubhouses, or St. James's Street Unveiled? It would be a fine subject for an imaginative writer. We must all, as boys, remember when we went to the fair and had spent all our money, the sort of awe and anxiety with which we loitered round the outside of the show, speculating upon the nature of the entertainment going on within. Man is a drama of wonder and passion and mystery and meanness and beauty and truthfulness and etc. Each bosom is a booth in Vanity Fair. But let us stop this capital style. I should die if I kept it up for a column. A pretty thing the column all capitals would be, by the way. In a club, though there mayn't be a soul of your acquaintance in the room, you have always the chance of watching strangers, and speculating on what is going on within those tents and curtains of their souls, their coats and waistcoats. This is a never-failing sport. Indeed, I am told there are some clubs in the town where nobody ever speaks to anybody. They sit in the coffee room, quite silent, and watching each other. Yet how little you can tell from a man's outward demeanor. There's a man at our club, large, heavy, middle-aged, gorgeously dressed, rather bald, with lacquered boots and a boa when he goes out. Quiet in demeanor, always ordering and consuming a recherche little dinner whom I have mistaken for Sir John Pocklington any time these five years, and respected as a man with five hundred pounds per diem. And I find he is but a clerk in an office in the city, with not two hundred pounds income, and his name is Jubber. 
Sir John Pocklington was, on the contrary, the dirty little snuffy man who cried out so about the bad quality of the beer, and grumbled at being overcharged three halfpence for a herring, seated at the next table to Jubber on the day when someone pointed the baronet out to me. Take a different sort of mystery. I see, for instance, old Fanny stealing round the rooms of the club, with glassy, meaningless eyes and an endless greasy simper. He fawns on everybody he meets, and shakes hands with you, and blesses you, and betrays the most tender and astonishing interest in your welfare. You know him to be a quack and a rogue, and he knows you know it. But he wriggles on his way and leaves a track of slimy flattery after him wherever he goes. Who can penetrate that man's mystery? What earthly good can he get from you or me? You don't know what is working under that leering tranquil mask. You have only the dim, instinctive repulsion that warns you you are in the presence of a knave. Beyond which fact, all Fanny's soul is a secret to you. I think I like to speculate on the young men best. Their play is opener. You know the cards in their hand, as it were. Take, for example, Messrs. Spaven and Coxpur. A specimen or two of the above sort of young fellows may be found, I believe, at most clubs. They know nobody. They bring a fine smell of cigars into the room with them, and they growl together in a corner about sporting matters. They recollect the history of that short period in which they have been ornaments of the world, by the names of winning horses. As political men talk about the reform year, the year the Whigs went out, and so forth, these young sporting bucks speak of Tarnation's year, or Apodeldoc's year, or the year when Catawampus ran second for the Chester Cup. They play at billiards in the morning, they absorb pale ale for breakfast, and top up with glasses of strong waters. They read Bell's Life, and a very pleasant paper, too, with a great deal of erudition in the answers to correspondence. They go down to Tattersall's and swagger in the park with their hands plunged in the pockets of their paletots. What strikes me especially in the outward demeanor of sporting youth is their amazing gravity, their conciseness of speech, and careworn and moody air. In the smoking room at the Regent, when Joe Millerson will be setting the whole room in a roar with laughter, you hear young Messer Spaven and Coxburgh grumbling together in a corner. I'll take your five and twenty to one about brother to blue nose, whispers Spaven. Can't do it at the price, Coxper says, wagging his head ominously. The betting book is always present in the minds of those unfortunate youngsters. I think I hate that work even more than the peerage. There is some good in the latter, though generally speaking, a vain record. Though de Mogan's is not descended from the giant Hogan Mogan, though half the other genealogies are equally false and foolish, yet the mottoes are good reading, some of them, and the book itself a sort of gold-laced and live and lackey to history, and in so far serviceable. But what good ever came out of or went into a betting book? If I could be Caliph Omar for a week, I would pitch every one of those despicable manuscripts into the flames. For my lords, who is in with Jack Snaffle's stable, and his overreaching, worse-informed rogues and swindling greenhorns, down to Sam's, the butcher boys, who books eighteen penny odds in the tap room and stands to win five and twenty bob. In a turf transaction, either Spaven or Coxpur would try to get the better of his father, and, to gain a point in the odds, victimize his best friends. One day we shall hear of one or other levanting, an event at which, not being sporting men, we shall not break our hearts. See, Mr. Spaven is settling his toilette previous to departure, giving a curl in the glass to his side wisps of hair. Look at him. It is only at the hulks or among turf men that you ever see a face so mean, so knowing, and so gloomy. A much more humane being among the youthful clubists is the lady-killing snob. I saw Wiggle just now in the dressing room talking to Waggle, his inseparable. Waggle. Pawn my honor, Wiggle, she did. Wiggle. Well, Waggle, as you say, I own to think she did look at me rather kindly. We'll see tonight at the French play. And having arrayed their little persons, these two harmless young bucks go upstairs to dinner. End of chapter 39. Recording by Caroline Shapiro, Oakland, California, U.S. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 40 of The Book of Snobs 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Eads. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 40. Club Snobs. Both sorts of young men mentioned in my last under the flippant names of Wiggle and Waggle may be found in tolerable plenty, I think, in clubs. Wiggle and Waggle are both idle. They come of the middle classes. One of them very likely makes believe to be a barrister, and the other has smart apartments about Piccadilly. They are a sort of second-chop dandies. They cannot imitate that superb listlessness of demeanour, and that admirable vacuous folly which distinguish the noble and high-born chiefs of the race. But they lead lives almost as bad, were it but for the example, and are personally quite as useless. I am not going to arm a thunderbolt, and launch it at the heads of these little Paul Mall butterflies. They don't commit much public harm, or private extravagance. They don't spend a thousand pounds for diamond earrings, for an opera dancer, as Lord Tarquin can. Neither of them ever set up a public house, or broke the bank of a gambling club, like the young Earl of Martingale. They have good points, kind feelings, and deal honorably in money transactions. Only in their characters of men of second-rate pleasure about town, they and their like are so utterly mean, self-contented, and absurd, that they must not be omitted in a work treating on snobs. Wiggle has been abroad, where he gives you to understand that his success among the German countesses and Italian princesses, whom he met at the tables de Hoyt, was perfectly terrific. His rooms are hung round with pictures of actresses and ballet dancers. He passes his mornings in a fine dressing gown, burning pastels, and reading Don Juan and French novels. By the way, the life of the author of Don Juan, as described by myself, was the model of the life of a snob. He has two penny half penny French prints of women with languishing eyes, dressed in dominoes, guitars, gondolas, and so forth, and tells you stories about them. It's a bad print, he says, I know, but I've a reason for liking it. It reminds me of somebody, somebody I knew in other climes. You have heard of the Principessa de Monte Pulciano? I met her at Rimini. Dear, dear Francesca, that fair-haired bright-eyed thing in the bird of paradise and the Turkish samar with the lovebird on her finger, I'm sure must have been taken from, from somebody perhaps whom you don't know. But she's known at Munich, Waggle, my boy. Everybody knows the Countess Otelia de Uhlenschreckenstein. Gad, sir, what a beautiful creature she was when I danced with her on the birthday of Prince Attila of Bavaria in forty-four. Prince Carloman was our vis-a-vis, -vis, and Prince Pepin danced the same contra-dance. She had a polyanthus in her bouquet. Waggle, I have it now. His countenance assumes an agonized and mysterious expression, and he buries his head in the sofa cushions as if plunging into a whirlpool of passionate recollections. Last year he made a considerable sensation by having on his table a Morocco miniature case locked by a gold key, which he always wore round his neck, and on which was stamped a serpent, emblem of eternity, with the letter M in the circle. Sometimes he laid this upon his little Morocco writing-table, as if it were on an altar. Generally he had flowers upon it, in the middle of a conversation he would start up and kiss it. He would call out from his bedroom to his valet, "'Hicks, bring me my casket.' "'I don't know who it is,' Waggle would say. "'Who does know that fellow's intrigues? Desborough Wiggle, sir, is the slave of passion. I suppose you have heard the story of the Italian princess locked up in the convent of St. Barbara at Rimini? He hasn't told you? Then I am not at liberty to speak.' or the countess, about whom he nearly had the duel with Prince Wittekind of Bavaria? Perhaps you haven't even heard about that beautiful girl at Pentonville, daughter of a most respectable dissenting clergyman. She broke her heart when she found he was engaged to a most lovely creature of high family, who afterwards proved false to him, and she's now in Hanwell. Waggle's belief in his friend amounts to frantic adoration. What a genius he is, if he would but apply himself, he whispers to me. He could do anything, sir, but for his passions. His poems are the most beautiful things you ever saw. He's written a continuation of Don Juan from his own adventures. Did you ever read his lines to Mary? They're superior to Byron, sir, superior to Byron. 
I was glad to hear this from so accomplished a critic as Waggle, for the fact is I had composed the verses myself for Honest Wiggle one day, whom I found at his chambers plunged in thought over a very dirty, old-fashioned album, in which he had not as yet written a single word. I can't, says he. Sometimes I can write whole cantos, and to-day not a line. Oh, snob, such an opportunity, such a divine creature. She asked me to write verses for her album, and I can't. Is she rich? said I. I thought you would never marry any but an heiress. Oh, snob, she's the most accomplished, highly connected creature, and I can't get out a line. How will you have it? says I. Hot with sugar? Don't, don't. You trample on the most sacred feelings, snob. I want something wild and tender, like Byron. I want to tell her that amongst the festive balls, and that sort of thing, you know, I only think about her, you know, that I scorn the world, and am weary of it, you know, and something about a gazelle, and a bulbul, you know. And a yatagan to finish off with, the present writer observed, and we began. To marry. I seem in the midst of the crowd, the lightest of all. My laughter rings cheery and loud, in banquet and ball. My lip hath its smiles and its sneers, for all men to see. But my soul and my truth and my tears are for thee, are for thee. Do you call that neat, Wiggle? says I. I declare it almost makes me cry myself. Now suppose, says Wiggle, we say that all the world is at my feet. Make her jealous, you know, and that sort of thing. And that, that I'm going to travel, you know, that perhaps may work upon her feelings. So we, as this wretched prig said, began again. Around me they flatter and fawn, the young and the old, the fairest are ready to pawn their hearts for my gold. They sue me, I laugh as I spurn the slaves at my knee, but in faith and in fondness I turn unto thee, unto thee. Now for the travelling, wiggle my boy, and I began in a voice choked with emotion, Away, for my heart knows no rest since you taught it to feel. The secret must die in my breast I burn to reveal. The passion I may not. I say, snob, Wiggle here interrupted the excited bard, just as I was about to break out into four lines so pathetic that they would drive you into hysterics. I say, ahem, couldn't you say that I was a military man, and that there was some danger of my life? You, a military man, danger of your life? What the deuce do you mean? Why, said Waggle, blushing a great deal, I told her I was going out on the Ecuador expedition. You abominable young impostor, I exclaimed. Finish the poem for yourself. And so he did, and entirely out of all meter, and bragged about the work at the club as his own performance. Poor Waggle fully believed in his friend's genius, until one day last week he came with a grin on his countenance to the club and said, Oh, snob, I've made such a discovery. Going down to the skating today, whom should I see but Wiggle walking with that splendid woman, that lady of illustrious family and immense fortune, Mary, you know, whom he wrote the beautiful verses about. She's five and forty, she's red hair, she's a nose like a pump handle. Her father made his fortune by keeping a ham and beef shop, and Wiggle's going to marry her next week. So much the better, Waggle, my young friend, I exclaimed. Better for the sake of womankind that this dangerous dog should leave off lady-killing, this blue beard give up practice, or better rather for his own sake, for as there is not a word of truth in any of those prodigious love-stories which you used to swallow, nobody has been hurt except Wiggle himself, whose affections will now center in the ham and beef shop. There are people, Mr. Waggle, who do these things in earnest, and hold a good rank in the world too, but these are not subjects for ridicule and though certainly snobs are scoundrels likewise, their cases go up to a higher court. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 41 of The Book of Snobs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 41. Club Snobs. Bacchus is the divinity to whom Waggle devotes his special worship. Give me wine, my boy, 
he says to his friend Wiggle, who is prating about lovely women, and holds up his glass full of the rosy fluid, and winks at it pretentiously, and sips it, and smacks his lips after it, and meditates on it, as if he were the greatest of connoisseurs. I have remarked this excessive wine amateurship, especially in youth. Snoblings from college, fledglings from the army, goslings from the public schools, who ornament our clubs, are frequently to be heard in great force upon wine questions. This bottle's corked, says Snobling, and Mr. Sly the butler, taking it away, returns presently with the same wine in another jug, which the young amateur pronounces excellent. Hang champagne, says Fledgling, it's only fit for gals and children. Give me pale sherry at dinner, and my twenty-three claret afterwards. What's port now, says Gosling, disgusting thick sweet stuff, where's the old dry wine one used to get? Until the last twelve month, Fledgling drank small beer at Dr. Swishtail's, and Gosling used to get his dry old port at a gin shop in Westminster, till he quitted that seminary in 1844. Anybody who has looked at the caricatures of thirty years ago must remember how frequently bottle-noses, pimpled faces, and other Bardolphian features are introduced by the designer. They are much more rare now, in nature and in pictures, therefore, than in those good old times. But there are still to be found amongst the youth of our clubs lads who glory in drinking bouts, and whose faces, quite sickly and yellow for the most part, are decorated with those marks which Roland's Calidor is said to efface. I was so cut last night, old boy, Hopkins says to Tompkins, with amiable confidence. I tell you what we did. We breakfasted with Jack Herring at twelve, and kept up with brandy and soda water and weeds till four. Then we toddled into the park for an hour. Then we dined and drank mulled port till half price. Then we looked in for an hour at the haymarket. Then we came back to the club and had grills and whiskey punch till all was blue. Hello, waiter. Get me a glass of cherry brandy. Club waiters, the civilest, the kindest, the patientest of men, die under the infliction of these cruel young toppers. But if the reader wishes to see a perfect picture on the stage of this class of young fellows, I would recommend him to witness the ingenious comedy of London Assurance the amiable heroes of which are represented not only as drunkards and five o'clock in the morning men, but as showing a hundred other delightful traits of swindling, lying, and general debauchery, quite edifying to witness. How different is the conduct of these outrageous youths to the decent behaviour of my friend, Mr. Papworthy, who says to Poppins, the butler at the club, Papworthy, Poppins, I am thinking of dining early. Is there any cold game in the house? Poppins. There's a game pie, sir. There's cold grouse, sir. There's cold pheasant, sir. There's cold peacock, sir. Cold swan, sir. Cold ostrich, sir. Etc., etc., as the case may be. Papworthy. Hem. What's your best claret now, Poppins? In pints, I mean. Poppins. There's Cooper and Magnum's Lafitte, sir. There's lathe and sawdust St. Julien, sir. Bung's Leoville is considered remarkably fine, and I think you'd like Jugger's Chateau Margot. Papworthy. Ha, huh, ha. Huh. Well, give me a crust of bread and a glass of beer. I'll only lunch, Poppins. Captain Shindy is another sort of club bore. He has been known to throw all the club in an uproar about the quality of his mutton chop. Look at it, sir. Is it cooked, sir? Smell it, sir. Is it meat fit for a gentleman? he roars out to the steward, who stands trembling before him, and who in vain tells him that the bishop of Bullocksmithy has just had three from the same loin. All the waiters in the club are huddled round the captain's mutton-chop. He roars out the most horrible curses at John for not bringing the pickles. He utters the most dreadful oath, because Thomas has not arrived with the Harvey sauce. Peter comes tumbling with the water-jug over James, who is bringing the glittering canisters with bread. Whenever Shindy enters the room, such is the force of character, every table is deserted, every gentleman must dine as he best may, and all those big footmen are in terror. He makes his account of it, he scolds, and is better waited upon in consequence. At the club he has ten servants scudding about to do his bidding. Poor Mrs. Shandy and the children are, meanwhile, in dingy lodgings somewhere, 
waited upon by a charity girl in pattens. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 42 of The Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rosie. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 42. Club Snobs. Every well-bred English female will sympathize with the subject of the harrowing tale, the history of Sackville, Maine, I am now about to recount. The pleasures of clubs have been spoken of. Let us now glance for a moment at the dangers of those institutions, and for this purpose I must introduce you to my young acquaintance, Sackville, Maine. I was at a ball at the house of my respected friend, Mrs. Perkins, that I was introduced to this gentleman and his charming lady. Seeing a young creature before me in a white dress with white satin shoes, with a pink ribbon about a yard in breadth, flaming out as she twirled in a polka in the arms of Monsieur de Springbok, the German diplomatist, with a green wreath on her head, and the blackest hair this individual set eyes on, seeing, I say, before me a young charming woman whisking beautifully in a beautiful dance, and presenting, as she wound and wound, round the room now a full face then a three-quarter face then a profile a face in fine which every way you saw it looked pretty and rosy and happy i felt as i trust a not unbecoming curiosity regarding the owner of this pleasant countenance and asked wagley who was standing by in conversation with an acquaintance who was the lady in question which says wagley that one with the coal-black eyes i replied hush said he and the gentleman with whom he was talking moved off with a rather discomfited air when he was gone wagley burst out laughing coal-black eyes said he you've just hit it that's mrs sackville maine and that was her husband who just went away he's a coal merchant snob my boy and i have no doubt mr perkins wallsends are supplied from his wharf he is in a flaming furnace when he hears coals mentioned he and his wife and his mother are very proud of mrs sackville's family she was a miss chuff daughter of captain chuff r n that is the widow that stout woman in crimson tabinet battling about the odd trick with mr dumps at the card table and so in fact it was sackville maine whose name is a hundred times more elegant surely than that of chuff was blessed with a pretty wife and a genteel mother-in-law both of whom some people may envy him soon after his marriage the old lady was good enough to come and pay him a visit just for a fortnight at his pretty little cottage kennington oval and such is her affection for the place has never quitted it these four years she has also brought her son nelson collingwood chuff to live with her but he is not so much at home as his mamma going as a day-boy to merchant taylor's school where he is getting a sound classical education if these beings so closely allied to his wife and so justly dear to her may be considered as drawbacks to maine's happiness what man is there that has not some things in life to complain of and when i first knew mr maine no man seemed more comfortable than he his cottage was a picture of elegance and comfort his table and cellar were excellently and neatly supplied there was every enjoyment but no ostentation the omnibus took him to business of a morning the boat brought him back to the happiest of homes where he would while away the long evenings by reading out the fashionable novels to the ladies as they worked or accompany his wife on the flute which he played elegantly or in any one of the hundred pleasing and innocent amusements of the domestic circle mrs chuff covered the drawing-rooms with prodigious tapestries the work of her hands mrs sackville had a particular genius for making covers of tape or network for those tapestried cushions she could make homemade wines she could make preserves and pickles she had an album into which during the time of his courtship sackville maine bad written choice scraps of byron's and moore's poetry analogous to his own situation and in a fine mercantile hand she had a large manuscript receipt book every quality in a word which indicated a virtuous and well-bred english female mind and as for nelson collingwood sackville would say laughing we couldn't do without him in the house if he didn't spoil the tapestry we should be over cushioned in a few months and whom could we get but him to drink laura's homemade wine the truth is the gents who came from the city to dine at the oval could not be induced to drink it in which fastidiousness i myself when i grew to be intimate with the family confessed that i shared and yet sir that green ginger has been drunk by some of england's proudest heroes mrs chuff would exclaim admiral lord exmouth tasted it and praised it sir on board captain chuff's ship the nebuchadnezzar 
seventy-four at Algiers, and he had three dozen with turn in the pitchfork frigate, a part of which was served out to the men before he went into his immortal action with the fury bond, Captain Chauffleur, in the Gulf of Panama. All this, though the old dowager told us the story every day when the wine was produced, never served to get rid of any quantity of it, and the green ginger, though it had fired British tars for combat and victory, was not to the taste of us peaceful and degenerate gents of modern times. I see Sackville now, as on the occasion, when, presented by Wagley, I paid my first visit to him. It was in July, a Sunday afternoon. Sackville Maine was coming from church with his wife on one arm, and his mother ill-law, in red tabinet as usual, on the other. A half-grown, or hobbitahoyish footman, so to speak, walked after them, carrying their shiny golden prayer books. The ladies had splendid parasols with tags and fringes. Mrs. Chuff's great gold watch, fastened to her stomach, gleamed there like a ball of fire. Nelson Collingwood was in the distance, shying shoes at an old horse on Kennington Common. "'Twas on that verdant spot we met, nor can I ever forget the majestic courtesy of Mrs. Chuff, as she remembered having had the pleasure of seeing me at Mrs. Perkins's, nor the glance of scorn which she threw at an unfortunate gentleman who was preaching an exceedingly desultory discourse to a skeptical audience of omnibus cads and nursemaids on a tub as we passed by. "'I cannot help it, sir,' says she. "'I am the widow of an officer of Britain's navy. "'I was taught to honour my church and my king, "'and I cannot bear a radical or a dissenter.' "'With these fine principles I found Sackville Maine impressed. "'Wagley,' said he to my introducer, "'if no better engagement, why shouldn't self and friend dine at the Oval? "'Mr. Snob, sir, the mutton's coming off the spit at this very minute. "'Laura and Mrs. Chuff, he said Laura and Mrs. Chuff, "'but I hate people who make remarks on these peculiarities of pronunciation, "'will be most happy to see you, and I can promise you a hearty welcome, "'and as good a glass of port wine as any in England.' "'This is better than dining at the sarcophagus, thinks I to myself, at which Club Wagley and I had intended to take our meal. And so we accepted the kindly invitation, whence arose afterwards a considerable intimacy. Everything about this family and house was so good-natured, comfortable, and well-conditioned, that a cynic would have ceased to growl there. Mrs. Lower was all graciousness and smiles, and looked to as great advantage in her pretty morning-gown as in her dress-robe at Mrs. Perkins's. Mrs. Chuff fired off her stories about the Nebuchadnezzar 74, the action between the pitchfork and the furibond, the heroic resistance of Captain Chauffleur, and the quantity of snuff he took, etc., etc., which, as they were heard for the first time, were pleasanter than I have subsequently found them. Sackville Maine was the best of hosts. He agreed in everything everybody said, altering his opinions without the slightest reservation upon the slightest possible contradiction. He was not one of those beings who would emulate a Chambin or Friar Bacon, or act the part of an incendiary towards the Thames, his neighbor, but a good, kind, simple, honest, easy fellow, in love with his wife, well disposed to all the world, content with himself, content even with his mother-in-law. Nelson Collingwood, I remember, in the course of the evening, when whiskey and water was for some reason produced, grew a little tipsy. This did not in the least move Sackville's equanimity. "'Take him upstairs, Joseph,' said he to the habitoy, and Joseph, don't tell his mamma. What could make a man so happily disposed, unhappy? What could be the discomfort, bickering, and estrangement in a family so friendly and united? Ladies, it was not my fault. It was Mrs. Chuff's doing. But the rest of the tale you shall have on a future day.' End of chapter 42. Recording by Rosie. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 43 of The Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rosie. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 43. Club Snobs. The misfortune which befell the simple and good-natured young Sackville arose entirely from that abominable sarcophagus club, and that he ever entered it was partly the fault of the present writer. Foreseeing Mrs. Chuff, his mother-in-law, had a taste for the genteel, indeed her talk was all about Lord Collingwood, Lord Gambier, Sir Jaleel Brenton, and the Gosport and Plymouth Balls, Wagley and I, according to our wont, trumped her conversation and talked about lords, dukes, marquises, and baronets, as if those dignitaries were our familiar friends. Lord Sextonbury, says I, seems to have recovered her ladyship's death. He and the duke were very jolly over their wine at the sarcophagus last night, weren't they, Wagley? Good fellow, the duke, Wagley replied. "'Pray, ma'am, to Mrs. Chuff, you who know the world and etiquette, will you tell me what a man ought to do in my case? 
last june his grace his son lord castle rampant tom smith and myself were dining at the club when i offered the odds against daddy longlegs for the derby forty to one in sovereigns only his grace took the bet and i of course won he has never paid me now can i ask such a great man for a sovereign one more lump of sugar if you please my dear madam it was lucky Wagley gave her this opportunity to elude the question, for it prostrated the whole worthy family among whom we were. They telegraphed each other with wondering eyes. Mrs. Chuff's stories about the naval nobility grew quite faint, and little Mrs. Sackville became uneasy and went upstairs to look at the children. Not at that young monster Nelson Collingwood, who was sleeping off the whiskey and water, but at a couple of little ones who had made their appearance at dessert, and of whom she and Sackville were the happy parents the end of this and subsequent meetings with mr maine was that we proposed and got him elected as a member of the sarcophagus club it was not done without a deal of opposition the secret having been whispered that the candidate was a coal merchant you may have been sure some of the proud people and most of the parvenus of the club were ready to blackball him we combated this opposition successfully however we pointed out to the parvenus that the lambtons and the stewarts sold coals we mollified the proud by accounts of his good birth good nature and good behaviour and wagley went about on the day of the election describing with great eloquence the action between the pitchfork and the furibond and the valour of captain maine our friend Friend's father there was a slight mistake in the narrative but we carried our man with only a trifling sprinkling of black beans in the boxes biles is of course who blackballs everybody and bungs who looks down upon a coal merchant having himself lately retired from the wine trade some fortnight afterwards i saw sackville maine under the following circumstances he was showing the club to his family he had brought them thither in the light blue fly waiting at the club door with mrs chuff's hobbadehoy footboy on the box by the side of the flyman in a sham livery nelson collingwood pretty mrs sackville mrs captain chuff mrs commodore chuff we call her were all there the latter of course in the vermilion tabinet which splendid as it is is nothing in comparison to the splendour of the sarcophagus the delighted sackville maine was pointing out the beauties of the place to them it seemed as beautiful as paradise to that little party the sarcophagus displays every known variety of architecture and decoration the great library is elizabethan the small library is pointed gothic the dining-room is severe doric the stranger's room has an egyptian look the drawing-rooms are louis quatorze so called because the hideous ornaments displayed were used in the time of louis Cons. the cortile or hall is morisco italian it is all over marble maple wood looking-glasses arabesques ormolo and sclagliola scrolls ciphers dragons cupids polyanthuses and other flowers writhe up in the walls in every kind of cornucopiosity fancy every gentleman in julian's band playing with all his might and each performing a different tune the ornaments at our club the sarcophagus so bewilder and affect me dazzled with emotions which i cannot describe and which she dared not reveal mrs chuff followed by her children and son-in-law walked wondering amongst these blundering splendours in the great library, 225 feet long by 150, the only man Mrs. Chuff saw was Tiggs. He was lying on a crimson velvet sofa, reading a French novel of Paul de Kock. It was a very little book. He is a very little man. In that enormous hall he looked like a mere speck. As the ladies passed breathless and trembling in the vastness of the magnificent solitude, he threw a knowing killing glance at the fair strangers, as much to say, "'Ain't I a fine fellow?' They thought so, I'm sure." "'Who is that?' hisses out Mrs. Chuff, when we were about fifty yards off him at the other end of the room. "'Tiggs,' says I, in a similar whisper. "'Pretty comfortable this, isn't it, my dear?' says Maine in a free and easy way to Mrs. Sackville. "'All the magazines you see, writing materials, new works, choice library, containing every work of importance. What have we here? Dugdale's Monasticon, a most valuable and, I believe, entertaining book.' and proposing to take down one of the books for mrs maine's inspection he selected volume seven to which he was attracted by the singular fact that a brass door-handle grew out of the back instead of pulling out a book however he pulled open a cupboard only inhabited by a lazy housemaid's broom and duster at which he looked exceedingly discomfited while nelson collingwood losing all respect burst into a roar of laughter that's the rummest book i ever saw says nelson i wish we'd no others at merchant taylor's hush nelson cries mrs chuff and we went into the other magnificent apartments how they did admire the drawing-room hangings pink and silver brocade most excellent wear for london and calculated the price per yard and revelled on the luxurious sofas and gazed on the immeasurable looking-glasses pretty well to shave by eh says maine to his mother-in-law he was getting more abominably conceited every minute get away sackville says she quite delighted and threw a glance over her shoulder and spread out the wings of the red tabinet and took a good look at herself so did mrs sackville 
just one, and I thought the glass reflected a very smiling pretty creature. But what's a woman at a looking-glass? Bless the little dears, it's their place. They fly to it naturally. It pleases them, and they adorn it. What I like to see, and watch with increasing joy and adoration, is the club men at the great looking-glasses. Old Gill's pushing up his collars and grinning at his own mottled face. Hulker looking solemnly at his great person, and tightening his coat to give himself a waist. Fred Minchin simpering by as he is going out to dine, and casting upon the reflection of his white neckcloth a pleased, moony smile. What a deal of vanity that club mirror has reflected, to be sure. Well, the ladies went through the whole establishment with perfect pleasure. They beheld the coffee-rooms, and the little tables laid for dinner, and the gentlemen who were taking their lunch, and old Jockins thundering away as usual. They saw the reading-rooms, and the rush for the evening papers. They saw the kitchens, those wonders of art, where the chef was presiding over twenty pretty kitchen-maids, and ten thousand shining saucepans, and they got into the light blue fly perfectly bewildered with pleasure. Sackville did not enter it, though little Laura took the back seat on purpose, and left him the front place alongside of Mrs. Chuff's red tabinet. "'We have your favourite dinner,' says she, in a timid voice. "'Won't you come, Sackville?' "'I shall take a chop here to-day, my dear,' Sackville replied. "'Home, James.' And he went up the steps of the sarcophagus, and the pretty face looked very sad out of the carriage as the blue fly drove away. End of chapter 43 Reading by Rosie This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 44 of The Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rosie. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 44 club snobs why why did i and wagley ever do so cruel an action as to introduce young sackville maine into that odious sarcophagus let our imprudence and his example be a warning to other gents let his fate and that of his poor wife be remembered by every british female the consequences of his entering the club were as follows one of the first vices the unhappy wretch acquired in this abode of frivolity was that of smoking. Some of the dandies of the club, such as the Marquis of Macabaw, Lord Dudine, and fellows of that high order, are in the habit of indulging in this propensity upstairs in the billiard-rooms of the sarcophagus, and, partly to make their acquaintance, partly from a natural aptitude for crime, Sackville Maine followed them, and became an adept in the odious custom. Where it is introduced into a family, I need not say how sad the consequences are, both to the furniture and the morals. Sackville smoked in his dining-room at home, and caused an agony to his wife and mother-in-law which I do not venture to describe. He then became a professed billiard player, wasting hours upon hours at that amusement, betting freely, playing tolerably, losing awfully to Captain Spot and Colonel Cannon. He played matches of a hundred games with these gentlemen, and would not only continue until four or five o'clock in the morning at this work, but would be found at the club of a forenoon, indulging himself to the detriment of his business, the ruin of his health, and the neglect of his wife. From billiards to whist is but a step, and when a man gets to whist and five pounds on a rubber, my opinion is that it is all up with him. How is the coal business to go on, and the connection of the firm to be kept up, and the senior partner always at the card table? Consorting now with genteel persons and Pall Mall bucks, Sackville became ashamed of his snug little residence in Kennington Oval, and transported his family to Pimlico, where, though Mrs. Chuff, his mother-in-law, was at first happy, as the quarter was elegant and near her sovereign, poor little Laura and the children found a woeful difference. Where were her friends who came in with their work of a morning, at Kennington and in the vicinity of Clapham? Where were her children's little playmates, on Kennington Common? The great thundering carriages that roared up and down the drab-coloured streets of the new quarter contained no friends for the sociable little Laura. The children that paced the squares, attended by Bong or a prim governess, were not like those happy ones that flew kites or played hopscotch on the well-behaved old common. And, ah, what a difference at church, too, between St. Benedict's of Pimlico with open seats, service and sing-song, tapers, albs, surplices, garlands and processions, and the honest old ways of Kennington. The footmen, too, attending St. Benedict's, were so splendid and enormous that James, Mrs. Chuff's boy, trembled amongst them, and said he would give warning rather than carry the books to that church any more. The furnishings of the house was not done without expense. 
and ye gods what a difference there was between sackville's dreary french banquets in pimlico and the jolly diners at the oval no more legs of mutton no more the best port wine in england but entrees on a plate and dismal twopenny champagne and waiters in gloves and the club bucks for company among whom mrs chuff was uneasy and mrs sackville quite silent not that he dined at home often the wretch had become a perfect epicure and dined commonly at the club with the gormandizing clique there with old dr ma colonel cramley who is as lean as a greyhound and has jaws like a jack and the rest of them here you might see the wretch tippling sillery champagne and gorging himself with french viands and i often looked with sorrow from my table on which cold meat the club's small beer and a half pint of marsala formed the modest banquet and sighed to think it was my work and there were other beings present to my repentant thoughts where's his wife thought i where's poor good kind little laura at this very moment it's about the nursery bedtime and while yonder good-for-nothing is swilling his wine the little ones are at laura's knees lisping their prayers and she is teaching them to say pray god bless papa when she has put them to bed her day's occupation is gone and she is utterly lonely all night and sad and waiting for him oh for shame for shame go home thou idle tippler how sackville lost his health how he lost his business how he got into scrapes how he got into debt how he became a railroad director how the pimlico house was shut up how he went to boulogne all this i could tell only i am too much ashamed of my part of the transaction they returned to england because to the surprise of everybody mrs chuff came down with a great sum of money which nobody knew she had saved and paid his liabilities he is in england but at kennington his name is taken off the books of the sarcophagus long ago when we meet he crosses over to the other side of the street i don't call as i should be sorry to see a look of reproach or sadness in laura's sweet face not however all evil as i am proud to think has been the influence of the snob of england upon clubs in general captain shindy is afraid to bully the waiters any more and eats his mutton chop without moving acheron gobamouche does not take more than two papers at a time for his private reading tiggs does not ring the bell and cause the library waiter to walk about a quarter of a mile in order to give him volume two which lies on the next table growler has ceased to walk from table to table in the coffee-room and inspect what people are having for dinner trotty veck takes his own umbrella from the hall the cotton one and sydney scraper's paletot lined with silk has been brought back by jobbins who entirely mistook it for his own wiggle has discontinued telling stories about the ladies he has killed snooks does not any more think it gentlemanlike to blackball attorneys snuffler no longer publicly spreads out his great red cotton pocket handkerchief before the fire for the admiration of two hundred gentlemen and if one club snob has been brought back to the paths of rectitude and if one poor john has been spared a journey or a scolding say friends and brethren if these sketches of club snobs have been in vain End of chapter 44. Reading by Rosie. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 45 of The Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 45 Concluding Observations on Snobs. How it is that we have come to number forty five of this present series of papers my dear friends and brother snobs i hardly know but for a whole mortal year have we been together prattling and abusing the human race and were we to live for a hundred years more i believe there is plenty of subject for conversation in the enormous theme of snobs the national mind is awakened to the subject. Letters pour in every day, conveying marks of sympathy, directing the attention of the snob of England to the races of snobs yet undescribed. Where are your theatrical snobs, your commercial snobs, your medical or chirurgical snobs, your official snobs, your legal snobs? 
your artistical snobs, your musical snobs, your sporting snobs, write my esteemed correspondence. Surely you are not going to miss the Cambridge Chancellor election, and omit showing up your Don snobs, who are coming, cap in hand, to a young prince of six and twenty, and to implore him to be the chief of their renowned university, writes a friend who seals with the signet of the Cam and Isis Club. Pray, pray, cries another, now the operas are opening, give us a lecture about omnibus snobs. Indeed, I should like to write a chapter about the snobbish dons very much, and another about snobbish dandies. Of my dear theatrical snobs, I think with a pang, and I can hardly break away from some snobbish artists with whom I have long, long intended to have a palaver. But what's the use of delaying? When these were done, there would be fresh snobs to portray. The labor is endless. No single man could complete it. Here are but fifty-two bricks, and a pyramid to build. It is best to stop. As Jones always quits the room as soon as he has said his good thing, and as Cincinnatus and General Washington both retired into private life in the height of their popularity, as Prince Albert, when he laid the first stone of the exchange, left the bricklayers to complete that edifice, and went home to his royal dinner. As the poet Bunn comes forward at the end of the season, and with feelings too tumultuous to describe, blesses his kind friends over the footlights. So, friends, in the flush of conquest and the splendor of victory, amid the shouts and the plaudits of a people, triumphant yet modest, the snob of England bids ye farewell. But only for a season, not for ever. No, no. There is one celebrated author whom I admire very much, who has been taking leave of the public any time these ten years in his prefaces, and always comes back again when everybody is glad to see him. How can he have the heart to be saying good-bye so often? I believe that Bunn is affected when he blesses the people. Parting is always painful. Even the familiar bore is dear to you. I should be sorry to shake hands even with Jawkins for the last time. I think a well-constituted convict on coming home from transportation ought to be rather sad when he takes leave of Van Diemen's land. When the curtain goes down on the last night of a pantomime, poor old clown must be very dismal, depend on it. Ha! With what joy he rushes forward on the evening of the 26th of December next, and says, How are you? Here we are. But I am growing too sentimental. To return to the theme. The national mind is awakened to the subject of snobs. The word snob has taken a place in our honest English vocabulary. We can't define it. Perhaps we can't say what it is any more than we can define wit, or humor, or humbug, but we know what it is. Some weeks since, happening to have the felicity to sit next to a young lady at a hospitable table, where poor old Jawkins was holding forth in a very absurd pompous manner, I wrote upon the spotless damask S blank B, and called my neighbor's attention to the little remark. That young lady smiled. She knew it at once. Her mind straightway filled up the two letters concealed by apostrophic reserve, and I read in her assenting eyes that she knew, 
Jawkins was a snob. You seldom get them to make use of the word, as yet, it is true. But it is inconceivable how pretty an expression their little smiling mouths assume when they speak it out. If any young lady doubts, just let her go up to her own room, look at herself steadily in the glass, and say, Snob. If she tries this simple experiment, my life for it, she will smile, and own that the word becomes her mouth amazingly. A pretty little round word, all composed of soft letters with a hiss at the beginning, just to make it piquant, as it were. Jawkins, meantime, went on blundering and bragging and boring, quite unconsciously. And so he will, no doubt, go on roaring and braying to the end of time, or at least so long as people will hear him. You cannot alter the nature of men and snobs, by any force of satire, as by laying ever so many stripes on a donkey's back, you can't turn him into a zebra. But we can warn the neighborhood that the person whom they and Jawkins admire is an impostor. We apply the snob test to him, and to try whether he is conceited and a quack, whether pompous and lacking humility, whether uncharitable and proud of his narrow soul. How does he treat a great man? How regard a small one? How does he comport himself in the presence of his grace, the duke? And how in that of Smith, the tradesman? And it seems to me that all English society is cursed by this mammoniacal superstition, and that we are sneaking and bowing and cringing on the one hand, or bullying and scorning on the other, from the lowest to the highest. My wife speaks with great circumspection, proper pride, she calls it, to our neighbor, the tradesman's lady, and she, I mean, Mrs. Snob, Eliza, would give one of her eyes to go to court, as her cousin, the captain's wife, did. She, again, is a good soul, but it costs her agonies to be obliged to confess that we live in Upper Thompson Street, Summers Town. And though I believe in her heart Mrs. Whiskerington is fonder of us than of her cousins, the Spigsmags, you should hear how she goes on prattling about Lady Smigsmag. And I said to Sir John, my dear Sir John, and about the Smigsmag's house and parties in Hyde Park Terrace. Lady Smigsmag, when she meets Eliza, who is a sort of a kind of species of a connection of the family, pokes out one finger which my wife is at liberty to embrace in the most cordial manner she can devise. But, oh, you should see her ladyship's behavior on her first chop dinner party days, when Lord and Lady Long Ears come. I can bear it no longer, this diabolical invention of gentility, which kills natural kindness and honest friendship, proper pride, indeed. Rank and precedence, forsooth. The table of ranks and degrees is a lie, and should be flung into the fire. Organize rank and precedence. That was well for the masters of ceremonies of former ages. Come forward, some great marshal, and organize equality in society and your rod shall swallow up all the juggling old court gold sticks. If this is not gospel truth, if the world does not tend to this, if hereditary great man-worship 
is not a humbug and an idolatry, let us have the Stuarts back again, and crop the free press's ears in the pillory. If ever our cousins, the Smixmags, asked me to meet Lord Longears, I, I would like to take an opportunity after dinner and say, in the most good-natured way in the world, Sir, fortune makes you a present of a number of thousand pounds every year. The ineffable wisdom of our ancestors has placed you as a chief and hereditary legislator over me. Our admirable constitution, the pride of Britons and envy of surrounding nations, obliges me to receive you as my senator, superior and guardian. Your eldest son, Fitz Hee-haw, is sure of a place in Parliament. Your younger sons, the Du Brays, will kindly condescend to be post-captains and lieutenant-colonels, and to represent us in foreign courts, or to take a good living when it falls convenient. These prizes, our admirable constitution, the pride and envy of etc., pronounces to be your due, without count of your dullness, your vices, your selfishness, or your entire incapacity and folly. Dull as you may be, and we have as good a right to assume that my lord is an ass, as the other proposition, that he is an enlightened patriot. Dull, I say, as you may be, no one will accuse you of such monstrous folly as to suppose that you are indifferent to the good luck which you possess, or have any inclination to part with it. No, and patriots as we are, under happier circumstances, Smith and I, I have no doubt, were we dukes, ourselves, would stand by our order. We would submit, good-naturedly, to sit in a high place. We would acquiesce in that admirable constitution, pride and envy of, etc., which made us chiefs, and the world our inferiors. We would not cavil, particularly, at that notion of hereditary superiority, which brought many simple people cringing to our knees. Maybe we would rally round the Corn Laws. We would make a stand against the Reform Bill. We would die rather than repeal the Acts against Catholics and dissenters. We would, by our noble system of class legislation, bring Ireland to its present admirable condition. But Smith and I are not earls as yet. We don't believe that it is for the interest of Smith's army that Debray should be a colonel at five-and-twenty, of Smith's diplomatic relations that Lord Longears should go ambassador to Constantinople, of our politics that Longears should put his hereditary foot into them. This bowing and cringing Smith believes to be the act of snobs, and he will do all in his might and main to be a snob, and to submit to snobs no longer. To long ears, he says, we can't help seeing, long ears, that we are as good as you. We can spell even better can think quite as rightly, we will not have you for our master, or black your shoes any more. Your footmen do it, but they are paid, and the fellow who comes to get a list of the company, when you give a banquet or a dancing breakfast at Longreille House, gets money from the newspapers for performing that service. But for us, thank you for nothing, long years, my boy, and we don't wish to pay you any more than we owe. 
we will take off our hats to Wellington, because he is Wellington, but to you, who are you? I am sick of court circulars. I loathe haute ton intelligence. I believe such words as fashionable, exclusive, aristocratic, and the like, to be wicked, unchristian epithets that ought to be banished from honest vocabularies. A court system that sends men of genius to the second table, I hold to be a snobbish system. A society that sets up to be polite and ignores arts and letters, I hold to be a snobbish society. You who despise your neighbor are a snob. You who forget your own friends, meanly to follow after those of a higher degree, are a snob. You who are ashamed of your poverty and blush for your calling are a snob. As are you who boast of your pedigree or are proud of your wealth. To laugh at such is Mr. Punch's business. May he laugh honestly, hit no foul blow, and tell the truth, when at his very broadest grin, never forgetting that if fun is good, truth is still better, and love best of all. End of chapter 45 Read by Dennis Sayers for LibriVox in Modesto, California And end of the Book of Snobs By William Makepeace Thackeray This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks.